I do recommend meet up to a lot of my friends that are looking for different things, wine tasting, movies, book club, meet a lot of new people, a lot of new friends, and it will make you more social.
What is a chess dynasty? Unceasing dominance, move after move, again and again and again. We have a oh. resignation, we have history. He is the five-time FIDE world chess champion. But a chess dynasty can also be cruel. It forces most to defer their dreams until next time. If there is a next time. It's losing. Oh my God, did he just blow Yeah, them? he did. I'm blown away. The game is over. As the chess world turns to Kazakhstan, the Magnus Carlsen dynasty is set to close. The FIDE World Championship is finally up for grabs. For two chess superstars lying in wait, until next time is now. Jan Nepomneshi has methodically done what he needed to do to get another shot at the title. The pressure to seize the moment this time rests heavily upon him. Jan is running out of resources. He's built every single threat that's possible and things just counted it. There's no way to make progress on. Ding Li Ren knows firsthand what the end of this dynasty means. An unexpected chance to make history. Can China's best turn his good fortune into eternal fame? It's a draw. What an amazing defense by Ding. The 2023 world champion will be decided in speed test. The legacy of this championship spans across centuries. It reads from the names of chess giants. For the first time in a decade, a new name will raise the trophy and be etched into chess history. It's the 2023 FIDE World Championship. Whose name will next be called champion? It's Championship Sunday in Astana. And not far from here are the buzzing halls of the St. Regis Hotel. Like every game day today, Yana Pamnashi and Ding Liren will step into this playing arena. But this is like no other day. They'll walk into the glass room and today, with the stunning trophy in sight, play their hearts out. And in the end, one of them will be the new world chess champion. The press is ready. We are ready. Welcome to our coverage of the playoffs for the 2023 FIDE World Championship. I'm International Master Tanya Satyadev, and alongside me, the crew, Grandmaster Robert Hess and Grandmaster Fabiano Caruana. It's going to be an intense day of chess. Robert, has this been the most unpredictable World Championship match? It's been an absolute roller coaster, and perhaps that's what happens when there are two evenly matched players like Yana Pomshi and Ding Li Ren, the numbers two and three rated players in the world, just a few rating points apart, coming into this match with just about an equal head to head record. It's been exciting, it's been fun. It is Sunday, fun day, but for the players, there's a lot on the line. Fun day, fun day. I love it. Fabi, with your experience of the 2018 tie breaks in the World Championship match, how difficult is today for the players? It's going to be incredibly difficult for both of them. And we can't pick out a clear favorite, I think. We see that the players have been completely evenly matched in classical chess, battling back and forth, but still reaching the 7-7 score. In rapid chess, I think they're also going to be completely evenly matched. Although it's possible that in just four games, one of them will break free and perhaps it's even likely that we might see it end before we get to the Blitz. But in Blitz chess, who knows? It's going to be a, a bloodbath if it gets to that point. And at that point, anything could happen. That's going to be crazy. But we've seen all kinds of crazy in this match. Vishy Anand, the five-time world champion, an absolute legend, called it one of the most exciting matches in recent history. This match has been jaw-dropping from the start. We saw lots of decisive games, five decisive games in the first half, including a psychological meltdown in Game 7 by Ding. Game 8, Yan Nepomneshi with his trickiness survived a tough scare, scare. And then, finally, Kaisa was on Ding's side in Game 12. From a difficult position, Ding leveled the match going into Game 14, which we saw yesterday. And with a draw, a marathon game. It is 7-7, heading to the playoffs. Game 7, game 14, game 7 as well, was an iconic one. And the longest of the match. Fabi, 
Yan was dismissive about Ding's attack with knight g4, knight g5, h4 coming in, and his play lived up to it. Ding survived a scare yesterday. Yeah, I think Yan had the absolutely correct initial uh, reaction. His intuition told him that knight g5 and h4, scary though it may look, it's not really based in terms of some sound positional principle that you know White has. White's played better in the opening, and it's now time for an attack. Black was playing completely healthy moves. That's what Jan said, and that's why he didn't believe that aggression like that would necessarily result in some sort of advantage for White. And we actually saw the opposite, that Black was the one who was taking over in terms of the evaluation, maybe not in large part until later in the game, when it suddenly started to get super, super dangerous for Ding. We were starting to think, maybe today is going to be the day that we'll see a world champion. But the day was delayed. Today, we will absolutely see a world champion, but yesterday, Ding held up. His defenses held up. It was a seven-hour game, and uh, I think we can't underestimate how difficult it is to play precisely after those seven hours and also after the preceding three weeks of chess that we've seen, especially very bloody chess. But Ding's uh, calculation held up. I mean, whether he was tired or not, he played all the perfect moves in that rook end game, and he survived a big scare. And perhaps Jan is a bit disappointed, but we just have to say that you know Ding was up to the task. And one of the biggest criticisms of this world championship has been the perceived lack of defensive tenacity. But that script was rewritten yesterday when Ding Li Ren, he buckled down, played for seven hours, and he was helped by a pawn push heard around the world. That B6 tactical idea where he gives up a pawn that gives up a rook for a bishop just to win a rook back, entering a rooked pawn endgame, down a pawn, but holding on. That was impressive stuff from Ding Li Ren. And Yanda Pomshi, maybe he'll be a little bit disappointed because he had this match victory, it felt, in the bag in game 12. He he let it slip, but he had the upper hand yesterday, so he can feel good that in the last game that they played, he was the one with all the chances. He may not have won the game, but he enters Championship Sunday with some renewed confidence, you would hope. That's a big upside for Jan. Playing game 14 just yesterday with the black pieces, being the one pushing the game for the most part of it, with Ding Liren found some critical resources there. And now, traditionally, in the 2016 and the 2018 World Championship matches where we did see tie breaks, they happened after a rest day. There was a rest day and then the playoffs. But this time, after a grueling Game 14, the players straight away go into the playoffs. And they'll start with four rapid games with 25 minutes on their clock. And every time a player presses the clock, gets an additional 10 seconds. In case there's a tie after the first four rapid games, that's a 2-2 score, we will see the match proceed to the Blitz playoff. And that will be a best of two with a five minute and a three second increment. If that one ends in a tie as well, then we go down to the final tiebreaker, which will be with three minutes on the clock for each of the players and a two second increment, the games will be played at till we have a decisive result. Robert, we're going to start with Rapid. We're going to potentially have Blitz. Is there, in either of these two formats, a big favorite? Such a big question. I know that's what the people want the answer to. Who is going to win today? And going into the Rapid portion, we do not know. I know Ding Li Ren, he has the slight nod in terms of a Rapid rating, but he's inactive over the board. And Yanda Pomshi has played some excellent speed chess. He won the Rapid Chess Championship in 2022 on chess.com. He beat some big names along the way. So I feel like it's hard to pick between these two. They are both well-tested online and over the board. They have been at the top of chess for over a decade. I don't know who to pick. It is going to be an amazing fight. And we do know that the players have played each other a bunch of times in speed chess as well. These are their head-to-head -head scores, but fast scores are the least of the concerns for these two players today. It's a totally different universe that they're in. None of the rules apply here. The only takeaway that we have from this graphic in front of us is that it's going to be a close call. As Robert say, said, it's hard to pick a favorite. But then we didn't need a graphic to tell us that it's going to be a close call. It was clear in the classical games, just the kind of fight that we're going to get today. Now, what's going to matter today is going to be energy. Both are extremely fatigued, not only from game 14, but all the games preceding that as well. It's been a big fight from the very start. It's going to come down to who has those extra seconds in time scrambles grit determination stamina will come into play sabi is it fair to say 
that today will be more about the player who makes the last mistake and less about accuracy? I think accuracy will play a huge part in deciding who makes the last mistake because very often these mistakes that come at the last moment, they're the result of pressure that builds up throughout the game. So if you're on the back foot throughout the game or throughout the day of, of rapid chess, then that's likely to lead you astray in, you know, in those critical moments because uh, you know the pressure, it's not just a momentary thing. It builds up in, in your mind and your body. And so it might be down to like just who plays the best chess. And we might only see it manifest finally in some like huge blunder in, when they're both down to time trouble. But uh, we have to recognize that blunt mistakes and blunders don't come you know, in a vacuum. They're, they're the result of uh, previous factors that build up. Yeah, it's really well worded by Fabiano there that we often think, how could they blunder this piece? That's what spectators may think. But it's because of continued pressure. Tough moves have to be played. And such as single moves, it's strategies, ideas. And when you're in rapid chess, you can't sit for 30 minutes because guess what? You don't have 30 minutes to start with. So I think when we look at this match as a whole, Yana Pomshi has been the quicker player. He's also been the first into the playing hall. And that is true today as well. And I feel like for Ding Li Ren, he knows he can't sit in for those long things. He is going to have to find ideas quickly. He is capable of that. We have seen in uh, some of the best players in the world, they may be slower in classical chess, but they speed up when the time gets lower. As Jan Napomnesi walked into the playing hall, he did glance at that stunning trophy that we saw earlier on. That is the ultimate dream for these two players. So much pressure. So much tension. The champions play their best chess in exactly these clutch moments. Now, we also had the drawing of lots after the press conference yesterday. And Ding Liren does start with the white pieces, the first rapid game. And it is going to be a lot about what did Team Ding come up with for this game one. A result in game one could potentially set the tone for the rest of the rapid games. Fabi, how crucial and how critical is game one for these players with four games ahead? Yeah, I think that will really set the stage. And if we see a decisive result, it could uh, really lead to some momentum for whoever wins. Although we have a lot of recent data in terms of four game matches be between uh, top players, you know, in, in the Champions Tour, this is the format. And very often we see a lot of back and forth. So if someone wins a game and... I mean, I can't count the amount of times and this has happened in my own matches as well as, you know, if I'm watching matches of Magnus or, or Hikaru, that we almost immediately see a strike back. And, and it's kind of remarkable, but because when the match stays level, when it's like draw after draw, then players struggle to break through. But once there's a decisive result, very often that leads to the person in the lead. They go into defensive mode. Their play starts to suffer a bit. I've seen this countless times. It even happens to Magnus that he wins a game and everyone thinks, okay, he's going to run away with the match. But then suddenly we see, let's say, Wesley or Hikaru strike back in the very next game. And it could easily happen in this match as well that we see it back and forth because there's this like psychological element where you win a game and you feel like that you're already you know, at the finish line. Like, I just need to not mess this up. I just need to draw the rest of the games. And that can have a bad effect on your play. So from, from what I've seen a lot, there, there is that tendency for there to be not just like a clean, you know, decisive game followed by draws and a clean victory, but a little bit of a struggle there. That's going to be a big struggle for these two players. And Dingler in with the white pieces, Jan Napomnesi with black looking ready to start. And Robert, before we get the game action going, this one's for chat and this one's for both of you, actually. A prediction. You know I love predictions. Will we see this match go into blitz? And I'll start with Robert. Always put me on the spot. I do not think that we're going to blitz. I don't know who's going to win, but I do think we will see a champion crowned in rapid. Mistakes happen more frequently in quicker time controls. I think one side will take the lead and will not relinquish it at a certain point. And so we will see a champion crowned in rapid. Robert predicts a match in rapid. What about you, Fabi? I'm going the opposite direction. I think we've already seen so much back and forth. I don't think it's going to stop now. And I think you might call me superstitious, but I think there's going to be an element of uh, fate here in terms of the dramatic twists and turns of the match and that will continue and it just feels like these guys are, are so evenly matched that it's hard to imagine them not going the distance and we do have the first move on the board Ding Lirin goes with the trusted queen spawn opening that we've seen him employ in the match so far 
And this is a new position. First time in the 2023 World Championship. Well, when Dick like is it. playing with the... <laughs> yeah, I like it too. When Dick is playing with the white pieces, every opening is a new opening. He, is, he has uh, played pretty much everything you can imagine after um, we see D4, Knight of 3. He played one time in the London system, Bishop to 4, one time in the Coley system, E3. And now he's going for a third move, C3. Will we... I mean, he doesn't want to put that pawn on C4 anymore. Uh, so he's, he's uh, you know, uh, choosing between all these small systems that are kind of a little bit interesting, a little bit poisonous. I know the C3 system because uh, Levon was... Uh, Quite enchanted by it and i don't know if you remember robert when we were at the olympiad levon was was telling us a bit about this c3 stuff and yep. it's it's an interesting little system it's like a modern approach trying to uh pose black some original problems and we see already thing took upon and is uh trying to hold on to it by any means bishop on e3 a bit unusual to but it does defend the pawn yeah, and I actually really like these approaches when it comes to quicker time controls. And this is rapid. And you may see Ding's clock at 25 minutes and 56 seconds and be wondering, didn't they start with 25 minutes? They have increment. They will gain some time with every move. They will gain 10 seconds. And I like stealing pawns. If it doesn't compromise your entire position in quicker time controls, because this pawn in C5, good luck winning it back. At some point, Ding will push his pawn to B4. That's why his pawn's on C3. And if he can establish the defense of that pawn... Black will have a lot to prove. Compensation is often a vague term. What compensation does Yanda Pomshi have? He has two pawns in the center to one for white. So there's some good news for Jan. I think there's more bad news at the moment. I think this was a smart opening choice, uh, but we're just getting started here. Right? We're only six moves in, too early to predict, but I do enjoy this decision from Dingley Ren. So wait, what happens after knight g4 now? Because, yeah, I do want to get that pawn back. And if the bishop goes to d4, there's e5. If the bishop goes somewhere else, we take that pawn. So you have a few choices, I guess. You can. He decides not to, but it was looked interesting to to attack the bishop there. Yeah, he castled. But let's look. Knight g4, bishop d4, e5 is five. Is he to get this bishop out of here? I guess there's h3 yeah. taking this knight away. And it's a very forcing sequence where white takes the knight. You take this pawn, this knight hops back and takes here. So I think Black's position looks quite flimsy. I would not have advised going for this if I were Jan, and he didn't. He castled instead. But he does, after d4, he does regain the material because the g4 pawn will be hanging. And yeah, you might be right that uh, after knight e4, maybe the h file being opened is actually to White's benefit. But we didn't see that. We saw castle and Whoa. Ding decided to, to hold on to that pawn. I was, I was going to say, like, instead of bishop g2, he could have played b4 as well. Just... Uh, yeah, clinging onto that pawn. And now knight to g4 comes. Wow. What? So Jan knows this position. He must, because that knight may reroute to e5 and over to c4, control some of the squares. But Tanya, I was saying I like grabbing pawns. I know Yasser Saron will be proud. What about you? Do you like white's opening choice thus far? I don't know if this is something I would go for go for in a, in a game, but Robert, I love what we're seeing. And to just add to the excitement, after Jan Napomnishi made the move knight c6, that's a position I don't have in my database. It's a brand new, fresh position right out of the opening. Now, when you're playing in a rapid game, time is such a big factor. I don't believe that Ding would have, would have played on in this fashion and in this manner in a classical game. But in rapid, this just makes it so exciting and so fun. Ding Laren hanging on to that extra pawn and Bishop D4 on the board. The ideas that you were talking about, E5. It reminds me of some kind of a... Grunfeld way of trying to win a pawn back, but reversing colors. So definitely sort of thematic here to try and get e5 in to go into those complications. But this is fire on the board from the start. This is more than what we could have asked for in game one of the Rapid. And Robert, I love the position that we have. It's going to be fun. Hi, a quick question. So you said, well, what, what moves have been played? So Queen c7 was Jan's pretty quick choice here. So this is still familiar territory, or do you think they're starting to get on their own? Bishop e3 is actually when it stops. After bishop e3, shot castle has been played three times, and that's wow. about it. So already it's a very fresh position. Knight c6 never been played. It could be some sort of a transposition, and which is why I'm so amazed to see the speed with which Jan Napomnishi is playing. Tabi, you mentioned that Jan is perhaps familiar with this uh, sort of a setup. Wait. Now after e5, I, I don't understand anymore, because there we were getting h3 and the h, and the h file was opened. And black couldn't take on before and then because there was queen b1 i don't know if we can 
just like show that very quickly. Um, like if we go to the previous move, uh, it's right, a queen c7. Yeah, I think that queen c7 was was quite a clever move because here e5 h3, e d4, h g4, d c3, knight c3, and if knight takes b4, which is a very important pawn, then queen b1 would win the piece because of queen h7. So that's why I'm a bit surprised that he castled now because with the rook no longer on h1, all of this stuff, uh, well, knight takes before can be played. And it's still a question. Knight takes before there's a3 in, in that final position. If we go down the same exact line. Dc3, knight c3, knight takes b or or no, I meant like knight c3 and a knight before then a3. This is a pretty critical line, I think. Um, and that... I was to say, Fabi, that's why Jan is sitting and thinking, this is really deep stuff. So, you know, it, we see the engine off to the side saying white is better. Do you think Ding knows this position? He might. He's playing very quickly, and he didn't really pause after queen c7 either. And this is some kind of... This is like a very concrete position. So you, you would... To figure these positions out, yeah, I think that he, he, must, he must know this position. It must be in his prep. He continues and to blitz out scary. h3 on the board, e5. We might be seeing this line, and we might see a bishop drop down on that long diagonal in the end. Uh, Robert, I don't see a way for white to actually avoid, for black, for Jan to actually avoid this setup that we're looking at with a3 in the end. Yeah, I mean, maybe you can retreat, and I'm just scared of the variation we were looking at, and Jan will be digging deep right now. He's down on the clock. People might be surprised by this. Wasn't Ding Li Ren the one who was always in time trouble? But he has come extremely well prepared. He answers the question, uh, excuse me, you, uh, Ding, your preparation was supposedly leaked. You haven't been pressing with white so much, at least not in the opening stage. He came to answer that right here, but knight f6 as a retreating move. The e5 pawn is defended twice. That would force the bishop back to e3. And so what I'm saying is that black has this strong center. White has the extra pawn. Fabi, how do you assess that trade-off? I think black always has a, a degree of compensation. It's, it's something which you're a bit hesitant to go for because... There's no like concrete follow up after knight of six bishop b three. You'll play a move like you can play rook to d eight. You can play bishop to f five. You have like various ways of playing the position for sure, but nothing which immediately gets back to pawn. Very often black will maybe even play b six, um, and just try to trade off that pawn and then use the open a file and the better structure as compensation. But it's one of those, yeah. Here, here, like maybe b six, b five, you get scared of this. I think okay, we can we can kind of live with. This. Kind of compensation perhaps but after b6 b5 is, is a bit concerning uh but he doesn't go for it. he goes for the concrete option i'm not surprised because it, it feels like it's just a maybe a bit more practical with the black pieces in, in this situation too so uh, let's see knight takes c3 is going to be played I and assume so and then i think he has to play knight takes b4 what else i mean knight d5 is too big a threat to to ignore so you've got to get rid of that pawn Otherwise, you're just going to be down a pawn for, for not much in particular. So, Bobby, can I ask a quick question? So, yeah. Ding Liren has finally paused. Does that just mean he's recalling and he's moving now? So, I think the answer is yes, he's recalling his preparation. Uh, so, how deep do you think his prep goes here? I really don't know because his C3 line allows Black so many early options. Like, like I guess you could, you could prepare the C5 rather... Uh, in quite a bit of depth, especially if they're following the computer's recommendation. It's possible that he just kind of got a bit lucky in terms of uh, that Jan went into something that he just happened to know pretty well. But black after c3 can play like c, you know, c6, uh, bishop f5, knight d7, basically. Uh, there, there's a, bil a billion options because it's not a concrete position. c3 is obviously not a move which immediately threatens black. Uh, so that if he's actually in prep, it's quite... Uh, quite remarkable that that he managed to uh, to get this position in his prep. I mean, it's there were so many options for both sides, you know, early on. So now the question is, uh, you have a, a bunch of logical moves with black. You have bishop to f6. I think Tanya, you mentioned this idea uh, is is Bobby, super logical. Probably bishop f6, and I just want to point out one small tactic: black should not get tempted to take the c5 pawn. Queen c5 here, which hits the knight on c3. And of course, if white does recapture the b4 knight, black's a happy camper, picks up that knight on c3. But there is the intermezzo with the knight jumping to a4. Now you've got a double attack going. You hit the queen on c5. Next move, you pick up the piece. And you're basically just winning on the spot. So queen c5 is a little trap here. 
And uh, as you were saying, Fabi, the knight cannot retreat. The d5 pawn is hanging in the current position. So bishop f6 would make a lot of sense. It's on the board, hitting that knight on c3. Are we expecting Ding to simply sidestep with that rook, bring it to c1, defend the knight, and renew the threat on the knight on, e on b4? Rook c1 makes a lot of sense, or a takes b4 makes a lot of sense. Uh, a b4, bishop c3, rook b1, because you're, you're saying that your queenside pawns are kind of valuable. And let's say bishop takes g4, queen takes d5. On the other hand, black does have the, the bishop pair. But those queenside pawns are, are pretty menacing, and the bishop on c3 is a little bit out of the game for the moment. Maybe a5 was actually important instead of bishop takes g4. Maybe you really need to break up those queenside pawns ASAP, and and probably win the c-pawn. I guess black is, is going to be doing very, very well here. So maybe Ding will play rook c1, as you mentioned. Very logical. Can't be a bad move. Kind of forcing bishop takes c3 because you don't want to lose your d5 pawn. On the board. We might see all of this. So the move rook c1 was just played, just to show what happened here. Protecting this knight. And yeah, Fabi's saying you have to take this knight because if this knight retreats, thank you very much for your central pawn with tempo against your queen, against your bishop. White would be up a pawn and just with the advantage uh, in all directions. So I think that bishop takes is, is forced. But in this line, bishop takes, rook takes, knight c6, queen takes d5, bishop takes g4. We see equal, equal material, but white is very active here on some nice squares, but... How much is this? Yeah, it depends on if white can generate some threats quickly, because if given time, black will be positionally doing completely fine. Uh, of course, black is not going to be better. Black is still uh, at best going to be equalizing. But after bishop g4, yeah, I, I guess, does he have options besides bishop g4? He does have maybe a move like rook to d8. Also makes a lot of sense. Bobby, does why actually have to take this pawn? Because that's a long-term weakness. So now I'm just thinking, can white push this pawn to g5? Um, yeah, g5, rook to d8. So how is that going? And then and and a knight d4 or something like that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. But then queen to e5. Well, that g5 pawn is is also a weakness, which mm -hmm. is going to be the the knight may be tied to the defense of it. And also, if black gets d4 here, I'm starting to think that black is gaining a lot of very important space. Right. So and how would C you continue? C5 pawn is loose as well. So I have some nice looking uh, ideas here, but I also have to w be worried because my pawns, white's pawns are very loose in this position. And yeah, that's a bit of a struggle because knight d4, as you point out, queen e5 is a nasty way of attacking the knight in the center, attacking the g5 pawn. Yeah, this is getting a little tactical and maybe good for black. To me, it looks like black is equalizing here. You can still take on c6, play queen d2, but you're not absolutely thrilled to have taken on c6 and uh, helped black deal with the weakness of the b7 pawn and also the weakness of the d5 pawn. Now both of those pawns are quite secure. So this is definitely an option. Like It, it looks like a position where white can certainly play on, uh, but probably not for a serious chance of an advantage. Yeah, g5 is an option, queen d5. Those are two moves that Ding will be thinking about here. I just say I think both players approached the opening quite well. Ding had some original ideas. Dion played quickly and it seems like in a very healthy manner. So so far so good for both of them. Yeah, and Tanya, I guess you know I just asked Fabi. You got to ask you too. Would you grab this pawn in d5? I know it's hard to pass up. Or would you push this pawn to g5 and say your isolated pawn is a long-term weakness if I can accurately play around it? Robert, I have to admit that g5 would not have come to my mind, but the moment you pointed it out. I love that move. G5, you kind of just hold on to your own G-pawn and say D5, long-term weakness, and I'm going to try and target it. The line that we were looking at with that pawn perhaps advancing to D4 after G5, Rook slides into D8 to defend it. You're threatening D4. White can have long-term plans of shifting the queen away from D1, doubling up on the D file. I just feel that I can start targeting your D4 pawn. My bishop on G2 will be an absolute monster once you push D4. Look at that long diagonal. Uh, and yes, G5 is a grandmaster level move. I'm not sure how easily I would have found it, but the moment that you mention it, I do like it. I do like G5. And the fact that Ding has slowed down at this moment, hasn't just automatically captured the pawn on D5, he's definitely looking at that. And we've been talking about who this opening has been a success for. An amazing idea by Ding to go for this. As mentioned earlier, a brand new position, very, very early on, a fresh idea, perhaps a certain Richie, Richard Rappo had something to do with that. <laughs>
fit. It's worked really well so far, but also equally impressive how Jan hasn't gone into any kind of panic mode or shock mode. He's been playing fast and so far, so good for black as well. Big option. Does Ding grab on d5 or does he keep the pressure with g5? Well, now I'm wondering about a third and Fabi, I'm going to throw it to you because Tanya's idea where you could play g5 and queen a4 let me think, can I just start with queen a4 and then try to put a rook on the d file? I protect my pawn from the fourth rank. So the big question, I think we're looking at two branches. Either we trade d5 for g4, or if we're going to try to keep our g pawn and go after the d pawn later, is a move like queen a4 a good idea for white? Yeah, I was considering this option a bit because queen a4, it comes to mind as a way to prevent black from playing d4. So for example, after rook d8, you can play rook to d1. And you would like to blockade on that square. Uh, it also makes it more difficult because the g-pawn push, it does allow the f5 square to be used for black's bishop. And now it's not easy to say where the bishop, black bishop will go. It can go to e6, but it's a bit passive there. It can go to d7. I don't think tactically white can take the d5-pawn yet, but I don't see what it's doing on d7, especially here, knight to e7 would win material. So uh, white would have to wait with capturing that pawn, but then white could maybe consider g5 at a later moment. I'm not sure how black can use this as a discovered attack on the queen, unless it wins material tactically. Because for example, g5, knight to e5, I think white can play either queen d4 or queen f4, both are very logical moves. Knight f3, bishop f3, and here we have like a, an ideal situation for white because the d-pawn is firmly blockaded, it's not advancing, and white can also consider a kingside attack with king g2, rook h1, and potentially targeting the h7-pawn. It's not guaranteed that this will lead to some sort of victory because black has bishop of five at some moment to defend that pawn but overall white is definitely pressing here in a very very safe and comfortable way so for rabbit chess this is like dream for white and nightmare for black but after queen a4 uh i was thinking also rook d8 is super logical but then i think knight how, do you, how are you dealing with this maybe knight to d4 because e3 allows rook to e4 and now knight d4 queen d4 rook e2 uh, it does grab Wait. a pawn but Fabi, Fabi, oh. check me in one. Oh my god. There you go. <laughs> Don't take it's, on d4. It's okay. It's rapid chess. I forgive you. But ding. I mean, he hasn't moved yet. So queen a4, queen d5, g5, three logical moves. Uh, so do you think queen a4 is now becoming increasingly likely the more he thinks? Or what direction is he going to take this game? And well, he just answered it immediately by taking on d5. I think the most likely option is queen takes d5. I say that absolute <laughs> fact. It's... So this is logical. I mean, here here he can continue with rook to b1. I think that's that's a pretty interesting way to continue. He also can like play queen to e4. I think he would like to see a trade on f3 because that would give the white the very powerful bishop compared to black's knight. Uh, but it's not... I think maybe queen a4 was a little bit more of a testing option, even though they're yeah. probably equivalent moves. I just like, like keeping control and trying to establish that blockade on d4. Here it's more... Like Black can probably calculate his way out of any trouble if that happens. Yeah, Tanya, I mean, you actually inspired me with that queen uh, slides a4. So I, I I agree, but I guess the question is, do you feel like now Jan's pieces are more free and that he has more ideas of his own and maybe Ding should not have swapped those pawns just now? It's definitely a very open position. And as we can see, Black is coming in with more development with tempos. That queen on d5 can be targeted with the rook sliding onto d8. That pawn on e2 can be targeted with the other rook sliding into e8. So it does look like the next few moves are going to be easier for Jan to make. And what's the follow up here? You've got the c5 pawn. You've got to watch out for that c5 and a3 pawn, which have been disconnected. Perhaps something to worry about in the long term. But that's a far away end game possibility. But just something to keep in mind. I think these kind of positions, white can't really afford to play super slow. You've got to find your own chances. And I'm trying to think, what's the move here? Do you start chasing the black bishop? Does a move like queen g5 make sense? I want to attack your bishop. I want to start doubling up on the d-line. You're going to laugh. And maybe you both will laugh at me or with me. But you remember that knight g5 in game 14? Could we see another knight g5? Because it has a pretty nasty threat of queen e4. Yeah, that's nice. I mean, both of those moves that you guys mentioned are very interesting. Knight g5 uh, has a very direct threat. Queen g, well, oh, so does queen g5. Oh, but he oh, plays knight g5. Oh Great my god, watch out! This is a big threat right now. So we can deal with this 
in a few ways. I think queen, maybe queen e7 allows rook e3 though. That's that could start to look a bit dangerous. Queen to f6 suddenly is forced, and then uh, you know white gets some time for knight to e4, um, knight to d6 ideas. So even though black is not tactically losing here, just the knight being on d6 is, is enough to uh, to trouble black quite a bit. So actually, after rook e3, maybe queen d8 is forced, but you don't want to get into that territory. So queen e7 feels like uh, you you don't want that move. H6 allows queen to e4. I think this is very interesting for white. H takes g5, force queen g4, attacks g5, and queen to e5 would be the logical way to continue this line. But white has pressure, probably with a variety of moves here. Um, you know, could, it could be rook b3. Then we, there's a lot to calculate. Rook b3, knight d4. It could be rook to c4. Also, some move like that might be. Might be also very pleasant for white. If you get like e3, and then you slowly pressure the b7 pawn, then we're I think we're talking about something for white here. Some pressure. So, Seems way easier for white to play these types of positions. Yeah, for sure. Maybe some rook to e8 is the right way. Which rook? So rook f to e8? And then white will play knight e4, right? At some point. Yeah, why not pop a pony on d6 and see what happens later? These pawns are weak. That knight is established, entrenched on the square. This looks very, very nice for Dingley Ren. Even sacking the e2 pawn because bishop e2, rook b1. I, I, it's not the material. It's like the b7 pawn is a is a really serious weakness. Once the knight comes to d6, the tactical danger is is really through the roof. Uh, maybe maybe a bishop one a6 kind of defends that pawn, but you don't want to do that to yourself, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey Tanya, that feels like a very, very sad bishop. I know it protects a pawn and is protected by the pawn, but then it's out of play on the other side of the board. Well, that pony on d6 that you're talking about, that's no pony. That's an absolute dragon on the board, Robert, if that knight does land on d6. And that's what we were talking about, right? White needs to be direct here. White needs to play quickly for the attack. And Ding Liren going with the idea of knight g5, a big threat on the board with the queen stepping back, a double attack, a mate on h7, a potential mate on h7, and hitting that bishop on g4. And this has got to be a deja vu moment for Jan Napomnesi. Because Ding went for the attack with this exact same move in game 14. Now that didn't work out so well, but here the foundation for this attack just feels a lot better than it did in game 14. You know but I, I like how both these guys are approaching the game. I think they're they're playing really well. And also, I feel like they're playing better in Rapid than in Classical Chess. And maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like... Well, why, are we, why are we having these seven-hour games when, when they play better with, with 25 minutes on their clock? <laughs> are we commentating with Magus Carlson or Fabiana Caruana? Because that sounds uh, like his argument. But I, <laughs> I, I do think that the play thus far in Rapid has been really high level. I know we're only 18 moves in. We are going to have a best of four match here in Rapid Time Patrol, 25 minute plus 10 seconds added per move. But this has been a high level game. Ding comes with exquisite opening preparation and Jan Napomshi thinks for a little bit in the early going and says, you know what, I can handle this. We're in a position where it's not a symmetrical pawn structure. White has these split pawns that Tanya said is a worry in the long term. Black has a healthier pawn structure, but white has all the activity with the knight and the queen, the e4 squares available for the queen to run a checkmate or for the knight to reroute and hop into d6 so i like the look of this position for white we see the eval bar saying black is in this but fabi i'm getting the sense that it's much more difficult for black to play even on this turn you we could see the evaluation bar swing heavily in white's favor yeah it's it's very easy to imagine white so after h6 I, yeah i was going to say that white has a choice here queen to e4 is what we looked at but i'm really tempted by knight to e4 it's similar to rookie a94 because uh, I, I'm sacking the e2 pawn. That's absolutely true. But that pawn is, is not as relevant, I think, as getting the knight to d6. And after knight to e4, I think we should examine this because it's, it's a really potentially critical line. And Ding, the reason why Ding is thinking at this moment is because it's a huge decision for white. Queen to e4 and knight to e4 are both extremely logical moves and they lead to very, very different types of positions. One is a pawn sack. The other is just an attempt to kind of secure a slight advantage, keep control of the position. Uh, I guess black can, I don't know if black needs to take on e2 or if it's the best option, but let's have a look at bishop takes e2. I guess, yeah, rook to b1, It's it, it can also go to e1, but let's say to b1. And how is, how is black supposed to approach this? Um, 
I don't. Rook a to d8, knight d6, bishop a6, but you really don't want to put your bishop on a6. I would take, I would take white's position if black is forced to put the bishop there. Are you, and I think what's very instructive to our audience is that black's extra pawn is this pawn over here. It's not really playing a part in the current dynamics of the game. This knight on d6 means a rook can't go to e8. I'll take that. It's putting pressure on b7, which means your bishop is offside over here. Your knight, it can move, but where to? There is no strong outpost for it. And later, a knife can come to f5 and try to help threaten uh, checkmate, not to mention bishop e4, queen f5. So we have seen a move played. It was indeed knight to e4. So uh, it's a pawn sacrifice, uh, but... You know, it's not a movie anymore. This is real life, and this knight is coming to d6. I like Jan's move as well. I mean, uh, knight d4 looked like the most critical move, although it was really a tough choice between that and queen e4. And I like rook e8 because after knight d6, he gets his rook active. And the, the real problem with black's position in those uh, pawn side lines we just looked at were that black's rooks were being dominated by the knight on d6 because they couldn't get access to the e8 square, the c8 square, and so on. The d8 square is kind of like looking into into a rock, right? You're not, you don't want to take on d6, so basically your rook doesn't achieve much there. But on e2, it really does. And also after knight d6, black can consider a rook to e5. So he plays e3, no longer a pawn sack, rook to e5 on the board. Uh, so it's concrete now. Can white establish a knight, or is black's activity, like you could trade queen, or try to trade queens. I don't think black will take on d6 in case queen d6 happens. I think maybe queen d6 could be met by queen to a5, for example. Uh, it could also be met by a trade on black's terms, but I think I think queen a5 is very logical. And one is there thing... an insane tactic with queen d6, queen a5, knight f6, or is it... Yeah, it's the probably just insane, is... but the tactic doesn't work. Yes. Ah, but it's such a really instructive idea that knight f6, you give a knight to take this knight here, and you're trying to go after, well, this, these pieces, but unfortunately this rook on c3 is loose over on the queen side but that that idea knight of six by the way can't happen if a rook comes to c4 or something on the fourth rank this bishop is also loose so tanya is eyeing for some kind of knight of six check tactics this knight of course can also sink its teeth into d6 and black can't afford to make a move like b6 you're opening up this side of the board and then your knight of six tactics will play a part after taking on b6 there will be knight f6 and getting this knight here on c6 so it's a very precarious spot for Jan Pomsch. he is up a couple minutes so tanya what do you make of this first ding was ahead in the clock now Jan, he's stabilized the positions to some extent and now he has a slight lead on time it's a two minute lead and in a rapid game that could count for a lot just depending on how quickly he makes the next few moves but i like the way how he's handled it knight d6 is still a scary threat to deal with this is a game for all three results where draw is perhaps the least likely that knight jumping on d6 and i still prefer ding's position i think team ding can pat themselves on the back for how well the opening has worked out for them in this game one of the rapid i'm with you fabi so knight d6 we know that's the main idea what happens next like what is white's plan to pile up on either b7 or what's the main idea to follow knight d6 yeah, I think if white knight d6 happens, white continues with rook b1, and black really actually just needs to avoid that scenario. So it's not even so much what does white do after knight d6, it's really how does black avoid that, because let's say we put rook d8 knight d6 on the board, I think it's already just a, a pretty bad position for black. Uh, and the main issue for black is that b6 would be nice, but it just probably tactically does not work after cb6, queen d6, queen d6, rook d6, and b7, I think, is that... I mean, it's actually quite sharp, but knight b8, rook c8 does seem to win the game. So, wow. okay, this is this is this is really close to being okay for black, but uh, unfortunately for him, it doesn't seem to work out. But Fabi, it's relevant because rook d8 was just played, and just to remind everybody how we got there, the first move of the variation was rook d8, which earned a question mark, and you said as much. You said rook d8 is not a good idea, and the knight just plants itself on d6, and the advantage is growing for Dingley Ren, and Black has no active counterplay at the moment. Rook b1 is obviously the next move, and b7's in huge trouble. I think he missed. I think he missed the b7 in the end. Just he was probably thinking b6 works out. And maybe he should have played queen a5 instead of rook d8 because like before my, my second point before he, he made the move was going to be that white black needs to prevent knight d6 at all costs and maybe queen a5 was a way to do so by trying to target the c5 pawn before because now after queen a5 i think it might be too late to target that pawn white can just try to defend the c pawn with maybe queen c2 there's there might be other ways but then black has to deal with the knight b7 threat so i think black needed to get ahead of the knight d6 a move and he maybe thought he was by playing b6 here but b6 we saw it just doesn't work tactically because the pawn on b7 it's a bit 
surprising maybe visually that black doesn't have knight b8 there it feels like black is able to cover the eighth rank with something but after b7 you just you just don't have anything to cover the eighth rank it's just very concrete one one move and black would be fine but but he's gonna make so he's gonna do something else because this is yeah clearly but b7 b7 is extraordinary every other move it seems like black has chances but b7 would win the game it said rook h5 so this oh. feels like rapid chess we are seeing a rook come to an open h file is there going to be a checkmate well if this knight gets the e5 into f3 so tanya i know the eval bar is going up in white's favor but this is at least double-edged yeah, this is why you don't care about what the eval bar is saying because your opponent makes a move like rook h5 knight e5 ideas and also queen d7 bishop h3 i really want to get my queen onto that h file to give a checkmate these are things that you start thinking about you start worrying about white's plan is clear white wants to go for the b7 pawn yan's plan is clear he wants to go for ding's king here who gets where faster is the question i'm expecting ding to slow down and actually judge how dangerous this attack really is a move like rook b1 is what he's considering but then just does black start following it up immediately with a trade off the fian shadowed bishop on g2 that is the key defender in white's position it would be an absolute dream for black to get these bishops off the board i have to show i, think, uh, it's, I mean i Fabi, i know what you're gonna say so let's say it together that rook b1 there's knight to <laughs> e5 because if the rook takes b7 thank you for a free pawn i'm getting your queen but knight f3 check is devastating if you move your king Thank you for your queen with check as well. If you take, bishop takes, that is unstoppable checkmate on h1. So rook b1 would be a huge mistake from Dingley Ren at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Rook b1 allows, I mean, it would be very strong if not for this 95 idea that, that you demonstrated. And then the question is, how does white deal with both the idea of 95 and the other idea, Tani, that you mentioned of bishop to h3? Because if white... If white made some passing move like a4, I think black's idea would not be knight e5 because then f4 would come, but to play bishop to h3. And obviously a4 doesn't... Um, wait, what if the bell bar didn't... My a4 was my uh, kind of demonstrative move, and then the bell bar didn't move when I played when you played a4 there, so... Uh, Maybe a4 is a good so move. So a4 is not a bad move, <laughs> but it doesn't do anything, so there must be a better move. Well, I think what it means, Fabi, is that white's just better here because you have a knight that's sitting on d6 and can't really be kicked out. So even if the bishop trade happens, and this is informative for us, that we're looking at this like, okay, bishop h3, that looks scary for white, and the computer's probably laughing. I'll just take and play king g2. So he does play... He played rook b1. You saw Jan. He's looking Whoa. like, are, are you sure about that? Because knight e5 turns the tables. Oh, he wants to play e4, but black can, black can play queen takes... Oh, no, black can't play queen. Okay, I got excited. And rook b1 okay, wants, 95, he wants to play tempting, and, and <laughs> you even move you want to make it in a bullet game but knight e5 you need that rook on f1 so that you can get f4 in and the f3 square is controlled and yan in seconds plays knight e5 this is turning around and getting super dangerous for ding now and he plays yeah, he wants to play e4 for sure that, that was the idea but it feels a bit shaky and now you don't threaten rook takes b7 because of queen takes b7 so black is given room to breathe and also uh Bobby, I, I think I see it. Like, can you play this move B6? Because after pawn takes B6, pawn takes B6, you can't take the queen because knight F3 check again. I've given up the queen, but this is checkmate on H1. I think this is the idea, and I think Jan spotted it. I the way he looked at Ding, he's like, uh, are you sure about this? This knight on E5 is too strong. Yeah, that that's beautiful. So I when I got excited earlier, I was going to suggest queen takes C5. <laughs> With the same idea, but after rook c5, knight f3, bishop f3, bishop f3, there's rook takes h5. So I got like momentarily excited by this queen sack. But but I heard you. Is... I heard you say queen takes c5, and I didn't show it because I didn't want to you know, put you on the spot, blundering this uh, position. But you gave me the idea, and so he plays b6. Yeah, he spots it. He spots the queen sacrifice. Are we gonna see that happen? No. Well, Ding will not take the queen, but but this is a brilliant, uh, brilliant find by Jan. Wow. But for sure, Ding Ding will not fall for it. Oh my gosh, what in Does he I... have time to put in F4 here? He, he might, but then there are all sorts of problems around this king on G1. It's very open on the king's side. And this rook on H5, it looked like a strange move. We, you know, you're saying you're tunneling on attack. That's not going to happen, but it might happen. I mean, this is a huge attacking possibility. And Jan Nepomneshi, 
I, Ernest Hemingway, I believe it was him, once said that courage is grace under pressure. He was under pressure on the queen's side. He gracefully steps his knight into e5. He will give up her majesty on c7 because checkmate is more valuable, and that is what he's aiming for. So I, I'm thinking about some like very interesting lines with, after f4. Because after f4, it's super, super direct, super critical, and black has to move knight to f3. Whoa. Yes. And... So knight to f3 is forcing bishop takes f3. Yep. Okay, so let's... Uh, yeah, well, let's Ding's, this is exactly what Ding's thinking about. f4, knight f3 check, so takes, takes... Bishop f3. c takes b6. Because you can't take on f3, queen c5 will win the oh, knight back. My goodness, check to this king and give me that knight. Okay, good and point. black is up a pawn. But after c takes b6, black's threat of rook h1, rook h2... It, it was a threat, but the queen on c7 is now attacked. And it's some chaos. I mean... Uh, if you take rook takes d6, then b takes c7, white is promoting first and will win the game. Wait, or not. Wait, okay, no, okay the evaluation <laughs> okay. bar reacted okay. a little slowly, but it is winning, yes. Trust yourself. Thinking. And so, how is black responding here? It might be some queen move somewhere, like, it's it's absolutely crazy position. Uh, oh my gosh, what? this queen is under attack multiple times. It could be something. It could be queen takes b6, rook b6, rook h1, king f2, <laughs> rook h2. I think that's that's. Oh, it says give no. me that queen. No, 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 it's not. Because the problem is rook h2. I take this on f3. Yeah, I thought rook takes d2, but then knight. Uh, this is under wait, attack. Is... This is under attack. Knight takes f7 probably wins. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you just start taking pawns. Good, fine, but Fabi, yeah. you see these things so deeply. Help us mere mortals, then you are being very <laughs> instructive here that this knight was under attack twice, the rook was under attack, so it starts taking some pawns in the process. White would be in a winning rook and pawn ending over there. So, wow, big idea, f4, knight, f3, check. But to see after c takes b6, we haven't found the move for black, so the onus will be on Yana Pomshi in this position. Knight f3 takes, takes, c takes b6. Maybe it's some kind of queen move to go for a checkmate. D7, yeah. But that looks... No, it's not that either. I'm, I'm making the most natural moves. I'm making mistakes. This is how tricky the position is. Hmm. Yeah, this is, a, Maybe this you is just not take obvious in that case. Here, and then yeah. queen g2? You just, yeah, you steal the yeah. bishop and yeah. queen g2. Good idea by Tanya. Just covering the checkmate, trying to trade queens. You have a pass pawn. So what in the world does black have available there? Can black just keep the contact with that knight on d6 and step one more square towards uh, that king? Go queen e7 right now. I want to pick up the knight with my rook. And I'm just looking at these lines with b7. And I think you can still take rook... No, rook d6, you queen with a check. Well, then, you, <laughs> then you take the queen, rook h1, rook h2, rook oh, d2. Okay, well, we see a move. Let's go back to the live board. We see cb6, ab6 has been played. And that was an inaccuracy, apparently, by Ding Luren. But the evaluation bar is still only slightly in Jan's favor. A takes b6 is a brilliant move. That deserves not just two exclamation points, maybe 20. Because that was such a nasty idea. Just to remind everybody, you cannot take a queen. This isn't one of you know, my games where I accidentally blundered my queen in speed chess. Knight f3 check would be available. It was an unexpected, amazing idea that Jan Nepomsh is uncorked in this first game of the tiebreaks in the World Championship. But do not take what appears to be a free queen. That would be a devastating blunder that would lose Dingley Ren the game. But so the question that we have to answer is what can he do to save this game? It says it's only slightly better for only, Black, but everything Only one is move here, I think. What's that? I think knight to b5. Knight to b5 has to be played. So after rook d2, you play knight c7, you, you don't lose contact with the f3 square. And for sure, Black uh, has a lot of activity. But after knight b5, I don't see like the tactical issues. And uh, what other moves do you have? I think that this is his plan, because otherwise you just lose your knight on d6. Or you get checkmated. So a b6, okay, I have a name for this. What's it this called? is this is the advanced Botez Gambit. <laughs> we saw the Botez Gambit. It didn't work out. This is Jan's prep is to, you know, he's he's learned for, from the greats of the past and he's amended it. And this is the advanced Botez Gambit. And we see people saying, oh no, my queen, a la Eric Rosen. And also Fabi saying, oh, who cares about the white queen? Because then you get the black queen with your knight. And it's very important, this is essential, everybody, that the rook needs to stay in contact with the f3 square. Because if you take this queen, just once more to remind you all, knight f3 check, the bishop takes, and then this bishop gets in, threatening checkmate in the corner. That's why we tell you to keep your fee and bishops on the board, because you created 
a mating net around your king. So Tanya, knight b5, Fabi pointed out the only move for white to keep the balance here. Do you think Dingley runs spots this? Now he's just over five minutes remaining. And he has to, right? Or he goes in for this line with f4 directly, hitting that knight on e5, as long as the rook on c3 still has uh, the f3 square under control. I think he's he is reaching out. He finds it. He finds the move knight b5. But we've got to take this position in for just a second, right? White's queen is hiding on d2. Black's queen can be picked up with the knight or the rook on the move right before this. Yanna Pamnashi is sacrificing a queen for a mating attack on the king's side. This is stunning chess. Knight b5 played. Will Yan go for the end game or does he simply keep the pressure? Go queen e7. Move that queen away. You're still putting pressure on that d2 queen. Keep the tension on. Two tempting options. Fabi, queen e7 looks good for a potential attack. Rook takes d2. How can we not la like landing our rook on the second rank or the seventh rank if you want? But knight takes e7 without queens. Do you think that Jan has realistic winning chances? I think that he should probably trade queens because there's also risk for black. Like you, you could attack, but your rook on h5 could become stranded if there's no attack. And queen e7, white can consider queen to e3. Uh, I mean, you can also put the queen on f4. Maybe that's, it's hard to say exactly which is better. Queen to f4, keep some contact with the bishop on g4. So, but in any case, I, I'm not seeing like the clear uh, direct continuation for black there. Maybe to trade bishops on h3 because the bishop on g2 is pretty, is a really wonderful defender. But I'm looking at rook d2, knight c7, and knight to d3 as a, as a very concrete approach. I mean, rather than, uh, you know, moving about and going for some vague play, let's go for a direct play. It's usually uh, usually how you're supposed to play when you have the initiative. You attack f2, rook f1 is met by bishop to e2. That looks pretty passive for white. Uh, maybe you can go back and forth with rook b1. And, wow. Maybe white's <laughs> holding, but here it's nice for black because you have the the uh, uh, safety net, the drawing. You can you know play bishop g4, bishop b2, and so on if you want. And after bishop g4, but Fabi, just quick thing, you're such a super GM that you accidentally find three move repetitions that nobody else would find. Like yeah, so this bishop is g4, rook f1. Okay, Anish, <laughs> Anish will have a field day with this one. <laughs> but okay, so instead of uh, after rook f1, or where did you want to? Well, if, if white doesn't play rook to f1 and white tries to avoid this and plays, for example, f3, I'm getting super worried that just like the simple bishop to h3, that, you know, white just starts to get checkmated. I mean, if you, it, it, you'd think like you don't checkmate in an endgame, but actually you, you do somehow checkmate in an endgame. And for example, bishop to h1 here, I can no. play. Yeah, you don't want to do that, but after rook g5, I think it's like, I mean, I'm threatening checkmate in, in whatever. Yeah, and here, king f1, rook f2, and there, there is your checkmate. So white might have to be super precise, but this rook f1, maybe he's very fortunate that he's holding it together that way. I think Ding has seen this, and that's why he was pausing with the move knight to b5. But somehow Jan took over the initiative fully. Amazing. Jan's going to keep yeah. the queens in this position, Fabi. He's going to be so tempted to keep the queens and the pressure on the board. Look at Ding's time. He's down to less than six minutes on the clock. And it's really not clear what's the path after queen e7 because you are hitting the queen on d2. You've got ideas of bishop h3, knight f3 in the air. I'm predicting queen e7 by Yan. No trade here. <laughs> but I, I think one of the, what we have to consider is the match situation as well because if this were a one-off game, I think queen e7 makes a lot of sense. But as Fabi's saying, there is some risk here. This rook on h5 is in an odd spot. It doesn't really have too much mobility. And if we can firmly defend our squares, then white can also look at this b6 pawn as a target. This knight can go through c7 back to d5 at a critical moment. And I, I know that I have to keep my queen safe first, but I could see that being risky. And Jan does take on d2. I think the match situation plays a big role in his decision making. A draw with black is a good result overall. It means he'll have two whites in the rapid and Dingley Ren will only have one remaining. Yeah, I think that it's just a practical decision. He sees after knight d3. White's probably only defenses rook to f1, and then at least he has a safety net of the draw. Also, in with the queens on, I was like, I just had a flashback. Game twelve. I mean, it's it's obviously a very different position, but the rook the rook was on h6 there, uh, with the game which Jan was winning but lost that really crucial game. I mean, the rook was stranded. It, it was an attack attacking piece which ended up getting stranded, and you can easily see this. You think I have a bunch of pieces surrounding my opponent's king. 
but the bishop on g2 usually defends things really really well so unless you see something concrete there you don't want to go for it because i would see shades of that game 12 where uh you know ding starts to vacuum up the queen side in this case the queen side is one pawn but he plays queen to e3 he attacks the b6 pawn he takes it he gets a material advantage the attack doesn't work out you start to wonder why didn't i go for what was the objectively correct approach which was rook d2 knight c7 and now the only question to me is okay jan will have a draw in hand if he wants it even that is a very good outcome will he have more after knight d3 rook f1 does does black have a try there i see rook to c5 as potentially a try knight d3 rook f1 rook c5 is coming to mind here and we see jan i mean he is thinking about this position because he can hop his knight in and dingley ren look at him he's analyzing right now he's Darting from left to right, both sides of the board are under his focus because uh, his F2 pawn, that's the pawn that we expect to be targeted. He knows he can slide his rook over in the defense of it. But as Fabi is saying, that black rook on H5 will have a new availability along the fifth rank, and that could pose White some problems. So we see Jan has made his move. He was bishop H3 instead. And I honestly think that, you know, without shutting this position down, that black could be in some long-term danger with this pawn on b6 already under attack. Yeah, I, I think that this move, I mean, it contains contain, contain such a direct threat that I do like it. The threat is to take and play knight to g4. And then black, uh, crucially, not only attacks f2, but also threatens rook to h2. So he takes, and he'll probably play king g2. I mean, you might as well kick that king back. Can he also just bring his knight back? And isn't that threatened to win this rook over here? Oh, that does. Wait, so knight, oh my knight d5 is a very nice move. So wait, can black play knight? I'm trying to calculate knight g4, knight f4, and then rook let's, h2. Let's, let's analyze it very quickly. Knight f4, this rook h2. Oh, f3 and somehow this and g5 is very important. F3. G5 well, is super also, important. The, the rooks defend oh, each other, yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. good news. Yeah, and actually, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm hallucinating. I mean, you can just play knight to e5 or something like that. Yeah, but this already doesn't look good for white. So you found knight g4 here to give your rook the h2 score, but that looks like a flimsy configuration. Even with like rook f3, just preemptively defending, trying to kick this knight out of here. I'm getting worried for Jan. I know the eval bar says zeros, but something about this rook on the h file, you gave us flashbacks to a game 12, Fabi. I could see that being a point in this game as well. Yeah, it's it's a double-edged position for sure. I Because you're really going... Your play is kind of one-dimensional, as in you, you're very often losing your b-pawn. I mean, that pawn can no longer be defended. So you're counting on the fact that white will not be able to capture it because the king safety is a more important issue. But if at some point black's pieces get forced back, as you I, I like that knight d5 move a lot. I wonder if maybe g5 is, is an interesting mm -hmm. option there. Because I want to create that g4 knight f3 sort of... I don't really believe it works because the rook might get trapped with knight f4, but g5... Does come to mind as an interesting idea in some positions. I actually want to show that one very quickly. And Tanya, I mean, this position, it's one where we're talking about how black could have been on the attack. But let's say I'm just trying to force this position somehow. If you play g4, I mean, I still have knight f4, right? Your yeah. rook is trapped. So that's the big problem. So Tanya, we see the game. Do you think that Ding Li Ren might be able to take this one? And do you think uh, that Jan, he feels confident about his chances here? This is getting super tricky now, but I do like how Jan has just focused on the king side. He has this one idea of either landing with a knight to g4 or f3. And I'm thinking about these lines that you and Fabi are looking at. Knight d5, Fabi, the move g5 makes so much sense. But where's your rook heading after king g2? I was struggling to find a safe spot because suddenly the rook can't go back to h5. That knight on d5 will jump over to f6. But there's a different approach that... Dingler in takes, he first hits that rook on h3. And after rook h5, he could very well be heading to d5 with the knight. You're still coming to f4. You're still hitting the pawn on b6. But now with this king on g2, knight g4, the checks become real. There's rook f2, rook h2 coming in with the check. So now I like knight g4 a lot more in this position. Oh, but what a move. Rook nice. b5. He pins along the fifth rank. And okay, Black, what, what does Black do here, Fabi? Maybe g6? Oh, <laughs> I mean, then there's like knight e8 to f6. Uh, knight e8, knight g4. Okay. We're keeping, we're oh, keeping it together. Mm -hmm. I, th I think maybe g... Because how else are you dealing with this? I mean... Um, oh, by the way, after g6, knight e8, there's also... I don't know, there's not rook takes f2. But there almost is rook takes f2. Yeah, these tactics are going to be everywhere. Yeah, g6 is the move here. 
Uh, also, knight d5 there is met by knight to g4. But you know what I'm looking at? What's that? Is this a draw? g6, knight d5. Knight to g4. King to f3. Rook takes f2. King g4, rook g5, and repetition. Wow. Oh, oh my god. King, king h3, not a king h4, because, uh, yeah. King h3, rook h5. I don't see the mate after king g4 for black. Because f5 crucially blunders the, like, e5, g5, it's not mate because king takes h5. So Very important point. I know I'm like thrilling all you guys with, with <laughs> one draw after the other. You are. But we take this draw. This was fantastic. But Wait. a different move by Jan. He goes rook d1 and he wants to try to set up the mate, but he's coming in with the other rook to h1 and start threatening a mate on g1. That's what he wants. But the e5 knight, he's got to watch out for that. It's it's a it's not a threat of mate. It's a threat of draw because rook h1, rook e5, rook h2 is a rep. Wait. Wait. So rook h1, knight e7, king h7 is a draw, right? Okay, that's actually an essential save at this point because it looks like you just blundered into a mating at either rook to h1. Sets up checkmating ideas, but this rook to go rook h2. And Dingley Ren, he's down to 3 minutes and 21 seconds, but he is finding great defensive resources. So uh, I love rook b5. Knight d5 also looks valuable because he has this check to keep that rook in contact with the knight. And that means rook h1, one of these ideas could be a mistake. Well, I think rook d to h1 is a draw, and it's what we're going to see. Yeah, nice nice game. Well played. And knight e7, king h7, rook e5, rook uh, 1 to h2 leads to a repetition of moves. And this is going to be seen on the board any second. I mean, why can play... King can't step up to f3 because the rook on e5 hangs, so he has to stay connected to that rook on h1. And there we see what a draw this has been. Handshakes, the first game of the rapid playoff ends in a draw but it was anything but peaceful robert oh my goodness we saw fireworks on display it's only 5 51 a.m in new york but i feel like i'm at a festival that was some exhilarating chess these players brought their all to game one i thought the opening advantage was dingley Renz, but then he misstepped after planting his knight on d6 so Jan napamshi i think he escaped to some extent with that half point yeah that was a that was a really Really the fun game. The accuracy rate of this of this game, Fabi. If you had to take a guess on accuracy, how much do you think this would be? Probably like ninety-four percent. Wow. It just felt like the players were playing the best moves in this game one. What a thrilling finish that was, ending in a perpetual after sacrificing that piece. And in the tie breaks, the players start with a level game. But this has just set the tone for the rest of the three rapid games remaining. It's going to be fireworks from the start. And now Jan Napomnishi will start with the white pieces. Robert, some big moments in this game. Some huge moments as early as move four. In a previous game, I mentioned that you could take this pawn c5. I was curious if Dingley Ren would go for it. He does indeed. And after e6, plays the awkward looking bishop e3, saving his pawn. So Fabi, I mean, the early stage of this game, advantage Dingley Ren. Yeah, I think overall Ding was definitely dictating the result of the opening. And it was a really nice opening choice for him. He was well prepared. The critical moment was probably after that rook to h5 move. I know we're, we're, we're going through a lot of really tense and uh, unclear positions, but they were just playing perfectly. And then at some point, at some point, Jan made a mistake. Maybe, maybe it was this rook to d8 move. And maybe it was based on missing that b6 loses the game because of this b7 move that we, we spotted, which is really crucial for white. Proving an advantage here, not just an advantage, but the win. And then Jan went for this remarkable rook to h5 idea. I think it was a brilliant practical try. It was based on the tactics that we saw in the game. Ding had some way to an advantage here, but it wasn't easy. Maybe it was the move f4. I, I was going to suggest this move before Ding played rook to b1, but who knows what would have happened there. Rook to b1 allowed Jan to unleash some, some beautiful tactics, which we feel like they're so beautiful they should be enough for a win, but but they're only enough for a draw, it turns out, with this queen sacrifice. Beautiful. I mean, this deserves so many exclamation points to show you all once more. Rook c7 was met by knight f3 check. You can avoid checkmate, but you lose your queen and then your knight. Black steals a piece. And if you take and say, I'm up a queen, well, you're down a checkmate. Rook h1 would end the game. So Dingley Ren was not falling for that. He played his only move, knight to b5. And after the queens were swapped, there were some chances here. The rook on h3 was almost trapped. Some great moves like rook b5. But Jan was able to bail out just in time. After rook to d1, he brought a rook to h1. And the whole point is that after
after the rook takes on e5 if you take back thank you for your rook in the corner that still would be a quality but let's just force the draw no risk taken here so we saw a draw in game one there was a lot of fight in that one despite only 35 moves the players really were trying to throw their punches yeah i really like this game i i think that they they were really um not only was it beautiful for us to watch but it was also really really well played i mean we can only really spot to one moment i think to criticize from each player maybe rook to be won by ding and rook d8 d8 by yan i'm not even sure if we can criticize that move because it was so complex but ding ding missed a little bit here he definitely had some chances to push for more but it wasn't easy this rook h5 i even if the computer says it's not the best move i still really liked it and i think sometimes the best engine move and the best practical move are different i think it's safe to say that we just saw one of the best games of this world championship match the second world champion emmanuel lasker said if you find a good move look for a better one and that might be great advice for classical with seeing the players play the best move one after the other with pavi predicting perhaps a 90 percent accuracy there this was a phenomenal game one and start to the playoffs the players are back in their rest area they will be back in the gladiators arena for game two and we will be back after this break with all the action from astana Hi everybody, International Master Danny Wrench here, Chess.com's Chief Chess Officer. We are here and excited to be collaborating and partnering with WorldQuant as an official partner of the Champions Tour in the year 2023. I'm now speaking with Chief Strategy Officer for WorldQuant, Natish Maini. The people have met us and now time for the big questions. Jumping right into the basics, tell everybody a little more about WorldQuant and what exactly is it that WorldQuant does? Thank you for having me, Danny. And you already introduced me. I am the Chief Strategy Officer at WorldQuant. WorldQuant is a global asset management organization. It was founded by Igor Tulchinsky in 2007. WorldQuant today has over 850 employees who are working towards designing investment strategies in multiple asset class across global markets. WorldQuant believes in empowering the ideas of the talent across the globe, and we have 23 offices in 13 countries today. Amazing, amazing stuff. So tell us now a little bit more about this project called WorldQuant Brain. So WorldQuant is built on the belief that talent is global, but opportunity is not. And we strive to take this opportunity to everyone around the globe. WorldQuant Brain has been designed as a tool which empowers us to take that opportunity to anyone. That's fantastic. Uh, seriously, that's amazing. I, I had no idea about that, learning about this along with our viewers and obviously as a as a website and a company with a mission to also connect global communities and increase the opportunity for chess that makes it even more of a natural partnership. Tell me a little bit more from WorldQuant's perspective why you guys run the IQC. So WorldQuant has this mission of democratizing quantitative finance. And International Quant Championship is one of the tools we have to spread the message about this opportunity which WorldQuant is offering to everyone to be a quant in the world of, in the quantitative space. And International Quant Championship empowers the individuals to utilize their ideas and show that they can do it and gives us an opportunity to take this message to them wherever they are. That's great. Now, you said the finals will be in person. Was I right that it'll be in the Bahamas? That sounds like a pretty great location. Can I come? Yeah, absolutely. That, absolutely. That, and I can? Okay. So I, I don't know that I'm qualified to be in the IQC, but uh, tell everybody a little more. So the finals are going to be in the Bahamas. What will, what will that be like for those who make it? Yes. So the finals, as you said, is planned to be in Bahamas for the IQC. So WorldQuant celebrated its 15th anniversary last year in 2022. To celebrate that occasion, we are getting the whole WorldQuant organization together in Bahamas this year. And we decided that we will organize the finals of IQC at that event. So this will give an opportunity to our finalists to meet the WorldQuant team in person. It will give them an opportunity to watch the culture and rigor of the organization. And we are very excited that everybody will be able to get together at that event in Bahamas. Well, this has been awesome, Nitish. Thank you so much. 
This is where I remind everybody it's their chance to get involved in the IQC, the International Quant Championship. You can use the command IQC. You can visit the World Quant Brain website. We encourage you to do so ASAP. Registration is open until May, so it's time to jump in. And uh, maybe you'll get to meet uh, the CSO and others in the Bahamas. Maybe I'll be there. I don't if I'm lucky. I, I don't know. But it, it sounds like a great time either way. And to Tish, uh, the Chess World and the Champions Chess Tour, thanks World Quant for their partnership. And uh, we're looking forward to the rest of the year together. Thank you, Danny. And good luck to the community for participating in IQC. WorldQuant is an official partner of the Chesscom broadcast of the FIDE World Championship. They are a global firm that builds complex mathematical models to identify market inefficiencies. Now, WorldQuant Brain is bringing together its international quant championship and the chess community to hunt down the next generation of quant finance specialists. Because nobody knows how to analyze a position better than a chess player, right? If you think you have what it takes, Register for the International Quant Championship. Head to go.chess.com slash IQC or use command IQC in chat for all the details. We are out of a mind-boggling game one. And this one is going down in history books as an absolute masterpiece for the ages. We saw an incredible attack, a counter-attack with both players really having to play accurately with just minutes and seconds on the clock. That was some fantastic chess that we witnessed in game one. Fabi, what do you reckon? How are the players feeling after this phenomenal game one? I think overall Ding missed a little bit more than Jan did there. Jan, I think, can be very happy that after a dangerous opening, he made a draw. He might feel like he had some chances there because it, at some point we saw it was very close. Ding had to make only moves. But objectively speaking, Ding found all the moves and uh, and the draw was a pretty natural result. But for, for Jan, yeah, draw with the black pieces in the first game, uh, avoiding some danger. And now he has the white pieces and he'll be looking to press. Definitely a good start. A great start for all of us here. Loved every moment of that game, Robert. We see Ding has arrived. He is meticulously adjusting his pieces on the board. Now, Jan, we've seen him play the 1e4, the King's Pawn opening, to the classical games. We expecting him to stick with that for the Rapid? Yeah, I think there's no reason for them to change their repertoire, their mindsets. Uh, they played a very interesting classical 14 games. And here in the Rapid, that game won. I don't think that means that anyone needs to change anything. That was a hard-fought, accurate game. Great play from these two. It's an exciting start for the fans. Probably a bit of a nerve-wracking one for the players. But it wasn't too scary. Neither player was under too much danger, even if it was a little bit worse for Jan uh, out of the opening. I yeah, I think that... Players. That for sure, it's it was a position which was dangerous for Ding at some point, uh, and dangerous for Jan, but never to the point where they thought I'm going to lose this game or anything. So uh, I don't think that they were super super scared or nervous at any point during that game. Although Jan probably realized when he's playing Rook H5 that he is bluffing a little bit with this. It's uh, the the good thing with that bluff is that it was a bluff with a very very clear concrete idea, and it worked out to perfection. Amazing resourcefulness there in that last game. We see in just a few moments, the game two will be in action. And Ding leaving his chair for just a second. So maybe we might have a couple of uh, minutes that might be delayed. Well, and he comes right back smiling. It's good to see a happy Ding. Always, you know, Ding has been uh, so great during the press conferences, le leaving his heart out for the world to see and to enjoy. And we see the handshakes and get involved. I know that in chat, the polls were up, but who you think is going to win? But look at this view, Yana Pomsi playing the Spanish. Yeah, this, no this Berlin, was, no anti-Berlin. This was to be expected. I think that Jan would continue with his E4. And we're going to see some anti martial I think it makes sense for Jan. I think he's going to play this a3 knight c3 line again because that's that's the line he knows best i think he's a real expert in this line oh he goes for a4 instead okay so a4 is an invitation to bishop d7 or b4 but bishop d7 is considered let's say the h3 is very unusual h3 okay so this is going to be a surprise for ding or maybe not castle short quickly <laughs> surprising not him, not one bit. He's playing this instantly, and so is Jan. So, 
Oh, bishop e3. We saw that idea played in an earlier game when the pawn was on c3, but still, that bishop develops out in the eval bar. It's not overly impressed, just saying, all right, both sides, you're equal here. So, Tanya, they're both blitzing it out. What do you make of this opening? It's again relatively a fresh position after bishop e3 hasn't been explored that much but some of the top players have in fact had this position including a certain Thomas Shavesky. So mm. there's definitely something to that. We know that Thomas Shavesky is uh, perhaps potentially part of Jan Napomnesi's team so there could be a lot of discussion there could be his idea now in that game after bishop e3 was played. Black did reply with knight to a5. And then the usual stuff with the c-pawn advancing. So we see Ding slowing down a little bit, but these are ideas that he's definitely familiar with. It is a thematic way to carry on in this position. Are we expecting him to go for this uh, plan with gaining space on the queen side? Wait, the funny thing is I, I feel like I had a very, very similar position a long time ago with the black pieces against Gadakamsky. I think instead of h3, he was playing this move bishop to e3. Which is it's so similar, and Ding goes for knight a5. White's plan was to play knight c3 at some moment. Whoa! And now he captures upon. Okay, so we're gonna. So this is kind of typical way to capture, but White can play knight c3, and try to slowly get that pawn. But bishop d2. So he's kicking this knight, or c5 is available. So that does give the d5 square. I guess that's Jan's major point. He wants this access to the d5 square that would be a strategic victory if black plays c5 pawns two squares apart leave the square in between vulnerable to the opponent and then this knight would gladly hop in maybe the bishop would go back to g5 to take this knight but bobby isn't there some pressure down the b file won't that be annoying for white to deal with yeah i see no issue with c5 i'm sure it's a fine move for black i had a very very similar position with the white pieces against uh daniel dubov and Basically, he took the pawn day four. At some point, we had this where I could have gained a lot of light squares, but the light squares are not the only factor. As you mentioned, the B pawn is a weakness. And I like c5 much more than knight to c6 because after knight c6, the, the knight is really in the way of stuff. And white can continue with, let's say, bishop to c4, followed by, uh, okay, well, it turns a4. And also, you can continue to put pressure on that pawn with knight to c3. Mm -hmm. And uh, knight to b7. It keep, at least it keeps contact with the a, the bishop on d7 no longer is blocked from the a4 pawn. Knight c6 he plays. Hey, I mean, it might be a fine move, but it looks unusual to me to... Because after bishop c4, you, you're you threatened to lose that pawn immediately. So how do you respond to that? I don't know. I mean, this knight... c5 felt so natural. And Tanya, you were the one calling the shots in one of our earlier games in this match with that rook b8, there was pressure on the b file. But do you think that bishop c4 and the a1 rook is opening too fast for black to make pressure down the b file work? Well, that's a lot of pressure to predict what is white's idea here, but it's clear what you're saying. Black will, after doubling up on the A file, make the most of this B file for the rook. We can quickly expect him to start targeting, the Ding to start targeting the B2 pawn. And I was just, while you guys were discussing these opening subtleties, I also want to just point out that that game by Tommy Shavesky was against a certain Eric Hansen, played online in a speed chess game. Now, in that game, the move order was different. It did not arrive exactly the way we saw this one, but the same position. But the change up, the switch up from what Eric did was in fact when Ding decided to take the pawn on a4. The move of choice in that game was the move b4. So keeping a more closed position on the queen side. And eventually we saw the game develop with the c pawn advance. But none of this happened in this one. Ding Liren again choosing the most direct way to play. He does capture on a4, knight c3 on the board. Uh, by Jan Pomnishi. So he wants to get to the A4 pawn, A4 pawn with his knight, also defending the B2 pawn. And now Ding has to be a little careful because there is a weakness on A6, and that's a lifelong weakness for this game. But you yeah, can Bobby, play. Uh, you um, didn't like this move, uh, knight C6, but are you still feeling the same way? That was going to be my question for you. I still don't like the move very much because I thought C5 is a more natural way of playing it and more combative, more difficult for white to to round up the a4 pawn. I mean, here here black can consider a3. The point is probably white mm. is obligated to take because you don't want to play b3. I mean, you don't want to block your bishop. Uh, yeah, this would be maybe not bad for white, but very, very silly to do. So b takes a3. And now we have a symmetrical structure. So at least black is not dealing with the issues, Tani, that you mentioned of the isolated a pawn being a weakness. But white has knight d5 ideas. And the knight on c6, 
Black spent a lot of time playing knight b8, c6, a5, c6. So that was a waste of time. And I still feel like white is the one with pressure here. Although it has to be said that in all these positions, you have pressure, but it's usually very, very manageable because black remains so solid. I mean, the, the marshal is one of the most solid openings. Even if it goes a little wrong, usually, usually it remains pretty relatively decent for black. We saw that in, in the previous match, Jan against Magnus. I mean, Jan was very often getting a bit of an advantage from the opening, but usually was neutralized uh, after some accurate play because just, you know, Black's position is quite healthy in its, you know, in its essence. Yeah, the shell is there for Black. I mean, it's a solid foundation. Uh, there are no targets immediately exploitable, but this bishop on a2, clearly better than the bishop on d7. This bishop on d2, clearly better than the bishop on e7. So that's what I would highlight for people wondering, why would white be better here? It's going to be even material, especially if black jettisons this pawn right back and the, then the pawn structure becomes symmetrical. Uh, the black bishops are worse than their white counterparts. And that is the problem, is that Ding is just a bit passive. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to lose the game. That doesn't mean that he might even face pressure, but it just is something that's a bit uncomfortable in the starting position. So Tanya, one of the ideas that I was thinking is, can I move this knight again? I know I've already moved it b8 to c6 to a5 to c6 but can i move it up to d4 this time i'm wondering if i can try to be greedy and keep this pawn a4 i like it and that's what we saw ding do in game one as well right he just snapped up the c5 pawn and then held on to it with dear life for as long as possible so a3 a really nice way to take care of the strategic points that you're mentioning but because of these dynamic factors like the strong bishop on a2 they can very well try to hold on to that a4 pawn uh, for a while at least the move knight d4 comes to mind. And if white was to trade on d4, yes, you do kind of leave your king side a bit weak. White's got these long-term plans of f4 and maybe a potential pawn stomp. Knight e2 will hit the d4 pawn. You'd have to make the move c5. And it's not a great extra pawn. But look at that b file. Black can also have trumps in the position. Black can start to create counterplay down the b file while white will aim for a king side pawn stomp, taking advantage of that bishop on a2. Knight d4, especially after Ding's last move, knight to c6. I won't be surprised to see that on the board. Bobby, your turn. Do you think knight d4 is available to black? And what would white do in response? Do we think that he would immediately take and play for the kingside pressure, like Tanya said? Or is there something to worry about on the queen side? I think I, I would probably choose knight d4 because other moves are a little bit passive. And with knight d4, you're giving your opponent a difficult... I mean, you're, you're giving him some difficult problems as well. So... To me, it looks most natural, the line that you guys suggested, with taking knight to e2, c5, and for example, move like knight to g3, black plays rook to b8, and white deals with the threat to that pawn with some move. Um, and then, it's not like... I want to keep the rook on the a-file, though, because after bishop e6, I want to be able to take, take on a4 in the end. And he just made a move, and it was rook b8 first. So, uh, yeah, that looked at least active for black. He decides to get, try to get immediate activity, but he does give back this pawn on a4. So knight takes a4, let's, it, it will be played because it's the only logical move. There's no other, I mean, why would you not take a pawn, which also defends the b2 pawn? So is his idea knight to d4 here? I would, I would guess it's still knight d4 with the idea that uh, if you take on d4, the knight on a4 becomes a little bit out of the game. Uh, but white can play bishop c4 here, and to be honest, the structure is just better for white. That's, that's the main thing. And if you're ever worried that your knight is out of the game, you can play b3 and get it back at some point. So right. not sure I'm really liking this rook to b8, but he definitely has some idea in mind after knight takes a4. And Tanya, rook b8, it's a move that Ding Li Ren played in a different game. It got him in trouble. I believe that was back in game nine. And so we see the rook on b8 once again. Oh, was that game nine? I'm trying to remember the that game. That was one of the draws, right? Together. Wasn't that... It was a draw, but Jan was better. I feel like it was game... Game 11, right before that craziness that we saw the next day. Is that, yeah, I could be I, very wrong there. We, we're struggling to remember all these games uh, seem to blend together. But Rook B8, that was an inaccuracy by Ding in another game. And here he goes Rook B8 again, this time for the open file. In the other game, it was just to protect the pawn. But you know this position, I feel like uh, with Ding Li Ren on the clock, Jan's not even in his chair right now. Uh, sorry, it's Jan's turn, but he's not in his chair. But Ding is concentrated. 
I can guarantee you, Jan might not be in his chat, but he's definitely in the resting area looking at this position and thinking about his next move because you don't have that kind of time to waste in the rapid uh, games. But this idea of rook b8 that you're pointing out and we see Jan arrive, I wonder if he's going to just blitz out his move right now. As you said, knight a4 makes so much sense. It combines the ideas that we were talking about, right? The b file, activity on the b file for black and that jump with a knight to c6 from c6 to the d4 square trying to control the center. You don't care about doubling up your pawns there. Jan, with his expression, slightly surprised as well with what Ding has chosen, Rook P8. He's wondering, what, why would he do that? Why just jump with the knight to D4 already? But that's the move of choice here, expecting Jan to go knight A4. And in that final position we saw, it's still a lot to play for. Black's bishop could perhaps come to B5. Well, we'll see. What is Ding, what is Jan Napomnishi's decision? What is the idea behind Rook P8? They say mistakes come in pairs. I guess inaccuracies often come in pairs as well. Knight takes a4 is played. So, Fabi, I mean, you have played the Spanish from both colors your whole life. This does look like a pretty dream situation for white. But something you said earlier that resonates with me, that even when white has these advantages, uh, it's like these small things that you can work on for a long period of time versus some kind of immediate checkmate. So how big of an advantage do you think white has here? Because the eval bar does say about half a pawn better for white. Like if you're playing, what do you think, practically speaking, the advantage is? I would be actually, unless I saw some problem, I would be relatively confident in my ability to win this position with white. Um, wow. Maybe it's because that this is like kind of what I'm pretty good at, which is uh, these types of positions with the white pieces, that is. With the black pieces, I, I don't think I'm very good at them, but <laughs> with the white pieces, I'm, I, I'm usually like uh, quite confident because it might not be much on the bar, but white's moves are easier. It's You want to play bishop c4, you want to play b3, you want to get, you just target the a pawn. I think, Tanya, you mentioned uh, this a pawn as a, as a really important factor in the position, and if the pawn was on the b file, black is completely fine, just equal. Uh, with the pawn in the a file, it's an open file that stares down on that pawn. It also allows the c4 square as an outpost, maybe not forever an outpost, because if black got c65, he would get control over that square, but c65 is not happening anytime soon, so I look at that square as a bit of an outpost. And then the question is, oh, like, what's black's follow up here and I also don't really understand why you play rook b8 and then after knight takes a4 you start to think about the position because uh, obviously what other move was there besides knight takes a4 and I think okay knight d4 is critical I mean what it, you can play knight b4 but after knight b4 I play uh, I can play bishop b3 or bishop c4 both moves seem but bishop c4 I'm a bit worried that maybe some moment d5 even there I'm not seeing exactly where d5 comes but I'm seeing like bishop c4, c6, some some sort of counterplay, which is, he needs counterplay at this moment. So knight b4, bishop to b3. The problem is you can't get d5. Yeah, he plays knight d4 set. Knight d4. So take and bishop c4 will, will probably be played, right? And Fabi, Let's... this reminds me of that game that Robert brought up earlier. Even in that game, Ding rushed with rook b8 and then went into a long think on every move after that. We see Jan Apamnishi in this game two of the Rapid has already broken away on the clock. He is up by almost six minutes, 23 minutes to Jan, about 17 minutes there to Ding Liren. So can Jan keep up building the pressure on the clock? He's got a very pleasant position out of the opening. The line that you wanted to check out, Fabi, we're expecting a trade on D4 because the knight on A4 is hanging right now. So after knight D4, black will pick up that knight. And then you move the bishop to C4. That's the idea, start targeting the weakness on A6. And I'm just wondering, does that give Ding Liren the opportunity to not only defend the pawn on a6, but offer a bishop trade to move bishop b5. I really want to get rid of this very strong, monstrous, light squared bishop that white has. I don't want to yeah. say for him, but I'm guessing Fabi's going to say you just play b3 and you just work around it and leave this pawn on a6. And we have seen the move bishop c4 played before the exchange of knights. So he doesn't uh, double black's pawns in the center. And he said, you can take me on f3. That just gets my queen out into the game over here. So bishop b5 is still an idea, uh, but this knight now will be able to go back to c3. So he says, you can keep your uh, pawn structure undamaged, but my knight gets more activity this way. Yeah, important little tactical point here. And, and Tanya, I think your, your idea of bishop b5 is actually really important for black to even play at this moment. Uh, but an important point is if black takes on f3, takes on a4, and takes on b2, it might look like black is winning pawn with another one attacked, but after bishop to b3, 
unfortunately for him, he, his rook gets trapped. It's a very typical uh, refutation of these sorts of pawn grabs that we sometimes see. And here, bishop c3 next move wins the rook. So I think we'll see bishop b5. I like that idea a lot. And I think that's also why Jan didn't rush with knight takes d4. Uh, because now white can consider not taking on d4. Can consider perhaps b3 is a bit better. And I think now bishop c4, bc4. The reason why it might be better is because that knight on a4 has a, a path to uh, to a much better square, right? With, with black's pawn on d4, that knight would be restricted. It could eventually escape to b2, but even on b2, it remains a bad piece. And then, so white would have to take a lot of time or play c3. And c3 has its own downsides. But here, if I play knight c3, I just target that a pawn. He plays a completely we didn't different see bishop move. B5. Not bishop b5, wow. which just felt so natural. But he puts the pawn on c6. He's offering the a6 pawn. And I am uh, trying to understand, are there some tactics if white gets greedy here? Or is black just looking for a central break with d5? He's playing for d5. He heard Fabiano Caruana speak, saying, I desperately want some counterplay. I don't want to sit passively and have to defend my weak a6 pawn. Have it. Take this pawn, and he will throw in d5. Not immediately, because there are some pawns that are hanging in the position. But if we just analyze this for a second here, that this is a hanging pawn. It can successfully be captured. But I think you can play rook a8. Do not bring your bishop into b7. It will not get out of there. You'll lose your piece. So you drop back. d5 hits you a la tempo. And if you start taking on d5, oh, watch out. Everywhere, you've given black the center. And I like the way that Ding is playing dynamically. I think that this is the way that often top grandmasters survive games when they're under pressure. They say, you know what? I'm not going to be under pressure and you're just going to play freely. I am going to cause problems that you will have to deal with as well. So have that extra pawn. That's not the main storyline of this game. I am going to control the center. I see a very interesting idea for white. I don't want to take that pawn. And I want to deal with the threat of d5. So I want to take on d4, e d4, and bishop to f4. And now d5 will lose the rook. And let's say the rook moves somewhere. Although I'm not even sure where it could move to, which is a safe square. But just to illustrate the idea, after rook to a8, um, which renews the threat of d5, I want to play e5 here. And the point is if d takes e5, bishop e5, now c4 is a real outpost. Now the bishop is on that diagonal forever. Uh, you cannot kick it away with d5. You can't restrict it with d5. And the positional advantage here, I think, is borderline overwhelming. Like, this is already, I think, territory where we're talking about Jan just winning this game. And probably maybe even without big difficulty. Because um, it's... The valuation might be similar to the previous game where Black was playing rook h5. Maybe it was something similar to that. But there's a big difference between uh, a better position, which is based on some very concrete details and a better position which is just based on you playing natural moves and here why just plays natural moves it's one of those positions that plays itself you uh, it might at some point become difficult to convert this but uh that might already be when it's like you know an objectively winning position this this i think that most top players win with the white pieces so taking bishop of four i really like that for white I, I really don't see how black responds to the threat of e5 and it's it could become very difficult for black maybe rook to b4 i How think we need one? to <laughs> i'm serious Actually, i like i like that no no it's funny but i like the move but after <laughs> b after b3 how are you dealing with because b3 renews the threat oh i was are hoping look at I'm, another I'm rook h5 I'm, i was no. thinking about it but i was being instructed first of all that this knight is trapped so you can't take the rook it's not giving away material but i was going to say w will we get another rook h5 black should I mean, this is not a matter of, uh, you know, if it's bad or not. It's a matter of, okay, uh, my position got bad. So now we're threatening d5. We're threatening, I don't know, we're threatening g5, but g g5, g4. I mean, I'm looking at it, at least. At least it's <laughs> counterplay. Um, but d5, if you get d5 in, you have chances. I, I mean, it might still be bad, but the bishop at least would be relegated to somewhere lousy, like a6 squared, obviously lousy square even if the bishop doesn't get trapped there so rook to b5 but i was also thinking rook to b4 is that a move after bishop might be seeing this play out i just want to let you guys know that knight d4 is on the board so the action that you're looking at might happen if yana pamnashi does make the move bishop f4 once the knight three captured rook b5 like, you know robert who... i sometimes feel like we're commentating with petrosian and not robert hess 
with all your exchange <laughs> sacrifices. So I've always loved the exchange sacrifice. Always. And Bishop F4 is played. So is that Yana Pomsi sitting there or is it Fabiano Caruana? Who knows because they're playing the same ideas. But I love a good exchange sacrifice. You'll hear me do that. Uh, even when it's bad, I'll suggest it because you have to look out for it. I think sometimes we're a bit too materialistic. We think, oh, that rook I've been told is worth five points. A bishop and knight is worth a little over three, let's say. And that oh, means Robert. I shouldn't give up my rook. What's up? You have a line sorry to you. sorry to interrupt, but B, I, I love your rook b5 idea, and I love it even more because I saw the response to b3. Okay, rook let's b5 do it. b3. We insist we play d5. Okay, we'll show this rook b5 b3 d5. And if you take the rook, or let's a take b5. the pawn first. Let's take the pawn. Yeah, but then knight takes d5. Now you can't take the rook. That was that was oh. the idea. Oh, oh. And now now you might because now the bishop on c4 is no longer like it's restricted now. If you give it up, then you gave up a. An important part of your position uh-huh but maybe yeah bishop takes b5 is critical so i was excited momentarily because a b5 knight b2 i thought that we would win the e4 pawn uh now i see it's not so easy and knight takes e4 queen d4 it's just not that's sad I, I i was getting excited for a moment but it doesn't seem to be working out all so i'm wait, hearing to... is is that you ruined my exchange sacrifice that's that's what's going in this year wait let's let's continue okay knight b2 <laughs> bishop b4 i, I know that you know, I I messed up, but I'm still ca I'm still saying that knight on b2 is a bad piece. I, so I think what you're really saying, in addition to that, is that for a rapid game of chess, it is very difficult to play with bad pieces. And look at the activity that Black suddenly has. This bishop on b4 can come to c3. There's no rook e1. That's going to be an open file, and I want to put up my rook on e8. So white is up material, but Black does have some of the benefits in this position. I actually could see... Not this specific line. I really doubt it's going to happen. But I can see something like this occurring. And then Ding saying, I don't want to sit passively. I don't want to defend. And he's going to throw caution to the wind and play an exchange-like sacrifice with Rook to... I, I love Rook B5. I'm hoping we see it. And even if we get Rook H5... Come on, Ding. You're too strong. <laughs> rook B5. It would be so committal to put that Rook on B5 and try and swing it to H5. But it was an amazing idea. Not played. He does offer a trade on E6. And I'm just trying to understand this move a little bit because now white does have the option to actually pick up that pawn on a6. Bishop takes a6. And if black was to swing with the rook to a8, you can fall back with the bishop to c4, trade on c4, and the d4 pawn is hanging. It looks like the kind of moment where, in fact, Jan Napomnishi can be up an extra pawn. Bishop e6, where is the compensation for this a6 pawn? Now you don't have d5 ideas. Again, that rook on b8 under fire with that bishop on f4. I'm, I'm shocked if he takes that pawn. It might be the best move. I'm just shocked if he does it. Because? because uh, I mean, it feels like the bishop is just bad there. And if forced to retreat, what black will somehow pick up the e4 pawn. And maybe it's not the case. But intuitively, I, I, would, I wasn't even looking at that move. I mean... I know that it's like it's a free pawn and everything, but I really was not looking at that option as even like a legal move. Uh, but that's probably just because I. Um... Abby, that hurt. You make me feel like such no, a bad player right no, now. I was, that I was going really to really hurt because no, no, I feel no. like that would be the first move that I would go for. No, I was going to say that it's actually a good move. So this is like uh, this is a case where I should be considering the move, and and I'm actually sure that that you're correct that Bishop A6 is the critical move, but something in me just doesn't want to play it. Well, I think and... I, it's a stylistic choice, right? Some people want extra pawns, which is fine. Other people want the positional uh, triumphs in the position, right? If you take, take, I'm guessing, Fabi, you still want your E5 idea? Is that what you're going for? Yeah, yeah I, think I do. And he, he is with Fabi. Super Grandmaster Chess doesn't consider Bishop A6, plays the move Rook E1. You were saying it's a stylistic choice. Robert, maybe it's a strength choice. Bishop A6 just intuitively feels like a move that you don't want to make with that Bishop on A6 and having to double up the pawns in case there's a trade, a future trade on C4. And first, Jan decides to just defend the E4 pawn. But this does allow the trade anyway. This does allow Black to destroy White's central pawn structure. I think he just doesn't care because he's looking at that pawn in the long term. So he's looking at something like bishop c4, d c4, c5. Uh, yeah, you kept all your pawns, but I played b3. The knight on d3, uh, yeah, I think we're already talking about maybe black white is just winning this position. Because let's say you play some move. Um, I don't know, Robert, what, uh, what, <laughs> what kind of move here would you make? I, 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 don't just see, I don't see it. Anyway, knight b2, d3 is coming, and then a6. Uh, whether you keep it or not is a long-term weakness and also white can play e5 at, a, at the right moment and uh the knight on d3 is an outpost 
C5 is weak long term. I think White wins this wins this position very uh, very often. So I don't think Ding will want to take on C4. No, I agree. But if you don't take on C4. Uh, you can't play d5 very easily. This rook still is hanging on b8. This rook b5 idea, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's still there. He plays a5. I think that is a smart play at this point. He does not want to worry about the a6 pawn forever because it wasn't just about being in the bishop's sight. That once this knight played b3, knight b2, now at least the queen defends his pawn a5. So you have given it some defense. That's a good thing. And at some point, d5 may be in the equation. I know this rook is hanging over here, uh, but this rook is likely to move, and then you have to look out for d5. Or we could see take take and e5 at the right moment, but black will get play of his own. That's the good news for Ding. If the f-file opens up, there will be some activity for Ding, and he's not just going to have to sit and wonder, what am I doing here? What about a preparatory move? So you're not afraid of bishop c4 at the moment. d5 is, for the moment, not a threat. Uh, because a bishop takes b8, so maybe bishop to h2. And my point is, I want to take on e6 and e5, but I don't want the bishop to be uh, potentially attacked with knight to d5. So I play bishop h2, and uh, my idea is to take an e5. Can I just tell you how much of a super grim ass you are? Let's ask the chat. Be honest with us. How many of you were thinking about this calm, retreating move, bishop h2? And I want your full honesty, because all of you found it, of course. But Fabi finds this great idea saying that, let's say I make a waiting move like h6, then I take, an h6 may be particularly uh, troublesome, and I play e5. I'm trying to crack open the position, and I didn't want my bishop in that rook's sight. So if you take... I could take with a rook and hit e6 and put more pressure on a5. I could take with a bishop to attack d4 and attack the b8 rook. But I'm not giving black that much-needed activity. I'm not giving a sort of tempo shot. So, yeah, great idea by Fabi and by all of chat. I know you saw bishop h2 as well. But it, it, <laughs> isn't it kind of amazing in that final position that you were showing that black wasn't doing too terribly? Maybe it's a lot about piece activity, and black's pieces are getting active in those positions. The structure is a mess. I mean... You don't have to, um, you don't have to be on the Panishi to see uh, that black structure is is pretty lousy, but maybe the piece activity is. And he plays queen to f three. I was gonna say maybe the piece activity is compensating for the structural problems in that position, so queen f three also makes sense. He's preparing e five in some cases. I like this approach. Maybe. Uh, he also wants to say that knight d7 could be met by queen to g3, but then bishop h4. So what's wrong with knight d7 here? I want to make that move because I want to potentially use the e5 square. For example, bishop c4, knight e5 ideas, things like that. Not sure if that's really what black wants, but knight d7 feels like a harmonious move here. So how are you responding to that move? Uh, well, e5 is no longer available, and it looks like ding. You know, he's on the clock here, but this looks like a very good try because e5 doesn't have the same force to it. And you see the evaluation bar drops. Your d5 is disastrous for white. Your, your bishop gets in trouble, exactly. So rook b7 played instead. That's a very ding move, and I mean that in a complimentary way. Tanya, Fabi plays bishop h2. I would never have thought about that. Rook b7 also wasn't thinking in that direction, but he is threatening d5, and he's taking advantage of the fact that the queen stepped in the line of this rook. Rook b7, another one of those prophylactic moves, similar to the concept of just moving the back from h2, right? Just clear up and make sure that your pieces are safe. And Ding is returning the favor with keeping his own pieces safe. He wants to get d5 in. The rook on b8 was a target. He moves one square up and says d5 is in the air. But will he have enough time? Because with that queen on f3, I also see a tender spot on c6. And maybe this could be the moment for Jan Apamnishi to actually strike in the center. The move that we've been looking at in different lines with different ideas, e5. It's the first move that I think we should deep dive into. You hit not only the knight, not only the pawn on d6, but a potential picking up of an extra pawn on c6. And as we dive into that, I just want to give YouTube chat a quick shout out because you were honest. Uh, most of you said you did not see Bishop H2 that Fabiano was pointing out in that previous uh, variation. So thank you for your honesty. We appreciate it. And... Hope you're enjoying the show. But back to uh, your regularly scheduled programming, Fabi. So we're talking about E5 here. Is now the time? Yeah, I, I like this yes, move, Tanya. And it he is? plays it. Everyone likes this move. It's, uh, <laughs> it just looks good. And I think knight T5 is the response for black. I think you should play knight D5 here. Because the knight on D5 is an excellent piece. It's compensating for a lot of black's potential problems by, first of all, restricting the bishop on C4, attacking the bishop on F4, and also maybe knight to B4 someday. And 
White's only issue is the knight on a4 is a misplaced piece. If the knight was anywhere else, basically white just is dominating this position. Even, even here, maybe the structural problems are too big to ignore after, let's say, take everything on d6. And yeah, we see that black structure is damaged because the a5 pawn is not on the b file. And for sure white's better here, but the question is how much better? I think in an endgame, this could be really unpleasant, but as long as white can't get knight c5 in, maybe... I'm going to show that what you're saying, just because I think it's very instructive for everyone to understand why in endgame you get access to the c5 square, but we do have a move, and the move was knight d5. So this is relevant stuff, what we were just looking at, that if we see these trades, well, Fabi was saying white wants to trade queens, get that queen d5, black will not want to trade queens. So uh, that line that we were just looking at, just one more time, that in the event of a queen trade, white takes the upper hand. Knight c5 is very, very dangerous. a5 is a weakness, and white just is in control. The knight can't really move. The bishop's here. The knight can't move, but also because the pawn's under attack, white has all the fun. So, okay, knight d5. If we get all these trades, Tanya, do we think that Jan or Ding will feel more comfortable? We know that Jan has the advantage. Both players are aware of that, but whose style does that resulting position uh, better suit? And that's the big question, right? Because he does have the option to go for these trades and get this simplified position. Or once again, Jan could just keep the tension with falling back with the bishop. And it will be a very difficult position in the center for both these players to play at. And the clock has got something to say on that as well. Because Jan currently is up two minutes. He does return on the board. And Robert, you hit the nail on the head that it is stylistic. And Jan does go for the option of actually trading. I was thinking he would end up keeping the tension, but we saw him do that with a queen trade in the last game. And now we see him repeat that. He's going for these more simplified positions in the rapid. Yeah, but Fabi, you've said this before, that instead of simplifying, sometimes you actually give yourself the best chances, even if objectively you've made the best move by simplifying, sometimes by a practical perspective, that if you keep more peace on the board, you keep the tension when your opponent's moves are more difficult to find. Now the next few moves for Ding, they actually do feel easier because his pieces can breathe. Yeah, well, I think that this bishop g3 was probably an excellent option. But it might have been based on some calculations after knight to b4 because black had that counterplay with the threat of knight takes c2. And it's understandable, I think, that Jan didn't want to go there. I mean, I was trying to like consider that position a bit. Uh, but uh, since we've had so much happen on the board... So the question is, okay, he played queen e4. And can black play knight to b4 or is that too much? You allow the destruction of your pawn structure, but do you get some counterplay in return? It's possible, although I would be very hesitant to make that move. And There's also knight to f6 think, here. But, but let's look at this, because knight before is the first one that came to my mind as well. And the point that Fabi's making is you are sacrificing a pawn, or so it seems, on e6. You take back, and let's maybe just trade the queen just to force them no, off. But, but the end game is terrible after rookie two. That's, I, I was yeah. going to say that, but I was going to say, instead of taking a pawn that looks like it's hanging, you stop. You defend your hanging pawn, and this knight comes to c5, and every pawn in black's position is very weak. So, yes, Fabi, I, I learned from you all the time. That's why I was able to stop on e2. I, I wasn't impulsive. Yeah, I mean, rookie two, you, rookie two is an excellent move, and we see with black's pawn structure there, you need to keep the queens on. For example, after rookie two now, rook to f4 might come, and we see that white's queen becomes a little bit of a liability. Queen takes e6, queen e6, rookie 6, and now... Yeah, I'd rather have the rook on f8 in this position, but at least I'm grabbing the c2 pawn, coming back to b4, attacking d3. It's still a tough fight. White's knight can at some point go into c5, which is a very nice uh, place for that knight too, but black is getting counterplay. So Ding is thinking about two moves after queen e4. One is knight b4 that we looked at a little bit. One is knight to f6. Uh, but knight f6, I think he'll probably reject it because after queen e5, we enter some endgames that are not looking super fun for black yeah so probably i mean there's also knight to f4 here but i don't know if knight to f4 does anything in particular and i think what you're getting at okay. is that well, he plays knight on the board so, hey, you saved the best for last wow. you say ding drew here but tanya as we look at this and fabi's point that at some moment queen e5 is offering the queen trade it looks like yana pomshi will be playing for two results and that's the thing, right? With this move, knight f4, and I think, Fabi, the point you were also perhaps going to make was that after queen e5, it just forces black to trade on e5. Your queen's attacked. You can't really sidestep the trade because the knight on f4 will be hanging. 
and you enter this end game where you don't have the most ideal pawn structure. If after queen e5, we can imagine, visualize a queen trade, the rook lands on e5, you're immediately hitting on that pawn on a5, e6 could be a weakness, and if white was to trade bishop c4, d takes c4, the d4 pawn could be hanging in many cases. So Jan has got a very pleasant choice here, simply to offer the trade in the center. And I'm just wondering, the kind of chess that we've seen by Jan today, right? In game one, he did go for rook d2, trading off the queens, going into that end game. We saw that end into a draw. He could have kept the tension on the board. Today as well, well, he, not today, but second game as well, he does pick up on d6, goes for these trades, and we might be seeing another end game. Sabi, what are the chances of Jan having a very clear strategy that if the opportunity presents itself, he's happy to go into blitz? I think that he he doesn't mind it for sure, but he also, um, of course, will try to take his chances. And I think that he went for this line only because he saw something that he likes after the move d3, which is for sure Black's idea in this position is to play d3, and I think probably right now. And I was kind of calculating this d3, g3 stuff. I'm not sure what's going on exactly. Uh, g3 wow. gives Black a lot of options, but maybe not a lot of good options. Because let's say d3, g3, where are you showing that knight? I have to show this because this, you know, this one of these moves, g3, you're attacking the knight, but giving up a pass pawn. And if you go 92 check, your whole point is after king f1. Well, unfortunately, the d pawn, how is this? I thought this was going to be a bad decision. Or, but... or king g2, maybe, because you, you can't take anyway. Right. And so the king is just like a little bit safer on g2. But I think knight g6 is critical. You can kind of sack a piece, but I'm not sure if it will. And now rook takes a5. So dc2 and rook c1. That, that was the, the idea, that you get it back pretty quickly. But black might actually get a lot of activity. Um, because that knight, if it gets active, it could get really, really active. Like if it could get to e5, then maybe the activity would be enough to draw. But you're so not sure that this is that you'll be able to do this. Because knight endgames, pawn down, very often... Are much worse than just rook end games, right? The, the presence of knights uh, can make the defensive task much more difficult or impossible. And I'm not seeing black's good move here. Like I see, the bar is not saying it's a disaster for black. I just don't see why it wouldn't be a disaster. Could it be f6 just to get that knight in, like you were saying, and just bring the knight around here? Yeah, rook c2, knight e5. But I didn't really believe in this. Like let's say I play uh, knight to c5 here. I, I just don't see it. Like the knight on c5 is so powerful. Yeah, but the thing is, Black at some point will be able to go after the pawn. And we did just see the capture, so if we go back to the live position, d64 is played it. Now that I said that, go after the pawn. Can Black start with rook b4? Because I want to induce b3. In many other positions, I did not. But then I'll play d3, and I'll crack your pawn structure. I think excellent, excellent idea to include rook b4 to make the b pawn weaker. Because on b2, it's defended. On b3, and d3, it potentially won't be defended anymore. So rook d4, rook b4, it also allows, I mean, it allows a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, a lot of stuff which is a bit better for white, but nothing which is like clearly, clearly better. I mean, even like rook b4, rook takes a5, rook takes c4, rook c5 is a pleasant endgame. But then you're feeling like you probably hold that, right? So also rook b4, g3, white can, I think, consider. But then you have to consider knight takes h3 too, so... I like Rook before. I think that this is a move you should go for. D3 didn't look like the best option. Yeah. Go for Rook before. And Tanya, I mean, we're talking about all these moves, these variations, but Ding now, he's about seven minutes remaining on the clock. Jan is 12. That time advantage for Jan, that could play a big role in an end game that remains tricky. He's been up on the clock throughout the game, right from the opening. So it's been a quite a bit of a success this game so far for Yan. And Ding's the one who's dealing with weaknesses. He can't just sit tight. He can't just go on the passive defense and expect to hold on this kind of an end game. He has to go for these ideas of hitting on the C4 pawn with a move like Rook B4 or an immediate move like D3. I don't think it's possible to just start defending the A5 pawn with passive moves like Rook A8. And indeed, Ding does provoke the move B3 because once that happens, D3, that blow that you're talking about will be so much more powerful because the B3 pawn will be weak. Rook B4 on the board, Rook C4 ideas. And I'm just wondering, can White throw in G3 here? Fabi, you mentioned that H3 pawn is weak, but after knight H3, king G2, I'm hitting the knight. 
Not so many squares is f6, knight, g5, the escape route. But that doesn't that create a lot of weaknesses on the king's side? Yeah, this was my idea, but it's white can start to capture some queen side pawns, which might be more relevant than the h pawn. So it's it's a good question. I mean, g3 looks like a very critical move. And then black can decide where to put the knight. It can go to e6. That's kind of the most natural square, I think, for it to go to. It can go to h3, but yeah, that, that comes with a lot of risks, as you said. And g6 I don't like because then rook just rook to c5. And I think white gains control having stopped the d3 threat. And will slowly be able to make progress. He's reaching out for the rook. Wow. Rook c5 played. And d3, d3. immediately blitzed out. By the wow. speed. Did you see the speed? Insane. He knows he has this. And that's the thing about Dingley Ren right now is if the pawn takes, it's all forcing. Now your rook's under attack. And if you take on c6, I take on b2. We start trading pawns. We liquidate. I mean, black does need to be a bit careful because this rook on a1 is staring at this a5 pawn. Just to quickly show a forcing variation that could happen if black goes for it, that if the pawn takes, knight takes, rook c6, knight b2, knight b2, rook b2, rook takes a5, you see the advantage go up for white because you're a healthy pawn ahead. There is no back rank checkmate as the king has the h2 square. So I don't think in the event of cd, knight d, rook c6, that black is going to take on b2 because there isn't a rush here. Maybe you can make luft for your king. Perhaps you can well, 90, make 95. an open final. 95 oh. is a nice move. Wow, I didn't see the backward knight moves. Hardest to find in chess, so they say. And white will have a sm small edge here, but nothing dramatic. I mean, uh, black is pretty much just holding on here. So after d3, Jan has to find something else. That just leads to what looks to me to be quite close to a draw. You, can, you can't play g3 because then knight to e6 comes. and that's. Well, um, I can just take on c2 and your knight's hanging, right? The oh, that as well. That as well. But yeah. although, I mean, 96 is already playing for an advantage, so that's why maybe <laughs> maybe you can start to get a bit ambitious there. But yeah, definitely. Um... I want to show a crazy line. So, I mean, I don't know if it works or not, but check this out. After G3, what if black actually, DC2, great idea, but what if you actually start with Rook A4, Rook A4, I push my pawn to D2, and I don't see a way for you to defend it because you can fall back with your Rook to A1, but I might have Knight E2 check and Knight C1 stopping that. And then I queen oh. with my D pawn. That is yeah, beautiful. The knight blocks the rook and you get a queen. All sorts of tactics still available in end games. I think sometimes wow. uh, people they you know think oh end games they're boring. What's that manual they talk about? It's like seven thousand pages. You should read Devretsky's uh, end game manual if you're an improving player. Or well, there are many online courses that you can do. Uh, but still, these end games still have rich tactics available. And so even Fabi's. Knight takes, and then retreating your knight. That's a hard move to process, especially when you can take pawns. I know I just made that mistake. I'm willing to admit it in front of all of you. So uh, there's a lot that's still happening in this end game with many pawns under attack. But if you are Yonda Pomsi, I think now's the time to just admit that the game should be a draw. Don't do anything funny. You know, no G3s here, none of that stuff. Just liquidate, make this draw. It'd be one to one. You both get one more white game remaining, and that's okay for the players. But what? Great defense from Dingley Ren. He's always playing these accurate moves. I think Rook C5 was, yeah, it wasn't a great decision by Jan because D3, um, I mean, yeah, it's it's a good move, but it's also kind of comes to mind as like the only move. So, I, yeah, he's, he's going for it. I don't know what exactly Jan... <clears throat> Maybe he thought he can play Rook C6 here and thought he's getting a Rook end game with the C pawn with the two Rooks, which is quite nice to play in Rapid. And he missed Knight E5. That's possible. Right. But I think Rook C5 was definitely a careless decision from Jan. Great news for Dingley Ren. Now level as well. And, and that would explain a lot, actually, because, Robert, as you pointed out, knight backward moves are indeed the hardest to spot. And that also from far away, Rook C6 would look like a stable advantage with an extra pawn. But knight E5, does that completely neutralize uh, White's edge if Jan was to take on C6? Yeah, that leaves him with no winning chances whatsoever. And other moves looked interesting for Black. I, I mentioned just critting Luft, so there's no back rank checkmates. Rook to E8 just to activate your Rook, because it feels like White's pawns aren't the healthiest. They will be under threat. So uh, 95 just says, why am I going to be down a pawn? I don't have to come up with compensation. I will restore material equality, and the game will result in a draw. And you look at Yonda Pomashi, he knows that this game is about to peter out. Great find by Dingley Ren. He's been making these moves quickly. I think that this match deserves to be level, and it's super exciting because if they draw, and it's not guaranteed just yet, we'll be at one-to-one, -one, only two games remaining in the rapid portion of this World Championship match.
Yeah, so far it's looking it's on the like a balanced. So Fabi, you've been calling out the whole game. <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> no, it's uh, yeah, you're absolutely right that uh, that knight e5 is kind of securing the equality, and I'm sure Jan will be disappointed with this because he really had a nice opening. He works e7. He's playing. Okay, I think we can play knight c4. Why not? We can also play rook c4, but I think knight c4 is a bit more direct. Yeah, I don't think I would be playing rook c4 because th this rook is very active. And uh, yeah, knight knight takes c4 just keeps this b2 pawn threatened. And we may just see that move happen next. And b2 is lost, but so is a5. And that's clearly a draw. Yeah, once knight takes b2 happens, the trade on b2 followed by rook takes a5 this game will end. I mean, Jan can invite that by playing something like g3 or some neutral move. Uh you can also play b3, knight d2, knight c5 to force it. Starts the knight c5. He gets in his knight to c5. He starts with knight c5. So he's still keeping all the pieces on the board. If black was to pick up the b2 pawn with the knight, a5 hangs. If you pick up the b2 pawn with the rook, I think you end up mm -hmm. losing that knight on c4 with the knight jump on d7. That would be a bad idea. Rook no, I think b2, he'll, I think he'll play it. Oh, oh, there's a, oh, the, the back rank is, for some reason I thought, you know, when you said h6, I, I like started visualizing the position with the pawn in h6. Fabi, this the is second time rank. today, you've blundered a back rank checkmate. It's okay. Yeah. We'll work on those later, buddy. We'll work on checkmates on the back rank when you don't Wait, what have was, pawns. What was the first time? When there was knight takes d4 and the queen, the rook was hanging on e8. I blundered a one. back rank. Yeah, in the first game with queen a4 and then knight to d4, and you said knight takes d4. Oh, oh, I forgot that moment. You're right. See, okay. see you've this already is... forgotten. We need to work on this. We need to work yeah. on this. But uh... <laughs> Avi needs his puzzle rush fix. While well, knight b2, Ding is finding all the tactics. Knight d7 on the board now. No loose pieces drop off here because there is no knight on c4. But it's always so important to keep every piece defended. And knight d7 played. The rook will move. And then again, the, uh, these ideas, if rook goes to a8, you can actually pick up a pawn regardless because of the back rank threats and black will be unable to recapture the rook on a5. So despite these active moves by Yan, it does look a little scary, Fabi, the knight on d7, the rook on c7, but with such few pawns left, can white create anything on the seventh rank? I, I think that's really unlikely. The knight can come back from, black's knight can come back to d6, for example and it will cover any sort of threats. And why would need quite a few moves to even create the threat to f7? So yeah, he can play knight to c4 here pretty safely. I'll try not to blunder any more back rank checkmates. <laughs> you know, you can always always deal with that issue with playing h6 at some moment, but I like knight c4 to, to just get the knight back as quickly as possible. Because h6, I'm thinking maybe knight, you know, maybe knight e5 is inducing some weaknesses. We see Ding the Ren, he goes knight d3. So he's actually creating a threat of his own. Rook b1 check, followed by knight takes f2. So Ding says, I am not just going to defend by, uh, you know, bring my knight backwards. I'm going to defend actively by creating a threat of my own. And, well, I think that these players, especially Jan at this point, I think Jan now should make a draw when it becomes available because his knight, even though it looks active, it's kind of strangely placed. And this knight on d3 is hitting this pawn f2, and there could be some issues if Jan's not careful. Yeah, it's it's a good moment to shut it down. Um, but it's hard to imagine either side ever taking... Because even if you take that f2 pawn, probably white will get a lot of counterplay as well. But yeah, you might as well just shut the game down. I mean, I, don't I wonder if that... might Jan would want to defend down the f2 pawn. Can he start being a little active with the move rook f5? You defend the f2, you're also eyeing the f7 pawn. And then the shutdown that you were talking about, the knight jumps back to c5. Once the knights are off the board, you know that is heading towards a draw. Rook f5 looks like an option. And Jan reaching out to make his move. I see him re reaching out for the rook. We might see it on the board. Oh, rook g5. Wow. <laughs> He's cheeky. Nasty He's little trick up... there. Yeah, he's setting up a pinned pawn on g7 so he can fork the king on g8 and the rook on e8. I think Ding Liren, he'll spot that, uh, but it is you know something that's threatened. 
and it's just a funny thing don't just go rook b1 check and take this pawn you will lose material uh, so this rook at some point can try to slide to f4 that seems to put pressure on f2 and cover the f6 square uh, but yeah this is an interesting try by Jan because knight f6 check is not the easiest move to me like there aren't that many options available to black i like rook f4 I mean, you can you play rook f4 and h6 next move. I also think king h8 should be completely fine. Uh, you don't really want to play king h8, but I don't see the issue with it. Doesn't blunder a, a pawn? So just to show a very quick variation, king h8, do I have knight e5? Because knight takes take, e5. Rook takes. Rook takes e5. I mean, yeah. Don't do it. Got... Don't do it, Fabi. Don't take it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you got three against two, but uh, yeah. rook, rook four to b8 and... Hey. He plays but yeah, there's no rook f4. Rook f4, yeah. Looks, looks like an easy option. f3, h6, rook d5. I mean, it's it's equal with probably any move. But, yeah, I guess Jan is not risking anything by continuing to play this on a bit. Yeah, and, well, I guess that it's kind of a question, Tanya. Uh, for these two players... You've asked, like, who wants to get to Blitz? Do you think at this point they're starting to think about that? I know there are two games of Rapid remaining. Their focus has to be there first. But in the back of their minds, I mean, Blitz is getting closer. To me, it really does feel like that Ian would be the happier one to get to Blitz. And I'm not just saying that based on the graphic where we saw where in the head-to-head -head we saw Ian he leads with a big margin. We know a majority of those games have indeed been playing, have been played online. But simply... Ding Laren has been so inactive in Blitz. He hasn't played for over a year, which is why we don't find him in the FIDE ratings, because he hasn't played a Blitz event. And I feel that Yan today comes into this match knowing that comparing Rapid and Blitz, his best chance today in Rapid, it's extremely close. But Blitz, I would give Yan to be a favorite by at least 60-40. And he's happy to draw as many games as it takes to get there. We see F3, the move that you suggested, Fabi, on the board. So keeping all the pawns defended, jumps back with knight before. It's just a matter of moves. The draw will definitely be the outcome. But I still want to make that point that with the kind of play that we've been seeing by Jan, how quickly he's been taking the decision to simplify in certain positions, I think Jan's happy to get this to blitz. And Ding knows that, well, this is my feeling, that Ding knows that his best chance should be to try to wrap the match up in rapid. I'm not. I'm not sure that that's how Ding is feeling. Um, like also, I, I'm not even sure he remembers his score in Blitz against Jan. Definitely so, doesn't. Doesn't care about it. Yeah, in that case, I don't see why he would feel like an underdog at all. The reason I say that, Fabi, is because he's just not been active in Blitz. He hasn't played for such a long time. Yeah, that that could be. I I mean, no, for for sure, that's it's better to to maintain that activity, but. Uh, he also hadn't been active in classical chess for a long time, right? I mean, he during like the 2020 period, he played uh, half of the candidates, and that was it. Then in 2021, he played the other half of the candidates. And then in 2022, he played the candidates. And those were, um, the, those were all his events for the years 2020, 2021, and 2022. And in 2023, he played Vikings A. So he's played basically like three events in the last four years. Um, besides online events, of course. Online, there's been a lot of chess, right? But but it doesn't seem like he uh, he minds the fact that, yeah, he's he's not playing as much as other guys, but for sure he's practicing in terms of training, games, uh, you know, general chess preparation, and so on. And I'm sure that he's had plenty, during his range, training sessions, plenty of opportunity to play Blitz with, with the guys he's been sparring with, and we know... One of those guys is Richard Report, and obviously he's a top player, so he's very good, a very good training partner. But there's probably also been other opportunities to to play practice, uh, training games. Obviously, this was uh, a potential outcome of the match that they get to the rapid, uh, that they potentially even get to the blitz. So for sure, it's been on their mind. Hmm. But Jan is still trying here. He's not. It's not a draw yet. He's not shutting this down. He is uh, following that knight on b4 and not so many squares for that knight with the rook on d6 and the rook on b7. Speaking of shutdowns, well, it, it looks like Ding's the one who's trying to get that in, offers a rook trade. 
It's been denied by Yan. He doubles up on the B file, not only threatening the knight, but a potential rook B8 coming up next. Yeah, he's going to get the moral victory. Because after knight D3, rook B8, it forces rook takes B8. Oh, he plays rook D8. No moral victory for, for Yan. Yan kind of looked up there. And there is a little moral victory. You can play knight F6 check. Black has to take, and only then you take this knight. So you say, your pawn structure is worse than mine. We know that should still be a draw without much effort. It is three on three on the same side of the board. Uh, but uh, we take our moral victories here and there. Well, we, we, it's funny. We saw that exact end game without the H-pawn. That could have occurred in their marathon game, which was a game nine, right? Where uh, white has the three pawns. It was a knight end game, but at some point, Ding was trying to trade the knights on F5 and enter a rook and two against rook and three, where black has a double f pawns. But here, black even has an h pawn, so it's, uh, it's a draw either way, but it's very nice to have the h pawn to eliminate any doubt. Will Jan try knight to b8? Just, it's funny. You know, if white's king on, was on h2, I think knight to b8 would actually potentially be a winning move. <laughs> because like uh, you need that check on d1 to, mm. uh, to be able to play knight d5. Like, let's say knight b8, you play knight d3, you lose after knight c6. I, I think that's like... I'm going to show that ever so quickly. Knight b8 is a hilarious move. Knight d3, knight c6, the point fork, hitting this rook and forking here. But the moves are being played so quickly, let's let them play out. We see a trade of knights in a funny fashion that we predicted. And now we see the rooks are being offered. But that idea by Fabi, knight b8 to c6, uh, clever try. But look at Jan. He knows that there's absolutely nothing here. It may look like a bad pawn structure. You just can't attack it. If you bring a rook to b6, the rook comes back to d6. Let's trade a pair of rooks, then there are no chances. That happens on the board. I think it is just about me meeting the move control that you can offer a draw. The both, both players will probably just find a way to repeat it. Rook a2, the rooks will start shuffling, and we see that happen. Uh, they are just moving the rooks around and a threefold repetition, and that's a draw agreed. The second game of the rapid playoff ends peacefully, but once again, Quite a bit of a fight, very different from what we saw in game one, but not an easy draw. We saw some interesting dynamics and tries in the opening by uh, Jan Napomnesi in the Spanish. The Dinglerin held his own. It will come down to this game three where Ding starts with white. How much risk is he wanting to take? And the conversations that we're ha having about whether the players where they consider their chances best. Chat, get involved and tell us what you think. These are the best players in the world. It is world number two versus world number three. It is a close fight, regardless of the format that it is in, what the time control is. But we've been seeing fantastic chess, and perhaps one of them feels more confident in a certain time control or not. Well, time will tell. And with this draw, wow, the match is still level. Robert, what were the big moments in this one and what did you make of it? Yeah, it's one to one in the tie breaks after two draws. Neither side can defeat the other. But if we look at this game, it was an opening advantage for Jan Napomnesi. So what we've seen in games one and two of tiebreak has been an edge for the player with the white pieces. And we saw Jan, he goes back to his tried and true Spanish from the white side. And let's speed up a bit. Let's get to some critical moments because around here, this is where Ding decides to take this pawn on A4. It was a pretty big decision. And Fabi, his next couple of moves, it felt like he was on the back foot after taking this big choice. Yeah, I think that Jan was prepared for this and he played Bishop to D2. And we saw maybe an accuracy at around this moment. I mean, especially his rook to B8, which had Jan looking at him like, are you crazy? Why are you playing rook to B8? Uh, we we were also, I think, correctly critical of this move because after knight takes a4, white definitely secured an advantage. And maybe the move uh, that Tani suggested with knight's d4 was a better option than this rook to b8. And here, Ding started to suffer. Uh, yeah, he he, he really found did. this nice idea with c6. Mm -hmm. And bishop b6, I think Ding started to play really, really well, defending this unpleasant position with a lousy structure. And it was perhaps, I, perhaps his ED6 was a moment where Jan could have, maybe Bishop G3 would have been much better chances for an advantage because the end game, it looked like Ding was holding it uh, quite well. Right, and Bishop G3 keeping the tension. It's something that we've been advising for many of you out there, but he didn't. He 
released it. And then there was this really nice find by Ding the Run playing Rook B4, inducing the move B3. And if not, it was Rook C5, but that led to quick liquidation. All the pawns were traded off on the queen side, and this resulted in a pretty easy draw for the players. It was Rook and 3 against Rook and 3. It is now 1-1 to -one here in the tie breaks of the World Championship match. This is getting very intense. And I know I brought up this conversation at the start of the show, Robert, that what are the chances of us actually getting a blitz? And we've got a one-to-one -one tie and just two rapid games remaining. And I think for Ding, the next one with White is so critical. We've seen him come up with a fantastic opening idea in that first game of the rapid. Has Team Ding with Richard Rappo prepared something for game two as well that might I just worked this time, but yeah, Napomnishi has been so solid, so confident. This is truly the match between the best in the world, and we will be back in just a few minutes with Game 3 action. Introducing WorldQuant, the partner of the Champions Chess Tour and Chess.com. WorldQuant is a global firm in the field of quantitative asset management. If you don't know what that is, it's the job of building complex mathematical models that seek to identify market inefficiency. For 2023, World Quant Brain is bringing together its International Quant Championship and the award-winning Champions Chess Tour to hunt down the next generation of quant finance specialists. It sounds very exciting. You put your skills in practice in a case competition where you get a real challenge. And I signed up. <laughs> world Quant is seeking new talent and new energy and it's looking at the world of chess to help. Because nobody knows how to analyze a position better than a chess player, right? No quant experience, no problem. So, do you think you have what it takes to compete in the International Quant Championship? Sign up and be the next quant champion.
What is a chess dynasty? Unceasing dominance, move after move, again and again and again. We have a oh. resignation, we have history. He is the five-time FIDE World Chess Champion. But a chess dynasty can also be cruel. It forces most to defer their dreams until next time. If there is a next time. It's losing. Oh my God, did he just blow Yeah, it? he did. I'm blown away. The game is over. As the chess world turns to Kazakhstan, the Magnus Carlsen dynasty is set to close. The FIDE World Championship is finally up for grabs. For two chess superstars lying in wait, until next time is now. Jan Nepomneshi has methodically done what he needed to do to get another shot at the title. The pressure to seize the moment this time rests heavily upon him. Jan is running out of resources. He's built every single threat that's possible and things just counted it. There's no way to make progress now. Ding Li Ren knows firsthand what the end of this dynasty means. An unexpected chance to make history. Can China's best turn his good fortune into eternal fame? It's a draw. What an amazing defense by Ding. The 2023 world champion will be decided in speed test. The legacy of this championship spans across centuries. It reads from the names of chess giants. For the first time in a decade, a new name will raise the trophy and be etched into chess history. It's the 2023 FIDE World Championship, whose name will next be called champion. History is being written in Astana as Jan Napomnesi and Ding Liren will come back to this classroom to play their third rapid game. We are down to the playoffs. Welcome everyone to our coverage of the FIDE World Championship match. And if you missed the action so far, you have missed out on two remarkable games. So make sure you don't go anywhere, get the popcorn, because we're just getting started. Two more rapid games coming up. The score is level. And I'm trying to remember. And I can't, and I can't, I can't remember a world championship which actually came down to a blitz playoff and was decided in blitz. We are 1-1 and we spoke about this at the start of the show. I'm going to throw this question out one more time. What are the chances that changes today? What are the chances that does happen today and we go into a blitz playoff? I'll start with Robert. Uh-oh. I mean, you're putting me on the spot. Of course, I expect it at this point. That's the one thing I can expect in this match because everything else is just chaos. But... I have to say the first two games of the Rapid here have been very high quality. I want to give my praise to these players. They have found great ideas, some really nice defensive resources. Jan giving up his queen in that first game. And then Ding in game two, he was able to stabilize from an iffy position. Uh, so whether or not we go to blitz doesn't matter to me. I just love the chess that we're seeing. And both players are giving it their all. And I think they're actually showing their best stuff at the end of the match. Bobby, in 2016... 2018 we did see playoffs happen but the matches were decided in the rapid portion and you've been saying this from the start that there is a big likelihood of seeing a big fight in rapid but getting a final decisive result in blitz simply seeing the way the players have been playing are you sticking to that prediction yeah i'm sticking to it i think it's a very high chance that we're seeing a blitz a blitz playoff and of course anything could happen these guys have played pretty Pretty well. I mean, the first game was, I think, excellent. Second game, Ding defended a, a really uh, unpleasant position out of the opening. And I think Jan missed a few chances. Overall, in these two games, it feels like they've been able to pose problems with the white pieces. It looks like they've been getting under a bit of pressure, both of them uh, playing with the black pieces, and we'll see if that trend continues. Or if Ding has a new idea Ooh, and he first move. starts with knight f3, that is not a move we've seen by Ding in this world championship. I love this view and we see knight f3 and is it going to transpose into some kind of catalan or will he keep the deep on on d2? Wow, a reti. Very classical approach from Jan. Bishop to e7, invitation to catalan. Castle and here d4 would transpose, but b3. He played like this against Anish in the uh, in Viking Zay. Ding got a really big advantage, winning advantage, but lost the game. And that was with d4 and c5. 
Yeah, so, so we're seeing quickly. a totally different approach. That game uh, that Dink played with Anish was a wild one. If, uh, if anyone watching wants to see a crazy game that Ding recently played, that was one of them. This is going to be a more quiet approach. White plays bishop to b2, followed by d4. There's a lot of theory here, knight c6 and, and d4. Now, Jan looks completely unbothered by what's happening on the chessboard. So you said it's a lot of theory. Jan, he's been preparing for the candidates in 2020 slash 21. He played a world championship match against Magnus. He played the candidates again and won those. He's playing this match. He seems like he knows his theory. Yeah, for sure. He, he knows this line, I'm sure, very, very well. And he prepared it for the match. We didn't see it in any of the classical games. What Jan wants to play against Knight of Three? Because Knight of Three G3, G and G3 is an invitation to basically like at least a dozen viable systems for black, you know? So it's really a question of preference, which one you choose. And now we found out that this is what Jan wanted to play. It's very logical because it's also could transpose to a line he likes to play against the Catalan, which he defended successfully in the candidates and in the world championship match against Magnus. We also saw the draw in that cat Catalan with the bishop to e7. So it makes sense from a th from let's say a repertoire point of view for Jan. And now Ding is thinking Queen D4 or Bishop D4. I think Bishop D4 is supposed to be the move. Um, Queen D4 oh, invites Bishop, Bishop to F6. D4. Bishop D4 and Queen D4 almost equally popular here. Queen D4 has been played by Vladimir Kramnik by Hikaru Nakamura. So definitely a move that is uh, that Ding is considering right now. By the way, this position that we have after Knight D4 super popular with the top players so many pl super grandmasters above 2700 have employed this opening the likes of hikaru the likes of artemiev you got Vlad vladislav artemiev Gwen jones with the black pieces shakriya mamed yarov has played this position wesley so has played this position so it's definitely something both players are very familiar with and we do see the recapture with the queen to d4 and fabi you were mentioning the move bishop to f6 hitting that queen. It is the most popular response here and the only square the queen has. You've got to fall back to d2. You've got to stay connected to that bishop on b2. Yeah, you. it forces queen d2. Also, the threat of queen g7 was so unpleasant that this is the most natural way to and uh, to meet it. And I'll, I'll mention a funny move here. I, I don't think it loses. I think actually two really funny moves don't lose. One is knight to c3 <laughs> and one is knight to e3. And I think that they're both very um like they, they don't tactically lose it looks like it's losing a piece but probably it's like just not very positional positionally desirable i'll just show very quickly the queen takes uh, uh knight e2 check intermezzo and if you take this knight on c3 with the bishop there's queen takes d2 and unfortunately you can't take with the bishop the rook is hanging in the corner and if you take with the knight bishop takes c3 wins back the piece and it's just an equal game according to the eval bar so after knight c3 white can play let's say queen to c2 uh, knight takes b1, maybe you take first on f6, queen f6, rook a, b1, and probably this would be completely equal. It looks like a sterile position, but the bishop on c8 is not yet developed. So, like, we won't see this, but it's just a funny... Um, oh, he's reaching out for the knight. I saw him. You can also go to f4 with the knight. That's the other thing I was going to mention, but it has similar back. ideas. Yeah, almost touched the knight, and then he pulled back. Well, he's going to move his knight, but he goes, he goes knight f4. Four. But, but I was wondering about this too, and Fabi, I knew that was going to be your second uh, stop in your knight's tour. But if you just take this knight, the point for everybody watching is after queen takes, that queen is the only piece defending the bishop. So after pawn takes knight, queen takes queen, knight takes queen, this bishop is hanging on b2. Now, this is important to work on your visualization and tactical awareness so we can see, or hopefully you can remember, that black gives up a knight and a queen, white gives up a queen and a bishop. So we're trading equal material, but the resulting position will leave white with a knight, this knight on b1, or will be on d2, and will leave black with a bishop. But I think the contours remain the same. The bishop on g2 outclasses the bishop on c8. So just to quickly put that on the board for everybody, give me this free knight on f4. You're gonna take my queen, I'll take back, you'll take on b2, and then after some rook move, yeah, white will probably be slightly better despite black having the pair of bishops. And I know how much we harp on the bishop pair being so great, but it's because that this bishop on g2 is so much stronger than the bishop on c8. And white will try to get to the c file and cause some pressure down the open queen side. Yeah, white definitely has pressure here. And I think that Ding is kind of obligated to go for this. He doesn't have anything else which makes any sense. So we will probably see this. And 
if Jan was not in his prep, I would say, yeah, Ding has a nice, pleasant position to press for win. But Jan being in his prep, knowing the position well, I don't think that he'll be facing significant problems. So we will likely see that Black equalizes with an accurate series of moves after Rook to be won. I don't know where the bishop goes. It looks like c3 is a natural square. Uh, and Black's idea is probably to play Rook to b8 followed by b5. Just free the queen side. So you want to get b5, you want to get a5, and so on. You just want to free that bishop on c8 by moving the queenside pawns. That makes perfect sense to me, but Tanya, you just took us through some of the history of this position, and you mentioned some of the best of chess. I uh, heard some huge names among the list of players who have essayed this opening. So are you surprised that Ding seems to not know these ideas, given that it's been played at such a high level before? You know, it could be that usual stuff, and the moment you say it, he does make the move. I think he's just trying to remember how it really goes, what is his approach going to be, where does he create his chances. And speaking of what you just said, Robert, that, you know, the big names that have actually played this line, well, there is one game just from a couple of months ago, two months ago, from the Air Things Masters. Hikaru Nakamura versus Wesley So. Again, two of the best players playing this opening, and we did see this exact position being reached. And here, Wesley decided to trade the queens. We see Yan do the same. Knight to d2 will happen. The bishop will be picked up. In that game, white's knight found its way to d6. And that's what I'm expecting for from Ding as well here. The path is, as you're pointing out with the arrows, you want to go knight c4. You want to get that knight to d6. So far, we are still in Hikaru Wesley territory. And we're also being updated by some very fascinating, fun stats by our team that the only other FIDE World Championship tiebreak that started with two draws was Magnus versus Karyakin back in 2016. So the first two games were a draw, and then Magnus took the match, winning game three and game four. We haven't yet seen a World Championship match go into the Blitz to be decided. And when we asked our chat about that, only 29% actually expected this match to go all the way down to the wire, to the Blitz, to decide who the World Champion will be. It'll take me some time to get my head around that. A classical World Champion being decided in Blitz. Wait, one thing's for sure, it's going to be super entertaining. Once again, Robert, this is a position that we have seen before. We are still in Super GM territory in this one. Yeah, and actually, I'm going to ask Fabiano, speaking of Super GMs. So Jan decides to play this line. He plays Knight F4. Now that we're here, sometimes people, you know, they know their preparation thoroughly, but they get to a position that they may not be thoroughly comfortable in. So this type of position, to my eyes, would be more Ding style than Jan style. So are you surprised at all that Jan chose this variation? Or do you think that he's going to confidently play the next bunch of moves and be able to hold this position? I think that this is sort of Jan's modern approach to openings, which is just to shut the game down. And this is definitely a way to try to do so. It, because you, if you analyze a position and know it well, then yeah, we, we can safely assume that the position is objectively going to turn into equality with your play. Now, there's also the practical side to it, um, what you were speaking to, which is that it might not be so easy to play, and it might also not be so fun for Jan to try to defend his position. Uh, but from like a modern opening ap approach, it's a, it's a very standard and very viable way of doing so. Um, also, I think Black's next moves are pretty logical. They involve Rook to b8, b5, and, and these types of moves, a5 d4, bishop a6, developing the bishop another way because it, it can't go to d7 without dropping a pawn. Um, so you want to play that rook to b8. And for white, the question is, yeah, do you want to play knight to e4 here? Or do you want to play knight to c4? So after knight c4, I'm really thinking the move rook to b8 is a very, very logical one. And I, I w wasn't seeing a follow-up for white, that's very clear. Well, you're not going to play b5, right? Not, not anymore, because the knight will go into a5. So just to analyze something a little quickly here is rook b8. Uh, I was going to make a throwaway move like b4. You're not going to play b5, because then the knight sinks its teeth into this square and into c6, and black's bishop is very bad. So I guess you could play b6 instead. But like, even if we get this type of position, maybe knight d6 is very strong here as well. Uh, but I'm just wondering, Fabi, like, if you probably play bishop b7, I always have rook d7. So I feel like just black is passive and not going to have the easiest time to defend these kind of end games it could be unpleasant it would come down to concrete factors even in this position bishop g2 king g2 and one of those rooks to c8 uh, let's say rook, rook b c8 for some reason i don't know why it feels a bit better and if knight d6 rook f to d8 or 
68, yeah, we don't have to be fancy. So <laughs> 96 is probably not the way. Does that mean rook c1 is the way? Then, or yeah, you can drop the knight back, but knight back doesn't feel like um, it's disaster for black. But yeah, rook c5, a4, and the pawn on a7 is tough to defend. a4, yeah. maybe rook to a8 is still holding it together. But I think as we go back to the live board, just what we were looking at, that is clearly nice for white. And he goes to e5. So I'm a bit surprised because I thought you tend to keep this knight against the bishop because that dark square bishop couldn't attack anything. But he believes the pure rook endgame should be beneficial because rooks love what? Everybody in chat. I know I can hear your answer. Open files. Whose rook is on an open file? It's white's. And if this bishop ever does Fianchetto, then that rook slams on d7. So it's a safe plus for Dingley Ren. And Tanya, I mean, you're a d4 player. You like these slight advantage in positions. I feel like, for, on one hand, what Fabi's saying is true. Concrete a calculation will be required. Maybe Yon can work his way out. But Dingley Ren has nothing to complain about in this position. He can just play for a win with zero risk. Yeah, and the question is, how much is it to actually play for the win? It's definite that if anyone's got the upper hand, you mentioned the open files, the monstrous bishop on g2, a really actively placed knight on e5. Now, the one thing that black definitely doesn't want to do is trade that monstrous knight. Yes, you want to get rid of it, but taking that knight on e5 would be a disaster. You simply compare the pieces that you're left with, and you see that the black rooks will find it very difficult to connect. That bishop on c8 will be bad for a long time, and white will get a lot of activity down on the seventh rank if that bishop ever moves. So bishop e5 would be shocking to see on the board. I don't expect the players to go for this direction. The trump in black's position is that, yes, the c8 bishop isn't that great, but the fact is that there's still a bishop pair in the position. At any point, we can see an opposite color bishop happening. Uh, I think black here has to neutralize this open file advantage that you're talking about try and trade as many pieces as possible and kick out that knight from e5 with a move like f6. The bishop on f6 is the one that's the piece on route that you need to get that out of the way. Rook d8 is the move that comes to mind here. Trade that rook if white was to swap those rooks. Take it with your bishop, get that move f6 in, start pushing the knight out, try and get the b6, bishop b7 ideas that you're looking at, Robert, in different lines. And I also just want to point out that we're seeing a different position from the game earlier that we were mentioning. In that game, Hikaru had decided to plant the knight to d6. In this one, Ding has a different approach. He plants the knight to e5 instead. And uh, yeah, a newish position, but not one that hasn't been played before. I'm going to point it out again. We've got another big game that actually has happened here. And that's between Artemiev and Jan Shristov Duda. So I'm pretty sure both these players are definitely aware of this. Uh, Fabi, do you think? Do you think they are actually? Because the more time they may uh, they take, I kind of start doubting that. I don't think they remember the details of this position. Mm. They they probably know the position in some sort of vague sense, like the ideas. But it's hard to analyze this in so much detail because uh, both sides probably have quite a bit of moves. And even if let's say you analyze it, you probably don't remember every uh, every line of it. And rook d8, d8 looks like a good move. I was thinking, like, bishop takes e5 does come to mind as a possible move. I wouldn't be surprised, but he plays rook to d8 instead. So that was probably the best move that you mentioned. Uh, that black's idea is if the bishop comes off f6, f6 then, f, uh, then I can push the pawn to f6, take the knight away, bring the king into the game, bring the bishop to d7 potentially, if that square frees up. And uh, from a pure, like, like not even looking at the concrete factors of the position, black is doing well. His bishop pair structure is nearly symmetrical. In fact, maybe even a bit favorable for black if we consider the f pawns a bit of a uh, structural weakness. But black has no development compared to white. White's pieces are much more active. So the only problem for black will be getting the bishop out from c8. If the bishop on c8 was on e8, I think black can never be worse. Like just impossible to imagine black being worse if the bishop somehow was not on that very passive square, but starting square. Yeah, and Fab how does White increase the pressure here? That, that's a good question. And, and Fabio, I just want to let you know that the results are in, and fifty-three percent of over twenty thousand votes said that you will not learn back rank checkmate. So I just want to point that out, and that actually is important in a position like this, where Black does not have luft for the king. And you asked how to increase the pressure. I'm just wondering if we just analyze very quickly. If we just start swapping pieces, and I go rook d1, and you go bishop to c7. And I play e3. You can't take. And that's why I brought up that 
hole, because that is <laughs> back rank checkmate. <laughs> and if you play f6, like we've been talking about, I'm wondering how difficult this would be, because now the rook's on the seventh rank, b7 is hanging, this bishop can also slide to h3 at some moment to go after the e6 pawn. This is a situation that could be difficult for black. So, so Robert, just to clarify, you couldn't take on e5 because it was positionally bad to allow f takes e5, right? <laughs> I just want to like make sure that I'm understanding this. Yeah. It's because it, it's it's definitely because of f takes e5 here, and white has a clear positional advantage, right? Well, you see the evaluation bar is pretty much as high as had you played rook d8 checkmate in one. So you're <laughs> spot on there. But uh, yeah, I, I think just in general, even you know being a little more serious for a second, this doesn't look that easy for black because in all likelihood, you'll lose b7. We are seeing rook takes d8, so we might just see this on the board, but maybe there's a, a position that Tanya called for where we might see a bishops of opposite color endgame where even if you're down one pawn, you can still make that draw. And so that's I, the whole point. How much of an advantage would this really turn out to be? And we often see the bishop pair fight in these endgames, uh, even down a pawn, simply because of the option of having the opposite color bishop possibility. We see the rooks have been traded and Ding Liren can put his other rook on the open D line, the line that you were mentioning. Uh, I don't expect a back rank checkmate <laughs> after bishop c7 or the strategic problems if Byt was to simply to capture an e5, but bishop c7 does make a lot of sense here. It's the move you want to make. It's the move you want to get in. You want to play f6. And the line that you were looking, up, looking at, uh, Robert, I think that's the big question. Bishop c7, even if you were to give away the b7 pawn after the trades on d7, you simply move your bishop to b6 next. Let's say bishop c7, knight d7 happens. After e3, f6. Well, let's play, let's play instead of f6 and move king to f8. Because I really don't right. want to weaken the e6 pawn. Makes I think that this sense. might be an important detail. And now, Fabi, I'm going to throw this to you. That even this position, rook b7 is a draw offer here, right? If the rooks are off the board, there's nothing to play for. Bishop b7, rook d8, and the moment I mention it, I understand Fabi's detail. It's insane how he sees this stuff. And the simple point is that that king on f8 actually controls the e7 square. So in fact, this forces the rooks off the board. And it all comes down to that move king f8 you suggested. Super hard to see for me. Back when I suggested f6, that makes a lot of sense. A really nice detail there, Fabi. Yeah, I think we were, we were definitely thinking in the same direction, which is that the b7 pawn is likely to fall, but it's not the end of the world. And not only that, it's it's probably very likely to... We don't see Jan go for that. Instead, different we see direction. bishop to e7. And oh, the, that's a different diagonal. The nice idea of this is that after knight to d7, rook to a8, uh, white no longer has the move knight to c5, which might have been a possibility if the bishop was not on e7. So after knight d7, I don't think he is uh, any more in the inter interested in capturing. He might actually capture in king to f8 with the same... But I don't think so, because I don't think black is trading rooks there, potentially. So after knight d7, maybe just rook to a8, asking white, yes, I'm fully passive, but you put your knight on d7, and if I play f6, king f7, it could potentially be trapped. You might not want to leave it there. It doesn't actually do anything in the position, right? So maybe that's a dead end for white. And with that in mind, maybe this is an easy way for black to equalize with the f6 move coming on the board. For example, e3 is met by f6. Right, and yeah. I just want to show a few things that you're saying there because it's very instructive for everybody that why f what change in the position so knight d7 that looks like the move we've been talking about why not play it and why not take but to your point that now after bishop takes b7 rook d8 this rook es escapes to the c7 square that bishop had previously been on b6 now white's up a pawn we'll put our bishop on c4 maybe we'll throw in an f5 and go after the f7 pawn the engine says yeah whatever it's a draw but practically speaking these end games can be difficult jennifer you she won a really nice game against team india at uh, the 2018 olympiad where she had a, an end game up a pawn similar to this where she was able to uh, win in the long run so this is not advisable but fabi i mean if you play rook a8 that just looks like the saddest move ever because you don't really have a next move. And what if I just throw my pawn up the board and take advantage of your rook being on a8? Yeah, a4 might be really, really unpleasant. And, um, we see that's, that's actually a great idea, yeah. We see knight d7. See it on the board. So King is just going for it, and I think he's going to be up a pawn. Well, either he's going to be up a pawn or a really good position as you're talking rook a8. a4 look, starts to look very scary for black. The a pawn's marching down the board. That bishop on c8 not doing anything. Now you're never imagining taking on d7 once you put your rook on a8. That's a bad idea. So it does look like it will be an opposite color bishop endgame. We're going to be seeing the line with a trade on d7. 
Rook D7 and the eternal question. How much is it? Is it still going to be enough? Yes, you managed to not trade the rooks. You keep the rook and the bishop on the board. But Fabi, is that still closer to a draw? Yeah, definitely uh, close to a draw, even if white is safely keeping that pawn and keeping the rooks on the board. But it doesn't look super pleasant to defend it. So let's see if black can try to trade rook somehow. After bishop d7, rook d7, I think king f8 is supernatural, although black certainly can move the bishop somewhere as well. Fabi, just first step is Ding was kind of smiling when he left the board, and now Jan is thinking. So I'm maybe just settling down, getting back into uh, concentration mode, but he is down a few minutes on the clock. So I know he still has plenty of time remaining. There is the increment, but I'm starting to think about these things because, as you said, it's not going to be a pleasant hold. He will be down a pawn, and if he doesn't take on d7, which his only other option is rook 8, the threat of a4, a5, a6 is now becoming increasingly clear. And that looks terrible as well. Yeah, rook a8. I mean, I, I really thought this was an idea with bishop b7. It seemed to follow a logical chain, which is that you stop knight c5 so that the knight remains trapped on d7. But white is in time. It's a game of tempi. After rook to a8, a4. If black was in time for f6, king f8, king f7, king e8, then it would be fine. But after a5, king f7, if the king was on e8, a6 would not, uh, would not trouble black. In fact, king e8 would win the piece. But a6 here... Black is just one tempo too slow and king to e8, either bishop b7 or ab7, either one works, but ab7 is pretty uh, convincing and you win the piece. So Jan avoids that, of course, and goes for a pawn down position. And that's the big question that you were bringing up, right? Rook a8 wasn't a possibility. Jan navigated through that danger. And Fabi, after rook d7, king f8, if white was to pick up the b7 pawn, I just want to point out that it looks like the king can start chasing the white rook, king e8, king d8, and white's rook will not have enough squares. But there is a nice resource that white has in that position, and we're seeing all this being played out. Rook b7 on the board, king f8 has been blitzed out. Now, rook b7 is a draw offer. It's not going to happen. Ding will try to play this uh, position with the rooks on. And bishop b7, the point I wanted to make, Robert, was that after king e8, there is the move bishop to c6. And that just keeps everything defended. You defend your rook, you've saved your bishop, and you're much better because you end up picking up the a7 pawn as well. So we see the move bishop b7. And now after rook d8, very importantly, the move rook c7 is available. And Jan, with a shake of head there, he's not happy defending this position. And he shouldn't be. I actually think this is extremely dangerous for him. The evaluation bar can be misleading. And let's not forget who he's playing. He is playing Ding Liren. What did Ding do in the candidates? Uh, let's, let me think about that. He beat Jan Chistov Duda in an endgame that didn't look very winnable. He beat Hikaru Nakamura in an endgame that looked, everyone looked at the evaluation bar and said, yeah, that should be equal. But no, it's not an easy position to play. Black is down a pawn. And what would be your defensive setup? You need to get your bishop in contact with your pawn to keep it defended. White has the more active rook. White has extra material. White has some outside threats of bringing this bishop around to target this f7 pawn. Jan doesn't look happy. I wouldn't be happy either. He does play a5, which I think is heading in the right direction to put his bishop on b4 next. But I think it's going to be a long defensive battle for him. I think that it's... When I'm starting to look at the position, like, black setup will be you put the bishop on b4, you get the king to a nice square by playing g6, king g7, and white needs to advance the pawns in some way. But the only way to arrange a3, you actually can't really arrange it because you don't want to put your rook back on a1 to push that. Uh, and the only other way to arrange it is to play rook to a7 at some moment and play a3. But I'm also looking at the f2 pawn as a weakness. So for example, after a5, let's play white makes a move like bishop to f3 or king g2. Um, a move which doesn't change a whole lot. And black plays bishop to e4. And maybe white should put the bishop on d3 just to avoid the, the possibility that after g6, black will get rook d2. And not only attacking the a pawn, but also attacking um, potentially e2 and f2, right? So at least this keeps the rook out. But how are you going to make progress here? I'll play g6. Uh, you, you play king g2, king g7. But I think you made a good point that the f4 pawn is just loose. Yeah, also rook d4 at some moment will maybe force rook to c4 because uh, at some point rook, rook to c4 because you will continue to pile up on that pawn with bishop d6 and I don't see this as being super difficult. I mean, yeah, I think White will at some point be forced to trade rooks, and yeah, most likely 
the ideas that white has because you need to keep it's not about the objective evaluation it's about can, like can you continue to pose practical problems for your opponent and in this position i don't see those practical problems yeah i'm with you the more you talk about the position the more we analyze i see your point the f4 pawn that's an unfortunate one and if you ever play e3 then you won't be able to block the d-file and your f2 pawn becomes the next target. So uh, if the rooks stay on the board, that will give Ding chances. And he's going to have to try to use the clock as a weapon at some point. I, I don't know how he can do that, but establishing the bishop on d3 looked like a normal starting point. Uh, maybe start with bishop e4 and try to get f5 in. That could be something to consider. Just you want to create a weakness in black's position, and it has to be the f7 square. So g6 will be played. Black will be super happy to get that pawn there. Sometimes we say don't put pawns on the like squares where your where your pawn's bishop can attack them but more often it's the case that you need to put pawns on the squares of your opponent's bishop so that that bishop gets restricted and here if for example after bishop e4 let's say black for some reason played h6 just to illustrate like what not to do in these positions uh it might be let's say white plays e3 and from let's say a purely logical point of view, you might think I want to put my pawns on dark squares so that the bishop cannot attack them. But you play f6 here, and you're already probably just on the verge of losing after bishop g6 or something like that, uh, just because that bishop now has a lot of squares it can access because your pawns on dark squares they don't control the light squares, and as your bishop also doesn't do so, your light squares have become a, a terminal weakness. So you keep the pawns on the light squares. At e6, f7, g6, h7. The only um, Exception to this rule is a pawn in a5 because that pawn uh, is can be defended by the bishop. So, right. nope. yeah, this is it's sort of a tricky positional thing. Uh, it's it's definitely one of those things that becomes more clear with practice and with experience in these types of positions. And part of the reason is that Fabi, you're oh, mentioning the move g6, fighting against this f5 advance, and I want to ask you about this because from a practical perspective, trying to find a setup where you've got a good chance, I'm envisioning the white bishop on c4 the rook on c7 and black's e6 pawn gone from a practical perspective would it make any sense at all for white to use this opportunity where g doesn't happen and just go f5 immediately say yes i'm sacrificing the pawn but in return you double up your pawn i want to head my bishop from a6 to c4 start putting pressure on f7 i know f5 is the kind of move that perhaps the engine will hate and say not happening doesn't work out you're giving a pawn for free it doesn't make any sense from a practical perspective because I feel in a game this would definitely come to my mind. Yeah, I have a strong feeling the engine would like this move. Uh, not in terms of like let's say giving white a clear advantage, but I would say that it's it's a decent move along with uh, with some others. And yeah, it's it's a good idea because it's more let's about test the activity. By fire. Yeah, yeah, let's, test let's, this let's by play fire. F five, <laughs> F5 I mean, I is white, a fun move. Why will keep a small advantage there? So F five probably black will take. Otherwise. You can also include bishop d6. In fact, maybe you should to get that rook off the of seventh. Yeah, yeah. Maybe f5 bishop d6. Let's let's do that to make life easier for ourselves. Well, and the... uh, your point is that I just I think we just show what happens if e takes f5 first. Uh, Tanya was saying let's get this bishop around, and then this bishop on e7 will have to sit passively. It has to stay there so the rook doesn't get access to f7. So what Fabi's point is, let's include bishop d6. Your rook has nowhere safe to go in the seventh rank, and only then will we take on f5. Yeah, and then white won't be able to arrange this um, pressure on the f7 point because let's say rook c6, e takes f5, and bishop to a6. Black will, I don't think it's necessary to play rook d7 at the moment, but at some point, black could do it immediately, or let's say g6 followed by rook d7. Black gets the 7th rank, bishop c4, rook d7, safely covered, and then the bishop goes to b4. Everything's defended. a5, you're not passive, your bishop isn't passive, it's able to defend that a5 pawn. Uh, and... The evaluation hasn't really changed. It's remained pretty much that the position is objectively a draw. But it's that's why you need to be accurate at these moments. Like F5 is a very good, tricky try, and I think against a lot of players, it would lead to um to you know getting some chances with the white pieces to potentially put pressure. But I think that Jan wouldn't miss this moment to play Bishop D6, super accurate, and and make an easy draw there. So but, can ding Right. F5 isn't really panning out because, as you said, bishop d6 is such a nice inclusion. You don't want to be so forceful. You don't want to give Jan the obvious. Can we just like put our rook on a4? I know it's awkward, but that's the only way I see us starting to push these pawns. Rook c4, bishop b4? 
Oh, so you're not even gonna let me there to begin with. You're, I thought you were my friend. Well, not today. We might be seeing this oh. idea, by the way. Rook C4, C4. played great call, Robert. Robert, you know there's there's no friends on the chessboard. Is that is that sure. a saying? Or I'm not sure if that's actually a saying. Something like that. We'll we'll let it slide. And quickly, Bishop B4. So Rook D2 suddenly gives Black some double attack possibilities. And yeah, Tanya, your F5 move, we have to keep that in our mind. And Black in many positions plays g6 as Fabi was saying to stop f5 but i like it it's just instructive to think about when you're up material but the position is balanced maybe you can restore material equality but then you have some other advantages in your position namely a potential target in black's camp so the rook c4 bishop to b4 i know i was the one who was thinking ding has some legitimate chance to win now i'm looking at this like wait a sec can what can you even do here it just seems like too big of a fortress yeah this is a confident really confident hold free on and I don't see this going any other way except for a draw. And that's that's a really good outcome for Jan. His openings are holding up well. In the first game, he was struggling a bit in the opening, but this one is showed up with good preparation. Very professional draw. We can I think that's the right word to, to use for this. Uh, you, you draw with the black pieces and then start to put pressure with white. I think we'll be under pressure in that last game. One gets the feeling as if Team Yan has looked at every single possible opening idea. Because Ding comes up with these new moves, these new concepts out of the opening. We saw that with the white pieces in both games by Ding. But Yan just confidently blitzing out moves, plays accurately, keeps things under control. This amazing prep there by Team Yan, and he keeps that pressure on the clock as well. Staying behind by five minutes, but he's up a pawn. So I don't see the clock being a factor in this one. It is whether it is advantage enough or not. And we're looking at a pawn sacrifice on f5. It would make a lot of sense if White was able to put pressure, double down on that pawn on f7. But that won't be possible. So very, uh, very soon, Yan can just stop that idea forever with the move g6, keep everything under control. We see Yan has indeed left the board. And Fabi, I want to ask you at this moment, while Ding is in a bit of a thing, and we know that the position is pretty calm right now. That for both these players, they know it's today, right? Today is the day. There is no tomorrow for them, at least in terms of the world championship match. And one of them will be crowned world champion. And yesterday after game 14, a very difficult one where Ding was on the defense for a very long time. Ding was asked if he thought about becoming world champion. And he responded saying that the only thing he thought about was not becoming world champion. And that, of course, comes from the game 14 action and him being and him struggling with white in that one what's the pressure like for these two right now they can see the trophy the stunning trophy is just a couple of feet away from them it hasn't been there before and look at that uh, you know you know you're sort of edging towards every passing game you're reaching that finish line what's the pressure like in this moment i feel like it's it's a lot of pressure but it really depends on the games as well like, I don't think Jan is feeling any pressure at the moment because his position, he doesn't have to solve huge issues. He doesn't have to solve, like, real, let's say, intellectual problems over the chessboard. I mean, he, he kind of knows that it's a draw and his moves play themselves. But, yeah, these players definitely know that today is the day. As, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the great artist Big Shaq, he also said today <laughs> is the day. I think that was before his second big, big single, Man... Man, don't dance. But whoever's winning this match is, is definitely going to be dancing tonight. And no one's winning this game. Because take a look at what has happened. The rooks have been traded off. That is essentially a dingler in saying that, I know in this opposite color bishop ending, I don't have enough resources. And Fabi, nothing to play for here. There, It looks like this should be heading for a draw any moment now. Yeah, I think we'll try to get the king to the queen side and, and play on a bit. But usually you're not able to get your king active because the uh, the bishop and king, they, they somehow control all the squares. And also, if you ever get your king active, you start to get your kingside pawns attacked. So I think this is one of those positions where you can start to put pawns on dark squares too. <laughs> because here, without rooks, uh, a bishop can't, can't attack the pawns on dark squares, and having a weakness on the light square complex usually doesn't really mean anything. So he can, he can play h6 here, he can play king to d6. If white's king goes forward, probably bishop to e1 at some moment will start to attack uh, the white pawns. And even if white gets a past b pawn, for example, which might be possible to arrange that, 
it's usually covered by the bishop very handily. In fact, bishop is and is so good at covering pawns along with the king that very often even two pawns uh, struggle to advance depending on which color complex they're on. But very often, like we have these end games, if like we sweep the queen side pawns off the board and we're left with two pawns and obscolored bishops, very often the bishop can hold the um, the two connected pass pawns. Although those positions. Those positions do remain rather tricky, but there are a lot of instances where even that is not enough to win. Th this is just an easy draw, and I don't think Jan will repeat moves. Yeah, they found will even a way. Struggle. They found a way to repeat the moves, and Bishop e one, King e two. Uh, this has been the most peaceful game, not just the result, but also a really calm game by both players uh, playing this uh, inconspicuous opening. Yana Pomnashi handling it to perfection, going into this position down a pawn, but a confident hole in an opposite color bishop sees the two players drawing. And we're still level in this rapid playoff, getting closer to that potential blitz tiebreak, deciding this world championship. The trophy is in front of us. Uh, and Fabi, you were talking about the pressure and the players being very focused and just thinking about their next move, especially given the kind of position that they have. There's so much on the line today going into this final rapid games. We rapid game. We are at one and a half apiece for these two players. Uh, Robert, out of all the action that we've seen, safe to say that this one was the calmest. It was, and calm was not good for Dingley Ren. Usually he's very calm. Uh, he's stoic at the board, but he got nothing. We thought that he might have a little bit of an edge. It was the third draw in a row, kind of a wasted white pieces in a way. And this is the final position. They're Honestly, wasn't that much meat in this game. Uh, if we go back to the beginning, like I look at this game and we go through it. There was a tactical shot by Black at this point coming up where he went knight to f4. And Fabi, this was slight edge for White, but Dingley Ren was not able to capitalize in the slightest. It felt like Jan just forced everything off the board. Yeah, we, we saw what Black is going for with this line, which is that you accept a slightly worse end game, but you know that with accurate play, you should be able to hold it. And that's exactly what we saw. It wasn't even about the concrete moves. Because at some point, White used the pressure, the let's say initiative that he has based on better piece activity to win a pawn. But that was the best that it got him. The win of a pawn was, was not enough because we saw a big trade of pieces. And even though White has won material and you would think this is a big success for White, there's no ideas for White here. The obscular bishops, black super sturdy kingside structure, are the reasons why white cannot make progress in this position. Yeah, and then the draw was agreed in the near future. It didn't even feel like Ding pressed him very much from this point. So uh, for Ding Li Ren, this has to be a wasted opportunity with the white pieces. For Yan Napomshi, a confident hold. Uh, he just played a normal opening. He played all very natural moves, and he was in no danger. So this really wasn't as much content as the first two games as the rooks eventually came off the board right here and the players did agree to a draw by repeating with the king and bishop dance well energy is such an important factor and i think ding just feeling like he doesn't have enough decided to shut this down because he's going to need all of that energy and more going into this final fourth game of rapid we speak we keep talking about the blitz playoff but there is a big final fourth game coming where jan napomnishi will start with the white pieces the margin for error in this one is zero because there is no way home if you go wrong in this one. Tingleren has to have a confident hold with the black pieces. He needs to do everything to survive this one. Yana Pomnashi won three classical games with the white pieces in two classical games in the white with the white pieces. Can he strike in this final fourth game, which will be decisive? Whoever wins this is world champion. Or will we see blitz? We'll find out on the other side of this break. things wine tasting movies book club meet a lot of new people a lot of new friends and it will make you more social
Lauren are fighting for the ultimate glory, the ultimate dream of winning that trophy. This is the final game of the Rapid Playoff for the 2023 3-Day World Championship. The players will step into for this final game in just a few moments. And today, we have a new world champion. It will not be called Magnus Carlsen. It will be the end of the Magnus era, well, at least as the classical world champion. Yana Pamnishi in his second shot at the world championship. The first one in 2021 ended in game 11 with a convincing crushing Magnus victory. And this one is going down to the wire. In this fourth game, Jan will start with the white pieces. How much risk is he willing to take? He hasn't lost a single game with white to Ding Liren in this match so far. And as we see, there is so much to fight for. Fabi, you're on that list as the 2018 challenger with all your experience. How much risk will Jan take in this final game? I don't think he'll take too much. The weight is just too high that, you know, if you lose, it's all over. It's uh, not like previous games where you might have a chance to fight back. It's just the end of the entire match. And he will definitely want to press. I'm sure he'll be feeling ambitious. He can look to the second game uh, for confidence in terms of, you know, getting chances out of the opening and putting pressure on Ding. But you definitely don't want to be in a situation where you start to... I think this is also why it's better to start with black. Because when you have white in the last game, you uh, you start to feel like... Well, actually, maybe that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, what I just said. So I'm going to to amend what I just said. Um, but uh, yeah, my feeling is, is that you can pr play for a win, but you want to maybe take a bit more safety. Because you're worried that... If you get to that moment where you're starting to uh, risk that like things aren't entirely going your way, then you it just gets in your head like I'm going to lose this game and I could have just made like an easy draw and, and you don't want to get those thoughts in your head. So I think he'll try to play for a win from a position of, uh, of general safety, of general stability. And if he gets chances from that, and I think he can do so in some various anti-martial lines that we already saw in this rapid playoff, then he will play for a win. If not, 
he'll be happy to take it to place. Yeah, I think Jan Napomshi has been able to get a stable, it might be small, but a stable advantage. Most of the time he's had the white pieces in this match. He has not lost a game with the white pieces to Ding Li Ren. And I think stylistically, it has been a decent matchup when you're in a situation where a draw is okay. That he can just get a, a little advantage. He can play for pressure on the queen side like we just saw in game two. And unlike Ding Li Ren, who does take some serious risks with the white pieces, I think that Jan... He's got nothing to worry about. If he makes a draw, we do head to that blitz. Tanya, I know that would make you happy. Everyone wins. Chess wins if we do get that playoff. Well, either ways, it's going to be an exciting one. Uh, I'm going to stick to what I said earlier. I think for Jan, it does also make a lot of sense to get that blitz playoff in. These are the world's two, two of the world's best players. There's no doubt about that. And it will be very close in blitz. But in my head, I would think that Jan would perhaps find his chances to be slightly more in the blitz than in the rapid. I do expect a safety first approach, as you're saying, by Jan not over pushing it because the risk if it backfires, once again, no margin for any of that. There is no other game. If you lose this, you lose the match and that is match over. So definitely expecting a more cautious approach by Jan. I think if he has the opportunity, unless, unless an opportunity is right in, in his face, I feel the ambitious approach we might not see that much from him. I think a blitz playoff will be something that perhaps both will be happy about, but Jan especially, at least in my head. And we see Ding is the first one to arrive with the black pieces. His task is straight up. He needs to make sure nothing goes too out of hand. He needs to make sure that Jan doesn't get that big opportunity today. And we see him adjusting his paces. Jan, who's been confident throughout today, comes, he starts the final game with the white pieces, expecting him to start with the King's Pawn opening 1e4. That's what he's stuck throughout. That's been his preparation for this match. And Ding Liren, a big question. Does he stick to 1e5? Does he stick to that King's Pawn opening? Or will we see perhaps another Richie surprise? I think we're going to see an anti marshal again. Mm. I would love to see a surprise, but hate to be the bearer of bad news. These, these guys don't want to start experimenting on the last decisive rapid game where if everything goes wrong, then all of their previous three weeks of work were basically in vain. I don't know if it's really time to experiment. It might not be a bad decision, but it's, it's pretty risky too. Anyway, we'll quickly see what these guys have planned. Now we're going to find out. E4 on the board. As you said, E5. Is it going to be a Berlin? Will after 96 Bishop B5? Jan Napomnishi sticks to his move, and we are going to see an anti marshal as you mentioned, or maybe not. Might even see a marshal. No, no marshal. <laughs> no marshal. <laughs> But the mar it's good because the marshal these days, it you, you think like, ooh, uh, pawn sacrifice in the opening, exciting. The marshal is is the most boring. Uh, it's just all worked out to a draw. Just like too much theory. It's it's It no longer has a reputation of being an exciting variation. They're going well, for the same line, right? Yeah, they are. Exactly say, the same line. If there's no more Marshall, can we just get shady? Come on, let's get this real slim shady. <laughs> uh, players need to stand Love up it. right here. Knight a5, it's a re re repeating. So they're repeating the game they saw we saw earlier. And I wonder what preparation has gone into this. And Jan, he deviates by bringing his knight to c3 earlier. We saw the bishop come back to d2. In this game, he brings his knight up to c3. And well, now Ding has to figure out the nuances here. What has changed in the position? Yeah, the reason that we... Robert, I just want to throw this in and then over to you, Fabi. The reason they're re repeating is because, Robert, they're not afraid. <laughs> that, was, that was a good one, Tanya. It's, um, I, I think that usually we don't see a repeat in, in the classical games because they have time to analyze stuff. But they, they had no time in between games and they don't have access to engines. So they have no time to analyze. That means that Jan is not worried that Ding is going to come to the board with some sort of uh, computer prep. He knows that Ding will be on his own. Whoa, Fabi, this should I, be one. I'm sorry, but that move? What is that move? I mean, that would not come to my mind at all. That square is not for the bishop. That square is for no piece at all. Please, can you explain this to us? What is this move? Yeah, I think the move is, so if black tries to hold on to the A pawn with queen e8, then b3 comes and you can't take oh, on b3. We should show that. B3, he can't take because the knight is loose on A5. Really nice uh, instructive tactic there. Okay, so... So normally you sure. think, in that case, I take on B2 with the rook. 
So at least you get my A pawn, but I got your pawn return. I remain up a pawn, so knight takes A4. And if rook to B8, because you don't maybe don't want to give a bishop here up, then knight to C5, I think, is the only tactical justification of this. And white gets the bishop pair. It's probably only enough for a slight advantage. Yeah, knight c6, knight d7, queen d7, rook takes a6. Tiny edge for white, but Jan thinks in rapid in a rapid game, bishop pair is a long-term advantage, and it might not be a whole lot, but it's something. Something to work with. It looks like Fisher random chess. Like, if you showed me this position for the bishop on b1, I thought it just started there. Uh, but it's a very interesting idea, and the line we were just looking at, we took the vacuum cleaner out. We took on b2, a4, a6, went away. This knight traded for this bishop down here. Yeah, white has the slight hole because this bishop will see the light of day back to a2 at some point. Uh, but black doesn't have too many weaknesses either. So Dingley Ren is doing the right thing. Bishop b1 comes as a surprise, but it's not a surprise where you're on your own. He knew that this was coming. So now he just has to patiently calculate and try to work it out. Rook takes b2 is by no means forced. Uh, that does force those lines, liquidation. But black can also consider things we've been talking about with c5 and uh, other options in the position. Yeah, you can... Well, I think c5 is likely to transpose. If c5, knight a4, you can take and then take on b2. So it could come either way from either of those move orders. And it also looks like a very viable strategy. We saw a hesitation by Ding in the previous game with the black pieces to play c5 because it could weaken the light squares long term, especially if you give up your light square bishop. So I think rook b2, like you can't really go wrong with this move, except exactly that line that we were looking at. Black just right. wants to equalize the position, even if it's not super exciting for black in the final position, you know, bishop pair, symmetrical structure, slight edge for white, you know that your position is still uh, inherently healthy and solid and you shouldn't be a whole lot worse. And Tanya, it seems like Jan would be answering your question in how much risk is he willing to take. So Tanya, opening success thus far for Jan? I'm still taking in this last move, bishop to b1. I mean, it's just visually so shocking to see this move on the board. It's something that doesn't come to your mind at all. And Ding Liren really slowing down because he's taken aback as well, or at least trying to figure out the complications with Rook B2. Once again, absolutely agree with you, Robert. Feels like a Fisher random game being set up with that bishop landing on that knight square on B1. Some amazing stuff. Makes me feel that this perhaps is, of course, an idea that Team Yan had in mind for this game four. It's not an over the board preparation. It's not over the board inspiration. You don't just show up for game four and make the move Bishop E1 on the board in seconds. So this is part of the bigger plan and the big critical questions now, but thing to answer is what happens after Rook B2 and all these trades that we're seeing. He is taking his time, but once again, he doesn't have that much time. He's down on the clock by four minutes and it could start counting because there might be still some more critical decisions ahead. And Bishop B1, from a practical perspective, great choice by Yan. I think it's it's a smart way to approach the rapid games, which is that you prepare some positional line, and then you you don't mix it up. You play it twice, so that you don't have to keep too much in your head in terms of you know positions that you have to remember or positions that you have to try to you know understand well or you know all the things that come with preparation. So instead, Queen A is played. We mentioned this move. B3 looks like the logical response. Otherwise, I don't think White's play makes any sense without B3. And after B3, the question is, yeah, does Black simply allow Knight takes A4, play some C5, Knight C6? The idea there being that the, the Bishop on B1 is, is a poor piece. So White gained a structural advantage, but the cost of it was the Bishop on B1 being at least temporarily rather poor. Or is there some kind of sharp rook to b4 stuff, which I don't believe at all, but yeah, rook b4, bishop d2, I don't think it makes any sense for black, so this we can discard. I think b3, c5, knight a4, knight c6, followed by knight to d4 ideas is what thing might have in mind. And now c3. Bishop is so ugly, so c3 is necessary, but Bobby, are you believing in this? I mean, both sides have structural damage. I prefer White's position, just because White's play is, is more clear-cut. Bishop c2, knight b2, knight c4. Uh, black has to... Like, I wouldn't mind Black's position very much, because Black only has one real weakness. And even that a pawn, it's not like a huge weakness. Like, you can play a5 and support the pawn on a5. Uh, but still, I slightly prefer White's position. 
and he did play B3. So we've seen that. And Tanya, we hear Fabi. He would prefer to play that uh, with white. I'm thinking maybe black isn't so bad there. Do you think that Ding will – he surprises with queen e8. Do you think he'll surprise us with something else in this move? Well, this is an absolutely fresh position. And bishop b1 is a new idea in this position that has been found by team Yan. Perhaps in some other similar setups, bishop b1 with followed up by b3 is an option, but not in this particular setup and this particular move order. So definitely something that is a great practical choice. b3, I think given the clock situation, the fact that this is the final game and these lines that we're looking at, which are slow improvement of that bishop and b1, would definitely pick white here any day of the week, and especially if Ding starts to burn the clock even more. It feels like every move is going to be a question that Ding needs to answer, starting from right now. How does he continue? There is pressure on A4. White's got simple moves, right? Knight A4 coming up. Big decision. What do you do with the C pawn? Do you go all the way to C5? Do you try to get the D5 break in at some point? Where is Black's activity? And all these questions, the answers to them, it's going to cost Ding time, Robert. It's going to cost him a lot of time, and this could turn pretty nasty so definitely picking white right now very impressive little idea there with bishop b1 i'm with you i mean time is important especially in rapid chess when you don't start with that much but jan has more time than he began with ding is the one who has spent about five minutes and as fabi is saying that there are going to be a long-term issue for black on the a6 square the rook on a1 is developed in place so for everybody you know who's tuning in watching uh, this action unfold i mean this could be a situation where Ding finds himself in trouble. So, Fabi, let's actually dive in. Let's do what Ding is doing. Let's calculate what moves is he thinking about right here. He can bring his knight back to c6. We talked about c5 as well. What do you think he's going to go for? I think c5 should be played. I mean, yeah, it's it's just uh, the move. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not really about calculating. You just put your pawn on c5. And the reason you do so is because after what plays knight a4 and potentially c3, you want to make sure that... It's not easy for white to achieve d4 or b4. So you're kind of fixing the b-pawn as a bit of a weakness. Uh, you're making sure white can't expand in the center without allowing a lot of trades and potentially mutual weaknesses in case of that. Knight a4 is, is going to be the move. Sometimes like you 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 see a bunch of moves are just going to be played, and then um, I think we kind of saw this line up to c3. And here is the question. This is where the real um, decision for black is. I guess you can still play a move like bishop to e6. Like you can make a few more kind of natural moves without. And does black want to achieve some kind of f5? You can maybe play knight to d7 here, try to follow it up with f5. Uh, then the, the issue is you might be in time, but you might, you have to worry about that a pawn, right? Knight to b2 followed by knight c4 is coming. So you have to deal with the weakness of the a pawn, which might cost you a bit of time that could potentially be relevant if you're trying to play some very concrete f5 stuff but f5 is really coming to mind as a viable idea for black and then the queen on e8 is actually beautifully placed because it comes to g6 potentially attacks the h3 pawn with the bishop takes h3 idea that's where i would be thinking if i was in ding's shoes that's the direction i'd be looking at so tanya you asked the question fabi just answered it for us uh, where is ding's play going to come from maybe a potential f5 strike and that does make sense given the current pawn structure where black has these pawns on dark squares giving up control over d5 at least you can't control it with a pawn but f5 striking this way that could be in the cards so tanya what do you think how ambitious might ding become in this game he does continue to play Pretty fast, he takes on a4 and Ding falls back with that knight to c6. So also eyeing a potential jump to d4. Now, uh, Robert, you gave a shout out to everyone who was joining us. And I think everyone who is just joining us, the first question on their mind would be, one second, they're going to do a double take. What is that bishop doing on b1? And let's just with arrows, just, just bring out the little bishop dance that we've seen with this light squared bishop. It first arrived on b5, all the way from f1, a4, on its way back to b3. Did a little shuffle dance to a2 and then finally finding itself back on b1 all done voluntarily by yana pomnishi this is a fantastic idea and once again ding he doesn't immediately go for the plans that we were looking at well the bishop is still on d7 bishop e6 knight d7 f5 definitely in the air especially when you put how multi-purpose it is it suddenly makes a lot of sense to have that queen on e8 the ding first takes care of the queen side weakness he makes the move a5, and as long as the knight is on c6, that pawn is safe. Meanwhile, white hasn't managed to push c3 yet. 
And Robert, to answer your question, I was thinking C3, D4 will be the kind of stuff that Jan wants to get into this position. You want to try to find a way to open up your B1 bishop. But with that knight on C3, not going to be easy to achieve that. Maybe bishop G5, try to get control of the D5 square. Maybe, but Fabi, this bishop on B1, like C3 was a multi-purpose move. He's playing without a piece. And if I'm remembering correctly, there was a Vidit Guzrathi game at some point with like a similar bishop. It just, it was buried. It never got out. And this bishop is terrible. Like it is behind your own wall of pawns. I don't like the way Jan is playing this. Do you see something that maybe I don't? I, I know the game you're talking about. It was from an Archangel variation. It was from the World Cup in 2021, 20, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, so it's Dura Barely, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, I, I didn't like think of that game, but the, because it's a completely different opening, the bishop on c5, it's like a knight takes e5 line. But uh, but yeah, that's that's a really nice spot because uh, I think this is a classic case of Jan not taking care of his bishop. I mean, he's he's left his bishop behind bars, and he could have freed it immediately with c3 and knight to b2, but now it's like. You're going to have to take another few moves to potentially get that bishop out. All I can say is take care of your bishop. Don't <laughs> don't leave it stuck there. And yeah. and so after bishop to e6, I think yeah. <laughs> I think we might see knight to c4 here. Mm -hmm. And why would be happy to see it exchange there? You know, get some light square control. But after knight c4, black is certainly not obligated to capture that. And it's not even it's not even a threat, right? Just to put this on the board, knight c4. If I make some move like h6, and you take on a5, can I play rook a8 and pin you down the a5? Yeah, it's not. You're not even threatening knight take. I thought you were, but you're not even threatening knight takes a5. So white will okay. White wants to long term get knight e2 c3, and I think I think that's the only idea. Like you need to get this bishop out. Knight c4, mm -hmm. knight e2 c3, bishop c2. Yeah, that's not that's a plan Could at least. You could have done that before. So he does play knight c4, and I'm curious how Ding will continue. So if knight takes a5 isn't a threat, we may see this f5 variation. And Tanya, this type of position, normally I would say it's in Jan's style. Ding just decided to strike with d5. I got a quick question mark. They're playing too quickly for, for me to even finish my question. But now I will ask you, Black's pawn structure is ugly, but that bishop on b1 is even uglier. Oh, a big mistake, apparently. Oh. Um, wait, couldn't you have taken on d5? And I know we said you couldn't take that pawn, but could you have taken that pawn? I, I'm just, I learned, I learned from you, Tanya. We, if you can take a pawn, <laughs> just take it. I think that's actually good strategy for, for most. Well, I don't want to give bad advice to the, to the viewers, but what was wrong with knight d5 and knight takes a5? I, I don't get it. Well, this is a question mark, so let's look into that. And, and Tanya, well, taking a pawn on a5, there might still be this rook a8 issue, no? Yeah, but I thought bishop to d2. How do you keep up the pressure on this? Tanya, I'm, I, I got to Oh, queen a8. Like, oh, oh, oh. Queen a8 in the end. Knight takes a5. And if oh. rook takes a5, take, take, queen to a8. Man, Fabi doesn't let me ask any questions because he's seeing two <laughs> amazing of tactics. Because sickening. he saves me from answering those questions, Robert. That <laughs> is the ultimate motive. So I'm going to thank Fabi for that. But once again, I think this game, it's about that bishop on b1. Why did Jan get it there? And why is it still stuck there with absolutely no future in sight? And that bishop is crying for help. And Jan needs to find a way to actually get that C pawn moving to find itself on an open diagonal. Otherwise, the bishop will be asking Jan and telling Jan that what was this plan? Love the way you lie, Jan. I'm sorry, I was thinking about that for a while. Had to get that in. We will move on immediately because bishop d2 has been branded as with a question mark on the board. Why is this so bad is what I'm trying to understand because the knight from c3 wants to land on e4 and now you're threatening to pick up the a5 pawn. So why is this a bad move? I just think the a5 pawn isn't so relevant and Fabi coming up with amazing tactical sequences and knight takes c3 played by Ding. Bishop takes back hitting two different pawns and Ding takes that knight. Look at this. This is a decision he wouldn't normally make giving up his bishop for a knight. But is that really a bishop? I can't call it a pawn because you can't have a pawn in the first rank. Fabi, do you like this decision from Ding just now? I, I was thinking about it. It looked really natural to me because you, yeah, you're basically leaving the bishop on b1, at least temporarily, as just a very bad piece. So the more pieces that are exchanged, you simplify the position a bit. Also, structurally, this is, this is a good outcome, right? 
whichever way white takes, and I think probably DC4 is the way to take, so that you have... He takes BC. I'm, I'm a bit surprised, but okay. Uh, maybe DC, Maybe it's the right decision to take BC. But he wants to play bishop b2 followed by c3 followed by bishop c2. It's a terrible bishop, but if it gets free, then black's position is worse. So now we'll see Ding's idea here. He probably just intuitively thought that black was okay here, which is true. But maybe black was already getting better at some point after bishop d2. And it wasn't an easy moment to see like how... It's such a strategically complex position that it wasn't easy for Black to find the right way there. But okay, here, like, rook to a8 right? is very logical, right? Rook to a8 can't be a bad move. Bishop to d8. Bishop d8. I was going to ask you, can you just start throwing your pawns forward? That is exactly what I was going to ask you, because you mentioned the idea of f5 before. There's not even a pawn on e4, so why not gain space on the king side? He probably wants to to engineer some pawn pushes, but under safer circumstances. So I'm seeing... Some bishop c7 followed by e4 ideas in the air. That bishop will eye the king side. It'll, it'll create some tactical possibilities involving e4. Bishop d2 is played. Bishop c7, super logical. And then c3. And yeah, white's bishop, even if it gets out, it's kind of, it's always a bad piece, isn't it, at this point? Even if it gets to a4, then it still remains a bad piece there. <laughs> well, the bishop is not good. But I mean, Tanya, a big question right now is, is Jan playing too quickly? It seems like the evaluation bar has settled back in the center, which means that the last couple moves have favored him. But he's playing really quickly, and I feel like the position is quite tricky, considering there's a bishop still on b1. Well, let's try... Anapon's still on c2. Anapon's still on d3. Uh, bishop landing on a4 will be a reverse dance with bishop a2, bishop b3, bishop a4. Mm -hmm. Don't believe that that's going to happen. Not so many moves with this light squared bishop. Fabi, the plan that you're mentioning with this e4 break lining up on the b8 h2 diagonal with a queen and a bishop battery that could actually potentially be super dangerous for white and white has to counter it now either you do that with the move c3 to make sure that when the queen comes on e5 the a1 rook isn't attacked or a move like rook e1 but there are definitely ideas in the air and ding does set it up immediately responds with the move c3 so now after e4 are you going to capture the pawn or will you build the pressure with rook to e1 i'd probably capture just uh, the general principle that uh, if you don't capture it now, you might regret it when you can't capture it later. And e4 rook e1 invites you know queen to e5, then you can maybe play f4 and then follow up with taking. But e4 rook e1 also invites f5 ideas. Um, and even pawn sacks are not out of the question. But what's wrong with d takes e4? Because I was considering this pawn sack, and I'm not seeing exactly why it's so beneficial for black after d takes e4 here. You want to put your knight on e5? That is what I had in mind earlier, but I see the eval bar says white's doing fine, but maybe knight e5? Is there compensation here? Yeah, certainly co there's compensation, but after queen to e2, mm. if you get kicked back with f4, then the compensation might start to evaporate. He first so. prepares it. He makes the move f5. Yeah, e4 is an idea, for sure. It's, it's definitely on the cards. If this were a blitz game, I would say black wins this position a high percentage of the time, but it is rapid, despite the fact that Jan is playing so quickly. But we have so many ideas in this position. E4, maybe even F4 at some moment, because F3 would be a big threat to open up your king. I know that gives white the light square, so you have to time it well, uh, but there could be a position where you play F4 and E4 and Knight E5, and then you just take control over the king side. This is a bad piece. And I actually want to put this on the board just to show everybody what that could look like. Is Let's say I make some move like here, and I play e4, and I go f4, and I'm just going to make a few random moves. Well, you, yes, f3 is crushing, but even without f3, if I put a knight on e5, this bishop is terrible. And I may have f3, and if you just stop it with f3 of your own at some point, the dark squares are vulnerable. There could be a rook lift swinging to the king side. This would be a serious attack that white may not be prepared to uh, withstand. So I'm just looking at e4 and f4, a thematic type of pawn sacrifice to free up that e5 square. Tanya, that was one of your ideas. I love it. I love seeing f5 on the board. What you're pointing out, not just the e4 pawn sacrifice, but coupled with that f pawn advancing down the board to create more weaknesses on the king side. You asked this question, would you rather be white or black a couple of moves ago? And while at that point, I think the answer was white. Now, anyone, any day of the week, any day of the year would pick black in this situation. 
even though Ding is down by four minutes, just compare the pieces, the flexibility, the space, the control in the center, and the attacking possibilities. It just feels like a position that is easier for Ding to play. And there are critical problems and practical problems that Jan has to deal with. Before. Yeah, I think that we shouldn't underestimate, though, the strategic risk that Black might might have in these positions. If White's Bishop gets active, there is a lot of weak squares and a lot of weak pawns. And yeah, it, we can imagine Bishop on d5, probably White has a huge advantage. Of course, the Bishop on b1 is very far from uh, the sort of animal it would be on d5. And I think that Black's play will be based on some concrete stuff involving e4, and White's play will be based on countering that and also trying to get the Bishop active. So I like the move Bishop c2 here. I think the variation that you uh, demonstrated with e4, d takes e4, f4 is, a, is quite interesting and important because maybe white can play e5 here. And this is why like the position is more about the activity of the bishop, I think. I would consider this move at least, even if it's not, uh, let's say, 100% the best one. The position is about the activity of the bishop more so than the material. But something like this is really, really logical for both sides, you know, this pawn sacrifice is very thematic, e4 and f4, and something like e5 is also very thematic, trying to get the bishop active. But maybe bishop to a4 was was a better choice. It's, it's a complex position. The bar didn't really react to e5, which means it's a great practical try at the very least, because bishop a4, it, it works as well, but I feel like allowing f3 can be really scary with this queen coming over here. I would be too scared to play. I like e5 getting activity of your own. So that's Fabi's instinct there. And, and we keep talking about this. These super strong players, they would rather be, if they're up a pawn, they'd rather give it back than sit passively. They want to get activity of their own. So, oh, sorry, I clicked the, the wrong spot. But after f5, e4 is a threat, but maybe it's not a game ending threat. And that could give Jan the time to play bishop to c2. And if he can, bishop out to a4. I think he's considering these lines. And it's very sharp, uh, really sharp stuff, because you take risks with white. If if black could, plays rook to e1. Okay, so he's preparing against e4. Mm, black can still consider it, although it looks like a much worse version. But black can also play queen to g6, maybe? Comes Love to mind as a, as a possible move. And then, like, there's some tactics. For example, queen g6. I just just play the move queen to f3. I want to demonstrate a little <laughs> tactic. You see it, right? e4, d takes e4. Okay, probably knight e5 is crushing, but there's also queen to d6 ideas. I'm not even sure. I think knight e5 is the real reason here. But yeah, okay, queen d6 is also... Um, for sure, white does not want to put the queen on the vulnerable square like f3, but there's some queen g6, queen d6 ideas, which is what I was hoping to highlight. That's what I wanted to highlight as well. So when you asked me the question, I was very well prepared. This queen on d6 line with the bishop could be devastating and he plays rook d8 first and can hardly fault him for that move because it does stare down at a vulnerable pawn that will need the bishop's defense so it preemptively stops the bishop coming to a4 because you will need to protect this pawn and this rook can join the party at some point with a rook lift I mean, black has quite a deal of flexibility and this a pawn it's well defended so black's pieces can start all of them focusing on the king side tanya that white king on g1 doesn't have too many defenders. I'm starting to be very concerned for Jan Nepomneshi with e4 on the horizon. And with rook d8, e4 just has so much more fuel because you can imagine that d file opening up with the queen on d1 being x rayed. So a move like bishop e3 will definitely be met by e4. You don't care about that c5 pawn. You're creating your central activity. And I'm just thinking these ideas that you were talking about. Getting that bishop back to a4, bishop c2, bishop a4, you need to include that bishop. You need to find a way to get it back into the game. Is it psychologically difficult for Jan? I mean, we saw the path that the bishop took to get to b1. Is there something from a human perspective that stops you from making this move, bishop c2, and all the way back to a4 when you've done this little bishop dance yourself? Is that a, a difficult factor here, Fabi? I don't think he likes his position for sure. And uh, the large, in large part because that bishop on b1 is so terrible and just not getting into the game. We saw there was some strategic risk with putting your bishop there, right? It, it has a, a very clear point, or it had a very clear point to count on the structural advantage and positional long term strategic factors that white might have. But 
right now it's not looking like those factors are as important as the very concrete nature of you know black just has better pieces i mean um that bishop on d5 we we would be talking about you know white taking over this position the bishop on b1 is just not performing much of a duty and i'm also struggling to see a move for white here uh because things like i'm wondering if you can play bishop to e3 i'm terrified to do it yeah, rook a2 also, it's also logical to get the rook into the defense. Because Tanya's point that at e4, the rook on d8 was going to barrel down the d-file, so you're preemptively defending this bishop. But, I mean, Fabi, I have to ask you, this feels like a classical chess opening, but we're playing rapid, and the position just seems so much easier for black to play. This bishop on b1, it's just a defensive piece. This rook, a defensive piece. White has no control over most of the board, and black is storming forward. Yeah, I, I like Black's position a lot. I'm still thinking about Queen G6. E4 is also very tempting at this particular moment. But after D4, I'm not really... I mean, Black can sack the pawn with F4, but I think White is really going to go for that E5 idea. And that's a critical position to check. Because if Black gets time for 95 here, I just think that it, it turns like really, really bad for White. Uh, and you just can't allow that. So E5, and still, Black plays Knight takes E5 here. I'm not seeing like a huge downside to this. I think, yeah, White can get Bishop E4, D5 in. But instead, Ding goes for Queen G6, which we mentioned also a very natural idea. Now, though, E4 and Queen D6 is no longer really a threat because Bishop on D2 is defended by the Rook. So White can has some freedom. Let's say Queen to E2 is a very natural move here, I think, to prepare, like, maybe F3. But F3 is so scary because you weaken your dark squares. So what is White's idea? Let's see. He went Queen E2, so... He did yeah. step up with his queen. It was really I, natural to do this, but I don't know if I like the move. Can we just do this and play e4? How are you going to stop me? Good, good question. Uh, queen d6. Um, g3. I mean, oh. not thrilled thrilled about that, but <laughs> but then e4 is met by bishop f4. Okay, we're we're getting somewhere with white there. So maybe g3 is not the end of the world. Tanya, you're going to have to help me out here. Queen d6, g3, could you ever imagine? It's a great move, apparently, but could you ever imagine playing a position like this as white? Well, I think you might be forced to go g3, right? The threat that you pointed out with e4 and the queen coming to h2, that's a checkmate into. You've got to block that diagonal. So even though it's not a happy decision, it might be the only way to go. Now, e4, bishop f4 solves all your problems. But the thing that would really terrify me playing white this position if g3 was on the board is the other pawn advancing down what happens after f4 i'm targeting your g3 pawn are you ever going to pick up that pawn on f4 and open up the g file happy to go into that are you going to just let me pass back with f3 or perhaps even take the g3 pawn and strike in the center with e4 so many ideas i feel that after a move like g3 f4 would be something that would be very worrying and again we keep pointing it out white is well practically playing down a piece and all of black's pieces are ideally placed for the attack all of black's forces are developed they're in the center there's a lot of coordination and once again the strategic points that you mentioned if the bishop was on d5 you'd be singing a completely different tune but with that bishop on b1 and a potential attack we see the clock situation as well about a two minute deficit i still think that it's dingler and in driving seat and queen d6 would be a nice choice and it has been made Queen d6, e4 is a big idea. Again, g3, is that really the only move? And if yes, what happens after f4? That's a great question. I think g3 is forced at this point. You cannot allow the queen and bishop to stare at h2 for a moment longer. And g3, f4, I'm wondering, Fabi, so I am going to ask you this. Because f4, it's very committal. You give up the light squares permanently. And guess what? White does have a light square bishop. So later in the game, this could be an idea that backfires. So is black better off pressing immediately or slowing down with some kind of rook doubling on the f file or something of that nature? f4 is not the move I would think of because after queen e4, there's a d4 threat. But maybe queen to h6 there is the idea. Uh, but f4... Are... It just doesn't really look very natural after queen e4. Like you, you're not getting e4 anytime soon. d4 is a big threat. You can play queen h6. That's true. But uh, I mean, white has white definitely has a quite a big choice here. I mean, you can you can even play king g2. Uh, I mean, if you just want like a simple simple way of playing, 
So I, I don't really see this as I don't see Black's next move, especially. Um, you can maybe maneuver the knight from e7 to f5 to try to. It's very committal this whole thing with Black, like super super committal and super risky for Black to go for this. But maybe you can get the knight to f5 and start to to play. There might be some concrete sacrifices at some point. I wouldn't play f4. Uh, yeah, the, I would. I would not play f4. You know who agreed with you? Ding agrees with you. <laughs> Goes rook e8. This move, this move I like. He wants to play e4. Seems pretty natural. Maybe, and, not immediately, that, but at some point. At some point, e4. You also have f4 in your back pocket, so you haven't lost your ability to pr push either of your pawns, so keeping maximum flexibility. And what about these pieces? Tanya, we've been harping on this bishop. I know it's a really bad piece. The rook on a2, it's protecting along the second rank. I guess, how do we activate those queenside pieces they're really not helping that much and white's pieces just look uncoordinated and now bishop c2 would definitely be met by e4 right because you're not only targeting the d3 pawn you're not only eyeing that queen on e2 but also it's so hard to imagine white actually picking up that e4 pawn so bishop c2 e4 are ideas that black is looking into with the attack following up uh, but bishop c2 e4 i do see there's still bishop f4 so maybe it's possible, Robert, the only way to get that bishop into the game feels like a4 is the square. And now that black has stepped away from the d-line and no pressure on d2, rook e8 played, is this the moment that you've got to get bishop c2 in? It looks like playing with fire. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about that bishop. He plays queen to f3. Uh, Jan, is, Jan is a provocative, provocative player. Okay, he's, <laughs> he's really provoking e4, but he just wants to take. And he's saying that, let's say e4, d takes e4, f, uh, f takes e4, because now f4 is no longer an option. My queen will move. Um, let's say to g4, if I'm not blundering. Uh, no, I'm blundering 95 there, so so let's put it back on e2. Or wait, can I actually, can it go to g2? Maybe that's, maybe that's the point. Mm. Uh, that's, that's very harmonious. The g3 and queen g2 and bishop takes e4 comes, and he's saying... For all your activity, all you did was give me the pawn and the bishop becomes alive on b1, right? No longer a bad whoa, piece. Whoa, 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 It's happening, though. So ding. Okay, so knight to e5 here must be the idea for black. Yeah, you simply have to include this intermezzo. You're not taking back, as we showed you, queen g2. White will regain this pawn, and the bishop is alive. But after knight e5, what happens if queen g2 then? Probably knight takes c4. c4? Capture? <sighs> it's messy. But it's clear white is better after bishop f4. I mean, the only question is how much better. But white no longer has any risk because the position opened up. The once poor bishop on b1, it was activated by black's uh, hand. So white didn't really have to do anything to maneuver it. So after knight e5, queen g2, is there knight to d3? I want Now I want to get rid of that bishop. Wow, Fabi's saying, let's just ignore all the pawn captures, go in like this. And well, the eval bar says that black's not doing too badly. But to take here, doesn't seem like white's in any real danger. No, you can even take on f5, I think. I don't see the tactical problem. Like, rookie 1, bishop b1, queen b1 is met by rookie 2. This is kind of a semi-important line. You can even throw a queen d5 check in if you deem it necessary, but... Okay, is still that... there's some danger. Like, long-term, the a pawn is a really dangerous pawn. Cause... Uh, your point is well taken. Though. Oh, okay. D1, That's much better. The check. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but the, so the thing is, the, the a5 pawn is very dangerous if white's c3 and c4 pawns stay on the board. Because the c3 pawn actually limits white's bishop from being able to aid in the defense of that pawn in some endgames. For example, if all the, the queens and rooks were traded off the board, and obviously this is super far from the current position on the board, so... Um, but something like that could long-term become a factor, that the a pawn is an asset. I like this 95 knight d3 as, may, as like the best try that black will have in the position. Pandemonium. That's what this position is. And Dingley ran down the clock. So, Tanya, we haven't focused so much on the clock in this game just because it has been so many tacticus available to this, the sides. But suddenly I'm worried about Ding. Yeah, he had a better position. He decided to strike with E4. But after sacrificing a pawn, he hasn't delivered the follow-up. 
I'm just amazed how now we're talking about trying to get rid of that B1 bishop because potentially it could get so strong and suddenly that move rook A2 starts making sense because in so many lines, not only does it defend that D2 bishop, but it can easily transfer to the center of the board, come to E2, all the way from A2, just finding so much harmony. So just this position, practically, perhaps Ding just rushed with the central break E4. He did everything right, right, before that. He brings the rooks to the right spot, the queen and the bishop lined up. And I think the tension was just so high, he decided to go for e4. If he would have recaptured the pawn, the queen g2 idea looked really strong. He goes for the other one with knight e5, still expecting the queen to fall back to g2. And now I just want to point out that in that position, if you take on c4, the earlier option that you were looking at, I think that could lead to a lot of problem for black. After knight c4, bishop f4, white trades the dark squared bishop. Slides that rook from a2 to e2, and we can just do this with arrows, Robert. We don't even need to show it. The point that I want to make is that suddenly the a2 g8 diagonal opens up, and black doesn't have a light squared bishop to challenge it. So knight c4 would be a bad idea. By the way, queen g2 on the board. So we're going to see if Ding does find the way forward with knight d3 and realizes that it's time, in fact, to now neutralize the b1 bishop. And Fabi, is this all because Ding perhaps rushed just a little bit with the move e4? Yeah, maybe, but it's such a complex position, it's really hard to say. I, I, I'm looking at this knight d3, and I'm thinking rook e3 is also an option. And it's a mess, I, I can't really calculate it fully. Um, or actually, no, I think I see the answer. So knight d3, rook e3. Maybe we can... Knight c1? <laughs> I, I don't think it's knight, I mean, knight c1 might like work. No, it I, doesn't work, like, it's queen f1. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it doesn't work. But f takes e4, rook takes e4, and I was thinking this might be good. But I think rook takes f2 is the end. Oh, no, it's not. No, no, it's not. Because there's queen d5 check after rook e8, king f7. Rook e8, yeah. king f7. I think queen d5 is actually important. Otherwise, maybe it's really good. Saving um, the, your own king by trading off the queens. And at the end of this, white is in good shape because the knight is loose on d3. Well, that is a crazy variation. I was joking with knight c1. Sorry, Fabi, to suggest bad moves to make you a worse chess player. But... Well, these lines, there's so many sharp ones. And I wouldn't be surprised if Ding looks at all this, say, oh, my position is rough. Let me just slide my king into the corner because so many of White's ideas rely on the fact that this king gets in check. So is king h8 an additional option here? King h8. I wouldn't consider this move. But, but if bishop f4, what, what did you achieve? Like, it's yeah. really high responsibility. Black could just be losing. I mean, just, you know, you're down material and two bishops in open position. If you don't find something concrete, I, I think he's going to go for a concrete approach. No no um, waiting moves in this position. Yeah. Or maybe King H8 is a brilliancy. Could be. I know. I forgot about Bishop F4. I was thinking you would take on F5 and then I would take on C4. And finally, the black pieces are flowing. But Bishop F4 seems to stop uh, black in his tracks and it won't work out. But I, I'm so, like, I, I'm just so interested in this knight d3, rook e3, fe4 variation. I, I know it might never happen, but mm -hmm. I'm like, knight d3 comes to mind, and rook e3 is, is definitely a critical move. It might be not a good move, but it's, it's definitely a critical move. So how, how should black respond here? I think fe4 should be the move, right? Rook takes e4, and uh, how are you? how are you answering this? Like... If you take knight takes f2, rook e8, white seems to be winning a piece. Rook takes f2 loses. Rook e4, and queen this... e4. Knight takes f2 allows queen h7 with devastating attack, most likely. Uh, bishop g6, bishop g5, some, something bad happens to you here. There's a miracle save somewhere in this position. Just knight e5. Good luck. To... If it's that simple, mm, not quite. It looks... You go rook b8 and put pressure on the b1 bishop and also f2 is hanging, forcing you to trade on d3 uh -huh. and perhaps that's a trade you're happy with. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the right way. Wow. <laughs> that is a really difficult move. You know, we exhausted all possibilities and rook b8 there, but knight d3 is played. So that variation could be extremely important. And Tanya with the full board awareness, we are so concentrated on this side of the board with attacking possibilities. Uh, we're looking at ways for white to go after this black king, maybe this queen checking on d5. But in this event of rook e3, you can just take on e4 and bring that rook to b8. That's a really excellent find. If Ding Luran spots that, he may be out of the woods. Yeah, uh, I think it's... on the board. It, it's 
definitely a findable move, although it's a difficult one um, because you're really concentrating on something involving F2. But rook e3 is not forced. I mean, white, Jan has a choice here. It's not an easy choice. I think bishop takes e3 is an obvious move, right? You could play that and you know it's probably not a bad one and you take on f5 and looks uh, like probably white has some pressure, but I think he would actually be low to give up the d3, the, the bishop on d3, um, rather the bishop on b1 and trade it on d3 because endgames become dangerous. Just the a pawn, like that bishop is a very important controller of that a pawn in, in some variations down the road. And I know that it sounds far away, but I really think it could be an important factor in this position. And the bishop, white starts dark squared bishop. That being said, he, he plays it, so there goes everything I said. <laughs> but I think I think what you said still is merit just because he decided to take your point still stands that if the rooks come off the board, especially that A pawn is a passer, and even with rooks on the board, it could be a decoy of sorts. So we see a rook trade. Queen takes c4, give me that c pawn. F5 may be able to be captured later. So are we seeing a position that with all these trades, liquidation, are the chances most likely that this game ends in a, dare I say, draw? Well, draw isn't bad because then we get to see blitz, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised that I the bar is even like a little bit from White's favorite. It must be for some concrete reason because positionally speaking, Black has a pass to a pawn. Black is getting rook takes f5 and the bishop on e1 remains a pretty poor piece, and I don't see the downside of rook takes f5. There is some kind of queen c6, maybe, but I think rook f7 covers all the, the threats from what I, uh, I think it does. So why is white even, like, why is white not worse here is, is my question, because the a pawn is a more important pawn than white's f pawn, right? If we're talking about which extra pawn each side has in the position. In the endgame, you know, Potentially, white could be in danger. It, it would really depend if the bishop on e1 becomes active. So rook f5, I don't see the downside of this move. I also don't see why you would not take it. Although, I guess you're not forced to. You might have, for example, bishop, uh, bishop e5 or something like this might be an option. But I would say, unless you see a problem, take the pawn. Does yeah. it? Rook f5 on the board, and as you're pointing out, the a pawn definitely stronger than the f2 pawn. And we were talking about the light squared bishop being a problem in Jan's position. Now it's the dark squared bishop. He still needs a couple of moves to make it active. And if you just compare each of the pieces on the board, it's clear that suddenly Ding feels like the one who is who has more activity. The queen on c4, the rook on f5, the bishop on c7. The one idea that I do see for an active piece for white is the queen on g2. Can that start jumping into b7? To create some direct threats against that bishop on c7. Well, there might yeah. be tactics there, right? Because there might be a bishop, bishop, bishop g3. g3. Yeah, I was yeah. looking at this too. Wow. But, <laughs> but I think bishop g3, white can play rook takes a5. <laughs> maybe, maybe. No, that's. <laughs> <laughs> I Sabi, think we even have if to white show can't this. play rook takes a5, that's so scary for white to get into. Bishop g3, rook a5. You could also, you could also take on g3. It might just be a draw. Rook f1. Or queen f1 is a oh, mistake, sorry. I think. I was going to show that the queen gets back to g2. Yeah. Otherwise, it's checkmate, but the queen can come back on the yo-yo string. So that wouldn't work. But rook f1, check. And then the Engage king two. goes to queen e2, queen g2, rook takes e1. And black is temporarily up a pawn, but... Yeah, white, white will win the, even two pawns, but will, it'll be a perpetual check in the end. Queen d5, king yeah. to f8. Yeah, you can start taking pawns if you want, or just give all the checks, as you're saying. You see, I, I learned. I learned not to play king h8. I'm getting better as a player throughout this commentary. <laughs> no back rank checkmate. Okay, I see you. I didn't put it together, but you did avoid a back rank checkmate. Bishop b2, I think that's a great decision uh, by Jan. He's just trying to stabilize at this point. And Black still has his outside pass pawn, so Ding is down on the clock, but he has that outside passer, although White's king is safer. There are three pawns in front of the White king and only two in front of Black. So, Tanya, do we think that this is going to be a draw, or is there some life left in the position? I like what Ding has done. He's just created a lift for his own king so that the king can feel itself safe on h7 away from any ideas of a potential perpetual in similar lines that we saw. And still, there is a c3 weakness. So the bishop from d2 can't really go to e3, can't start getting active. Uh, and what you pointed out, after a queen b7 potential move, bishop g3 sacrifices. But now with that rook on a1, which is the other sneaky stuff that I'm seeing, the f1 square is under control. So bishop takes g3, this doesn't work because f1 is very well guarded. He doesn't go queen b7, 
He starts with the move queen c6, but there is some activity for white now. So rook to f7, or or you can play. Yeah, I think rook f7 looks. You can also play queen f7, but you can also play queen d5, right? That's that's another option as well. That seems to be actually the oh. easiest way to liquidate. Well, I don't think so because queen c7, queen d2, queen c8. After rook f8, you take on c5. You actually collect a super oh. important pawn. Just to quickly show, queen c8, you're attacking the rook and the king. The only way to save the rook is rook f8, and queen takes c5, and yet the eval bar is unfazed, despite the fact that white just stole a pawn. a4 is a draw, I guess. Ah, uh, you can't take, because queen d1 check, and you play queen c4, trying to pick up this pawn. You can't do that very easily with f2 under attack. So black has enough compensation in the form of that pass pawn. It's a decoy. It distracts white's pieces away from the squares it needs to defend. But whew, that's... Cutting it a little bit close, and I think that at this point, both players are not going to be too unhappy about making a draw because Ding was much better after that bishop was buried on b1. Then things started to get a little shaky. You could tell when he paused, he wasn't sure about the dynamic play, and he is now in a position where it is equal, though he is only four minutes left. I just want him, uh, you know, if you're a fan of Dingley Rand, you'd want him to play this quickly. You want him to avoid too much time trouble, despite the fact they have a 10-second increment. Yeah, I, I think I underestimated a little bit uh, White's position. Because it feels like, yeah, your king is just a bit more safe. And once that bishop gets to e3, it's actually a really, really nice piece. So somehow Black's bishop being a little bit loose, not having um, like a perfectly safe square to go to. Feels like White is definitely pressing this. I mean, we saw queen d5 is objectively a draw, but, but yeah, it, rook f7 was the most natural move. And here... White can play rook to e1, very logical. Maybe just like you can play it automatically because how bad, how can this move be bad? Can't. Yeah, White is pressing a bit. King safety, it's paramount. So uh, this rook coming to e1 over to e8, the a pawn isn't fast enough. Uh, if you allow this rook to get up to e8, you could see your king in some pretty big danger as the queen will join in on the action. So. Yanni's about to grab that rook. Tanya, I, I feel like for Jan, he should play these moves relatively quickly to try to put more pressure on the clock, considering Ding has under four minutes remaining. Jan has a six-minute edge, and that's a huge competitive edge in a rapid game, even with 10-second increment. It, it is something that is enough in a normal, simple, standard position where the pieces have been traded off and there are no attacks against the king. But here, it's still far to be far from there. So I completely agree with you, but Jan also has to watch out. There are threats that Ding has as well. Sacrifices on G3, a potential queen move from C4 to D3, putting pressure on the bishop. Jan's pawn structure pieces do feel a bit loose, so he perhaps can't rush with moves. Rookie one, great suggestion, great call there by Fabi. Decentralizing the rook, defending, oh, threatening rook rookie eight. And he plays king to eight, seven. So sidestepping any checks for now. Yeah, very logical. I thought also queen D3 was maybe a decent move. Uh, but perhaps black has yeah just a very solid position after king h7 followed by queen d3 you want to get that bishop off d2 so that you can take c3 white can enter an end game i know i said end games are are bad but i think in this case the like queen e4 trade and then put the rook on one of those squares and, and white actually controls the a pawn very very comfortably and is certainly but it, it's probably a draw i mean i'd, I'd maybe slightly prefer white but it, it's almost certainly a draw there. And we were looking at rookie eight check, but it's no longer check. So do not play this move. We saw ideas with bishop takes g3. Now it would really work. So you need your rook on the first rank. Do not lift that rook and blunder bishop takes g3. That would not be the way you would want to end this world championship. Because reminder to everybody, this is the fourth and final game of the first tiebreaker. Four games are rapid. So if somebody wins right now, the match is over. We will have a new world champion. So the players, they're trying to keep the equality. They do not want to lose now. And neither player wants to lose ever. But if this game is a draw, we will head on over to Blitz tiebreaks. We're, we're heading to Blitz tiebreaks. I don't see uh, Ding losing this one. It looks like he has a pretty stable position. And Jan could make any number of moves here. He could play King G2, for example. I mean, like you have a wide choice. It's not a position where... Things are happening super fast, but he might un for, head for the end game too. I would really consider Queen E4 here, with the knowledge that it's almost certainly a very drawish end game, but still. 
The A5 pawn could be a strength, could be a weakness. It's it's hard to tell. And black white king is a bit closer to getting to center, potentially getting to some very influential squares like d3 and, and so on. But Jan is considering. Jan perhaps just senses that he knows he's up on the clock. And if he can find a way to keep the queens on the board, try to create some ideas, he's definitely going to try and push. It is the final rapid game, but I think a draw, as you said, is the most likely result because just simply the position that Ding has a potential attack on f2, potential sacrifices on g3, enough counterplay. So shouldn't be that hard for Ding to hold. Guys, it looks like we will be heading to a blitz playoff, but there's still, still time for that. Yana Pamnashina with a three minute advantage on the clock. Fabi, you were mentioning a queen trade, and that goes into a level balanced endgame. But with the A passer, he decides to keep the queens on the board, makes the move bishop to e3. So he's threatening the c5 pawn. And potentially, if white, if black was to take on c3, we might even see a perpetual check on the board. Yeah, I think this move is almost, almost a draw for. Queen takes c3, let's say queen e4 check, king to g8, rook to c1 at some moment, white can play, but black has queen b4, uh, or queen e5, I mean, yeah, it's very, very likely that we see a lot of trades, even if white gets three against two, it's still a draw. Bishop d5, maybe it's like super precise to play bishop b5. But, You're uh... gonna take it on c3, just as, well, I'll take it later. It makes sense to me. All the trades that happen are going to be good for black in terms of you'll never lose. And maybe if you trade the queens and this pawn survives, black could even be better. Yeah, I like this move. It's saying I I want to make a draw when I'm a little bit better. Queen takes c5, queen c5, bishop c5, bishop c3. For sure, it's a drawn position. But if given a choice, you would probably take black because black still has the fast a pawn and... Yeah, white just has a three against two, which is not enough to win even on its own. Whoa. Queen to e8. Okay, so bishop to f6 looks... Because bishop c3, rook c1, a little bit scary there. A bunch of hanging pieces and pins and stuff that... Uh, I see a lot of tactics like rook f3, rook c3. You know, you, you could easily lose this one. Oh, I'm going to show that real quick. Queen takes and queen e4 check is Fabi's idea. Check to the king, check to the rook. You are going to lose material and black is in trouble. So, whew, still tactics left. And that's what Jan is doing. He is playing for the clock right now. He knows the position should be balanced, but the black king is less safe than the white king. So black can play bishop f6 here. Very logical. Um, one option. Or I think bishop c3, rook c1, rook f6. I didn't see the exact refutation. Because bishop d2, there's a lot of like queen d4 ideas. He goes for bishop right. c3. Is Ding playing with fire? I see the eval bar still approves of it. Rook c1, but now he has to be super careful with just two and a half minutes on the clock. No, I think he saw that like bishop d2 is can be met by queen d4, and uh, and white probably can't afford that. So that that might actually maybe it's a perpetual check there. Does black have more, or is it just a draw? Bishop c2, queen d4, bishop c3, queen f2, king h1, queen f3, king h2. I think, yeah. Chess is a draw. <laughs> uh, sometimes when people are playing super accurately, that happens to be the case. But if not for bishop d2, which allows a draw, could we see a possibility that Jan gets in a worse position? He did just give a pawn. There is this outside passer, the rook on f6, queen on c4, very active pieces. So Jan's about to grab his queen he has queen d7 so it looks like he's trying to win this game but he could be almost trying to lose to some extent yeah he's messing around a little bit it's it's actually a very interesting move because you don't allow black's queen and bishop to get free oh but queen oh. e2 you actually do he probably didn't see that one it's a brilliant move. And actually, that means it's the only move that allowed Black to survive this game. I wasn't looking in that direction. The bishop is now under attack, but he defends it tactically. That was a really nice find. So Tanya, queen e2 played. Ding now down under two and a half minutes. A brilliancy, but he's in some time trouble. Extra pawn. Whose chances do you like right now? 
This is anyone's game. It's so hard to pick simply because of Ding's clock situation. Queen E2, a really nice tactical find, getting out of that pin because of the check that you just mentioned. And at any point that Black wants to bail out in this game, you can just go Bishop D4. Trade off those dark squad bishop and you're absolutely safe in those positions because you'll always have pressure on the F2 pawn. So Ding Liren has got this safe exit idea and maybe he can start thinking about looking for more. Now Yan is down. Well, two pawns on the queen side. One pawn, one pawn on the board, and that A pawn is definitely one to watch out for. It can start marching down the board, but first, Jan needs to come up with a move. And there isn't Maybe a direct own. tactic. You just keep everything centralized. You just simply move your queen or queen d5, king g2, and just say, show me the money. Yeah, I think queen d5 is, is the right move because you, I think crucially, after bishop d1, you have some kind of queen takes c5 ideas to defend everything. Bishop e1 becomes a threat. You you maybe also just have queen e4, but I'm I'm not sure if white. But yeah, queen c5 is super safe there. So we could just see could see bishop d4 here. A bit of a draw for there for sure. If black decides to go for that. Safest, right? Bishop e1. Yeah. Your pieces are getting a little bit loose at the queen takes c5. So if you don't want to risk anything, and at this point, ding, probably doesn't have much in the way of winning chances. So play bishop d4, trade the bishops. Now the attack is uh, gone before it's parried, before it could even get going. So I think bishop d4 would be the right choice. And it looks like we are heading to a draw. So for the over 235,000 of you watching across the different platforms, we are likely to see a draw in this game heading to blitz tiebreaks for the world championship title. Yeah, I think I think it, things shouldn't get super ambitious here. I mean... Maybe he was feeling like queen e2, he's already better, but after queen e5, I think if you don't play bishop d4, you're going to be risking, potentially, especially with one minute on your clock. So, hey, he's going for it. Bishop to b4, he got ambitious. But do you have the option of just giving a perpetual now? Can you exit out with queen e4 and queen e8? Yeah, I guess, I guess white is not really risking, right? I mean, also, I guess bishop c5 is... Oh wait, bishop c5, bishop e1. Okay, that, that's actually, <laughs> no, that would be really dangerous for white, so let's not do that. But that's a but, brilliant point, that bishop takes c5, bishop e1, you filled the square. That's a different type of tactic, but the c5 square is filled by the bishop because the queen wanted to be there. If the bishop had gone to e1 right away, queen takes c5 would have been played. So that's a really nasty trap set up by Ding Liren here. Yeah, so maybe queen e4 is the right response. King to g8. Uh, you can go back queen d5. I mean, it looks like a draw, yeah. But Jan hasn't been making the draw, so it's now he does. Check. I think it, it would have been very dangerous, Tanya, if he had not decided on queen e4. It was time. It was time for Jan to uh, go for this idea. And now, of course, is the big question. Will he repeat with either queen e8 or queen d5, or at least offer a repetition for thing? I don't see a way for black to hide. You can go back with your rook to f8 in case there's a check on e8. And then you will also have a check on e6. Jan simply goes queen d5, so not even allowing that option. Guys, we're going to see a, a, a draw here. This will be a perpetual. We've got blitz coming up. That's what's going to happen. This match is absolutely insane. And Fabi, you were the one to call it out first that we will have a blitz playoff. Yeah, yeah. Draw. <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's what this rapid playoff has been. It's been super close. And four draws. These players didn't really... There weren't even like huge chances, right? They exchanged some slightly better, slightly worse positions, maybe even clearly better in a game or two, but more or less all the games were balanced. I don't think we had a, a single uh, position where it was even close to objectively winning. And this last game, I think, was was quite excellently played overall. I mean, maybe some inaccuracies in the middle game, but it was super, super complex. So uh, that's to be expected. And we're all just like really, really balanced. I mean, imbalanced, but also balanced in terms of the evaluation game. And Jan is considering, but it looks like he's going for it. Queen e4. Thing has nothing really to think about here. He shouldn't be avoiding the repetition. There's no reason to. Both players down on the clock, playing on their last minutes. We are expecting a repetition at this point with Ding falling back with the king to g8. Rook g6 is not a move that you consider here, right? It's the only move that I feel with black keeps the game going, but it looks like more like a losing move than a winning attempt. If rook g6 <laughs> is not better for what, I'd be shocked. 
But it's not definitely. A, he, oh, oh my god. Oh! <laughs> what? Is he playing for a win? Is Dingley Ren trying to win this game? Because this is a big moment. The bishop on e3 is pinned. The queens are looking at each other through that bishop. So if you can't take on c5, black is up a pawn. And Dingley Ren, I keep using this Hemingway uh, expression. You know, he said, courage is grace under pressure. He's courageous. And queen of five gives black the upper hand, apparently. Yeah, is he just pushing? But but the way, why would white black be better here? Uh, you push with c4, yeah? That's actually c4. So. C4 is on the board. White's got to go h4, Wait. h5, right? That's the plan. The black stops it with There's... h5 or queen g4, g4 as well. You can try to trade queens. You are up two queenside passers, and we keep talking about blitz. This is about to be a blitz game where Yonda Pomshi, he's currently up almost a minute, but he is down a pawn, and those are some scary pawns to be down. I'm in absolute yeah. shock that Ding actually decided to continue the game with just a minute on the clock. He's refused a repetition going into Blitz. Yeah, this is a pretty wild decision. Maybe it actually looks like a brilliant decision, but probably because this queen f5 was, was a mistake. Um, and maybe he just missed c4. He thought he's picking up that pawn, but he's not picking up that pawn. So this what does he do? Bishop to d4? I just want to stop c3. I, I, I really, really want there. to stop. Queen d3, yeah? Yeah, queen d3. Oh my gosh. This is, like, this is a position where Yun might have only one move to survive. I, I see the eval bar saying 0.3, but that is completely misleading everybody. There are two separate pass pawns. Most importantly, there's advanced c pawn, and you want to rush your pawn to h5. You do not get that. The queen steps to g4 after pawn to h4, offering a queen trade, and then the pawn goes up to c3. Fabi, Tanya, this Whoa. is worrisome territory for Yana Pomshi, who's dipping to just about a minute, and that was a mistake. Oh, queen d3. Not even queen g4, queen d3. That's the best way. Yeah, that, that's really, really bad for white. Oh my goodness. The c3 is happening. That move, rook g6. Fabi, we were thinking that's not even a possibility. And such a brave decision, and it's paying off. Ding Liren, with that eval bar, it shows that he's clearly better, better here. But practically, Fabi, how easy is this in a, with a minute on the clock? And Yan there keeps the queens on the board, which is absolutely crucial for any play with white. He has to get h5 in. Rook d1 coming Black is in. just pushing. Well, like, what does the h5 matter? Because you don't give checks on that diagonal anymore. Like... Wow. Mm, okay. C3? It doesn't seem to change a huge amount. Yeah, what, what are you doing here as white? Because the queen on d3 is so well positioned. And I, he goes rook d1. He wants to chase the queen off the diagonal. I think that's a good choice. But can't that queen yeah, just slide back to. to f5? And then queen c4. He has to, to engineer some sort of rook d8, rook d5, like something with activity. Oh, but I like queen this. Because if queen c4, there's rook c6 now. The queen and rook yeah. along the sixth rank helps to push the pawn. That's a good move. So wait. Does a queen have to go to e2? But that's not what you want to do because then rook c6 anyway with the threat of c2, bishop to a3. And he's also has no time. Oh. Uh, wow. So, yeah. This is very, very close. Oh my goodness. We're Plus. stunned into silence. Maybe you need to play queen e2 quickly and just pray. I mean, obviously your position is bad. Uh, but at least keep some yeah. time on the clock. He's down to 35 seconds. Ding's the one with the time advantage, Fabi. Yeah, well, white has to keep some time on the clock just in case it turns into a mess at some point. Wait, now rook c6? What is even the idea? Is he going to try to sacrifice a piece and go for an attack against this king? That should not pan out, but maybe this king is going to try to hide on h2. And in a scramble, if it gets into real time trouble for black, when you under attack, that's when mistakes happen. Yeah, maybe a good practical shot. I mean, for sure, this... Isak is his idea. Uh, it doesn't work. Like all these things are definitely true, but but it, he wants to avoid it. So we're now rook to c1 at least. Or wait, can you trade? Maybe you could trade. Oh, and it's given a question mark. You can trade and then try to get your queen back to e4 at some point. Try to make a draw. You just try to check. like hold it move by move. Yeah, queen e4, queen c4, and it's not an it's not an immediate draw. But you're saying black cannot easily progress because the and he finds it. Yeah. Queen e4, queen g6, queen c4. Good, good try. And not only C2, 
a good practice try. Sorry, Fabi, but look at the eval bar. It says minus 1.4. Is it nearly minus 4? So Jan may be fighting back in this game just when it looked like Dingley Ren would be crowned world champion. Well, it's very difficult to advance that pawn because C2 is allowing H5 ideas. Uh, and if not C2, then maybe you play H5 with black here. Maybe you really need to get those light squares under control. Okay, you can give a check. It probably doesn't change a whole lot. Does he want to stop pushing well, it the It didn't achieve pawn? anything. Pushing the A pawn, maybe, maybe. But then bishop to... Somewhere bishop d4 will get some counterplay. Maybe king goes to h2, not to allow queen e4 check, although probably doesn't change much. Oh my goodness, king h2 is played. And look at the eval bar. It's going near level. This could be dangerous for, for Ding. If he's all in for the win, he could find himself under pressure with his g7 pawn targeted by the bishop on d4 as well. Yeah, I mean, like, bishop d4, c2, maybe you lose because of queen uh, to f7. Yes. Something like that, obviously, you never you would never want to allow. But generally speaking, black does not risk here. But bishop d4, the point of the king on h2, queen e4 was not checked because queen takes b4, wins a piece. 17 seconds, bishop he makes d4, a move. And that was correct one. Wait, a3 and... Oh, is he going back queen f7, queen b3? Or is it queen f7, queen c4? Uh, queen g6 is available. I think that's what you were indicating. The pawn is protected. He goes queen c7, which is a mistake. A huge mistake in time travel from Yonda Pomsi. The queen has to go back to g6. That's the good news for Dingley Ren. He has only one move here. And Yon is the one down to 20 seconds and counting down. Wait, bishop c3? Oh, we just a2 and queen b1 then. There's no checks. Yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah, I think this is over. Oh my god. Oh my he has gosh. to go queen c queen c4 back. It's the only, only move. Will he find it? The only way to keep the game going is queen back to c4, going after the bishop. He plays just that, so a good find. C c2 now, yeah, this is... Board. Oh my gosh. So close to disaster. But he's holding on right now. Oh, What's is the... bishop c5? Oh no, it's not. <laughs> I was trying to get too clever. So bishop d6, this h4 pawn may be hanging in some positions. He goes king g2, which uh, keeps it at minus 3. So that's obviously an advantage for black. But maybe it's time, Fabi, for your h5 move. Just because you don't want this king to be checked uh, left and right, you know, non-stop. So maybe h5 helps that king? Just to stop white, because white is threatening h5 now. Right. White has a threat of h5. h5, queen of 5, g4, and the queen has to lose contact with the c2 pawn. h5 uh, might not be an easy decision because you feel like if my queen ever gets active, then white will target that h pawn. Definitely a difficult decision, but might be the right move. If he plays h5, white will play queen to d5. h5, queen, d5, then... Oh, I was going to say a2, but you can just take my pawn. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, a2... No, that works, that works, because queen e4, take this bishop. Oh, yeah, he can actually play a2 immediately. Although you have to be very careful here. Let's see, king f1. Oh, I don't think the king on the belongs the first rank. That means a pawn might promote with check at some point. Wait, now king e2, queen g4, so you can't move your king... Oof. But he was avoiding this a2, queen e4, queen e3, because he saw that option. He was avoiding it with king f1. But wait, now bishop to b2 is coming. This is just game over. I mean, there's no more hope here. The bishop on b2, white doesn't even have counterplay. Okay, wow. He's going for des just desperation. But h5, queen f5, yeah, this is... Desperation is not working out. Ding is going to win this match. Unbelievable. The resilience from Ding Li Ren. He brings his queen up. Now it's on f5. There's a pass pawn c2 that's defended. You can't distract the queen anymore. Ding Li Ren, who is down a point in this match, is he about to become our world champion? Mm -hmm. Uh, Black can do anything here. I mean, he doesn't have to panic, but he, he can play a2. Uh, queen d3 probably wins. g3 probably wins, yeah. And now a2. a2 is super, super winning. Not even hope is left after a2. We're just seconds away from Ding becoming the world champion. If he just plays the next few accurate moves, it's all over. Just this one is... move, a2, and it's over. And it's on the board! Oh my goodness. And Yana Pomsi, he sits up in his chair, but he knows this might be the last few moves of his world championship. Oh my god. Stop it. Oh, you see it. He, and he, he gives knows. up. He knows it. Yeah, Bishop takes that four is easy. Stop breaking. It's over. Ding Liren is the world chess champion. Wow. He has made history as the first Chinese player to win the world championship. We see handshakes that Ding is overtaken by emotions. He isn't able to leave the board. And for Yan Nepomnishi, 
a heartbreaking moment there. He leaves the hall. This has been a fight of courage, of grit and determination. And all of that has paid off for Ding Laren. Take a moment and admire Ding right now. What a match this has been and a deserving victory for Ding Laren. He is he should, the 2023 world champion. He shouldn't even have been here, right? To get to the candidates, he had someone had to uh, be removed. He then entered the fray by playing 30 games in a month. Then he goes to the candidates. He gets second place. Magnus Carlsen has to step aside, has to abdicate the throne. And then he gets into this match. We see the final score, two and a half, one half in tie breaks. But he was trailing in the match until game 12. I cannot believe it, but Dingley ran a deserving world champion. Yeah, he got so justly rewarded by playing Rook to G6. Uh, not many people would have played Rook G6 there. I think that's really the critical moment in the game. I mean, there's only one move that we have to talk about when we talk about this last game victory. And it almost feels unfair that Jan, uh, you know, when it was such an equal match, he just doesn't have any chances at the end. I'm sure he feels like uh, I was so close and uh, and just like one, you know, one move away from winning this match, but ding, Rook G6. It's a brilliant, brilliant move, brilliant uh, courage to play that move. And he yeah, played that with otherwise... just a minute and 23 seconds on the clock. Ding Luren has not won a game with Black against Jan Napomnesi, and he does it in the most important moment of his life. Rook G6 was truly a moment of bravery and courage, and it really did. He really did get rewarded with this playing it on a minute when he had the repetition, when he had the option to get into Blitz. This was amazing, fantastic chess that we saw. I'm still getting over what we've just witnessed, the turnaround. And Robert, as you pointed out, for the majority of this match, Ding was the one who was trailing until game 12. Yeah, he was trailing, right? He lost game two with the white pieces. And when that happened, everyone's looking at this match like, what's going on here? Is Ding Liren going to be able to handle the pressure both on and off the board? And then he was able to bounce back by winning game four. Then he lost game five. Then he won game six. Then he lost game seven in just tragic fashion where he couldn't move. He was stuck in the mud. And then in game eight, he almost wins, but he doesn't take a rook when he can. And then finally in game 12, when he was losing, he was in bad shape. He was able to fight back, and you saw the emotion. I mean, this move, Rook G6, I think that is a move that, you look at the eval bar to the side of the screen here. It says zeros. What did it say before Rook G6? It says zeros. So easy to gloss over a game and say the eval bar didn't change, but this is why we play the game. This is why Ding Li Red is the world champion. He makes this move, Rook G6, and Fabi, what a move it was because White was not in time to put pressure on the pin piece, and Black has an extra pawn. Yeah, when you think about the position before, you think rook g6 is crazy to pin my rook. When you start to calculate what white might have here, and we see that probably white is equalizing, maybe in more than one way, but all of white's equalization attempts, like rook to c2, I see that they don't actually like trouble black. Like black always has a safety note of bringing the queen back, queen d1, followed by queen d6, followed by queen c6. And so Dink absolutely correctly uh, saw that he's, he's not really taking a huge risk with this whole um, Rook G6 idea. And then it was just a brilliant decision. I mean, he, Queen to F5 was the first mistake in the wrong direction. I think he just missed C4. Probably Jan didn't believe move Rook G6 or he thought H4 is, is coming and he missed this move Queen to D3. Maybe even Queen G4 was also good, but Queen D3 is the best move. And somehow Jan still had some really good drawing chances at some moment later on, but it was a time scramble. And very often these time scrambles, if you get like one drawing chance, you don't seize it because it's just, you know, one drawing chance out of like 20 moves. It's it's uh, too difficult to spot exactly when your chance is. It was after he found like this bishop d4 and it was quite miraculous that white was getting counterplay, but he had to find one last move probably to make a draw in this position. And maybe the move was h5, I'm starting to think. If you want to stop queen g6 and the queen can't, leave without dropping the b4 the bishop on b4 uh, of course black is not risking here although it's not easy to find a move either so bobby could you imagine someone playing this move with like 20 seconds on their clock h5 when there are two separate pass pawns you can hardly blame yonda pomshi for once the bishop's on d4 for playing queen c7 he's threatening checkmate in one move and with the queen coming to g6 if the queen were on f7 well that would have offered a queen trade so i can't blame him for missing it no time left but i think it, it's earlier in the game where if there's a decision he would like to take back 
forcing the draw when he had a chance. He didn't do it, and Rook G6 was that courageous choice by Ding Liren, but Jan, he's going to be kicking himself for not forcing the draw. Yeah, he definitely definitely had a lot of moments where he was he had complete safety and he was still feeling ambitious. Uh, what can you say? He had these last second decisions. I mean, they they can sometimes come back to haunt you. It's not even like we can criticize that you play on because, okay, it's, you know, Jan played on and it was courageous and Ding played on it and it was courageous, but one of those was rewarded. It's Sometimes you take a courageous decision and it gets punished as it was in this game. He probably thought he's operating in a position without much risk earlier on in the game. Um, then again, if he had played h5 at the moment and it had been some other result, we would have, you know, we would have said, yeah, sure, it's just another game. But uh, it turned out to be such a pivotal game. I mean, this game decided the world champion. And that's, that's also what happens when you let it get down to the last game, right? Like, it's a four-game match. And uh, tied, uh, anything can happen after, you know. That's why uh, sometimes you want an accident happen to happen earlier, right? Like, you, you lose the first game, and then you have plenty of opportunities to get back. Uh, Jan, unfortunately for him, has no opportunity to get back because this is the final game. And that's why I said, like, maybe it feels unfair to him because sometimes you want, like, I want that extra chance. I, I still want to fight in this match, but, but it's all over. Tanya, I mean, we're giving Rook G6 a lot of credit, but this Queenie 2 find, double X slam, I mean, that was also brilliant by Ding Li Ren getting out of the pin. And because the bishop can't be captured, Queenie 1 checks. So many good decisions by Ding when he was the one down on the clock. Alaran, excellent play there by Ding Liren, but it definitely comes down to that courageous decision of going Rook G6, declining a repetition, forcing a blitz playoff. We expected it, Jan perhaps expected it for that repetition and was completely thrown off by the move Rook G6. And we saw Ding on seconds, under a minute, play one good move after the other, and that's exactly what you need to become world champion. And finally, in game four, Ding does take the crown. Two and a half to one and a half. We saw three fighting draws. We saw 14 intense classical games. And finally, it was the fourth rapid Graham that crowns Ding Liren as the world champion. But also one has to feel for his his competitor, Jan Nafamnishi. What a match he played, kept his lead, took his chances, fought in every single game till the very end. Those long marathon end games. It was incredible to see his resourcefulness out of the openings and just the way he kept things under control. And this move, Rook G6, it was, it was too much. It was unbelievable what happened. But for Jan Nepomnishi, this, had, this was his second chance at the World Championship. And take a moment, because it has been a tough one for Jan. Ding Liren, well, he's the king of the world right now. Yeah, Jan needed to finish it off in classical. I mean, he had his big chance, game 12. That was, he was winning. He was up in the match. If he had won that game, I mean, it wouldn't have been over yet, but it would have been like, let's say 99%, the job is done. And that was, that was his big moment. Uh, after that, we said it's 50-50 going into the final two games, going into the rapid. We said also it's as close as you can expect. These two guys are really evenly matched, but Jan had a huge chance in game 12. And Ding today, I mean, like, Ding had an amazing day. I mean. He barely made mistakes today, I have to say. He had a few slightly worse positions. He made a few inaccuracies, but to have four rapid games where you barely make mistakes is really, really impressive. Uh, I can only think of like game one, he made one mistake. Uh, yeah, that's all I can think of. I don't know. Maybe you guys remember some more mistakes, but I can't really think of many in this entire final four rapid games. I think it's a really good point that Ding played super precise chess. In that first game, he had an advantage. He did let Jan back in the game, but it wasn't major. I can't really think of moments where we were super worried about Ding's position that he might lose. And Fabi, just to add on to what you were saying, game 12, of course, is one that Jan Nepomnesi is going to regret. In game 14, he played that E5 move when he knew that he was a borderline winning, and then Ding found that B6 idea. That was some brilliant stuff. Uh, so Jan had the World Championship in his hands, and you have to feel for him because it's his second time playing in the World Championship. Against Magnus Carlsen, he knew that was an uphill battle. Magnus was the heavy favorite, much higher rated. Against Ding Li Ren, they were even by rating. Jan was leading throughout many parts of this match as early as Game 2 and as late as going into Game 12. 
And then in Rapid, I just think the, the proper summary is Ding Li Ren just gave the world a masterclass. That was such great technique. It was such fine precision. When he needed to find accurate moves, he did. I, I think that Ding Li Ren, you could see everything just coming out of him. He was so emotional there. But he also left everything on the chessboard today. All of these brilliant ideas in that last game. Rook G6 to play on there when many people would just make a draw head into Blitz. I think he really deserves so much credit. And he has a world championship title, but that was amazing stuff. When I had that interview with Ding in the last Champions Chess Draw event, right before he took his journey to Astana, he spoke about how his dream was that his photograph would hang in all these chess clubs across the world. And that would mean so much to him. Well, he's achieved an ultimate dream for every single player. And it's not been easy. Well, it never is. But this match has been so up and down, full of unexpected surprises. And today, when it mattered the most, at every step, it felt like Ding but are the best in him on the day that it mattered the most. Starting from the opening preparations, the ideas that we saw with, with the white pieces, he wasn't afraid to go into complications, to go into dynamics. And Jan Nepomneshi really held his own, but it came down to those few seconds, that minute, and it just was Ding's day. And today is, is a big day for him as he becomes a world champion. Wow. Guys, this has been a match that's down for the ages. And for Jan, as you mentioned, winning two candidates back to back. Fabi, that is not easy. That just shows what a world-class player Jan is. I'm trying to rack my brains for the last time a player won two consecutive candidates and I'm struggling. I also can't, can't think of it. Um, I guess fortunately has, uh, we're, we're really going back in time. I mean, we're going back to 1981, yeah? But the, it's uh, obviously it says a lot if we have to go back 50, almost 50 years in history to find a second example of doing something like that. The candidates tournament is almost like a world championship in itself because you have to play against all the best players in the world besides obviously the world champion. Uh, and so even if you are, let's say, a player like Magnus or a player who, who wins a huge amount of events, winning the candidates is such a such a tremendously difficult and uh, impressive feat and doing it twice in a row. Yeah, we can count on one hand the amount of people who've done it, but at the final moment, Jan, uh, Jan wasn't able to put, bring it home. Robert, it's been such an intense day of action. We were so ready to see the blitz happen. And do you think today it all came down to that split second decision? At the end of it, it is this move rook to g6. I remember in the 2016 World Championship match, it was the move rook to a6 by Magnus Carlsen that won the World Championship. Is it fair to say that today the star move was rook to g6? Absolutely. I mean, it was just a brilliant attempt from Ding Li Ren. The way he played this final game, at first, it looked good for him. Then it started to look iffy, but he held on. He did great. And we see Magnus Carlsen self-pinning for immortality. Congrats, Ding. And yeah, Ding deserves all the congratulations. I think finally he'll be able to relax a little bit. He has seemed uh, quite stressed throughout the match. Uh, but as you said, Tanya, I, I was there when you interviewed him, and it was a great heartfelt interview where he said you know, he wants his photo to be hanging in chess clubs. He's earned that, and he's earned so much more. I think he's gained so many fans that haven't seen him play in a long time because uh, he was in China, and it, during COVID, he just couldn't uh, get access to tournaments. So to see him become the world champion, I, I think for many people who are newer to the game, this is one of the stars of the game. No matter if Magus Carlsen plays or not, you see the pinned tweet. He's congratulating Ding Lorenz as the world champion. With this win, Ding Lorenz puts himself in the history books forever as the 17th world chess champion. And what's been also amazing to see is the glimpses that we've gotten into Ding's personality throughout the match. He's been so candid. You've seen those emotional moments. You've seen his interaction with Richard Rappo after the games. It's all been very heartwarming. And then to see Ding bring out the best in him, the absolute best in him in this critical moment, it has paid off. What a day it is. And he is the first Chinese player ever to become world champion. It's definitely a moment for national pride as well, Fabi. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I can't imagine how over the moon Ding is. I'm sure, I mean, he said as much that it's always been a dream of his to be in the books as a world champion. He joins 
a list of some of the greatest players. Uh, well, not some of, I mean, all of the greatest players mm -hmm. in, in history. And yeah, I mean, his, his name is definitely in the books now. Oh, and there we see Dingler in with his fans and Richard Rappo there, who's been such a big part of the success of Dings. We've seen these amazing clips of both of them, their interaction after the game. He's been a big support to Dingler in this match. He owes so much of these big opening ideas that we saw. And we see Dingler in there celebrate with his core team in Astana. These are some hot warming. Oh, these are some hot warming moments that I think we will remember forever we will indeed i mean china has won numerous olympiads uh, there have been many women's world champions from china the current women's world champion and her challenger are from china and the candidates finalists are also from china so they have such a successful team of players uh they love the game they've been working really hard Ding Liren now with richard report that was a really uh, nice uh, photo session there you see the people clapping uh, but yeah this is going to be a tough press conference for Yana Pomshi but a moment uh, of, of a lifetime for Ding Li Ren and he really did earn it uh, they worked so hard and Richard Report as his second uh, he gets a lot of credit as well uh, he came up with many good ideas well, we see Yan there a very difficult moment for Yan and Ding Li Ren as well is there let's hear it from the new world chess champion we are going over to astana no press conference we do have 17th world champion this is ding liren uh congratulations to to ding uh, it has been a terrific match with so many decisive results and amazing chess games what are your thoughts right now as you are the world champion? Well, quite relieved. Uh, the moment I uh, yeah, resigned the game, it was uh, a very emotional moment. I cannot uh, control my moods, uh, my, my feelings, and yes, I know myself, I will uh, cry, I will um, burst into tears, yes, and uh, yeah, it's uh, quite a uh, 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 top tournament for me. Yeah, I, I would like to thanks to my uh, friends. Uh, you, what you ask my feeling? How do you feel right now? Uh, my feel. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, oh, quite relieved. Yeah. Um, it must be very difficult to, to from both players to to talk right now. I appreciate that all of us are appreciating that you are both here. Thank you very much, uh, Jan, for, for coming up here. Um, it must be very difficult for you right now to be here, and it has been really close match. Uh, please share, share with us your thoughts about the match in general. Well, <clears throat> I guess I had every chance. Um, so, uh, I mean, I had so many promising positions. Uh, and probably should have should have tried to finish everything in the classical portion uh, because once again it was uh, I guess a matter of one or two precise moves both in round 12 and round 14 as well uh, but yeah once it uh, went uh, once it uh, it was a time break of course it's uh, you know, it's always some sort of a lottery, especially after 14 games match, and uh, yeah. So uh, probably my opponent made the penultimate mistake. So that's it. All right, um, thank you. Um, I would like to give the floor right away to press. I'm sure you have a lot of questions to players. Um, I just don't see all of you, so let's go from this side. 
Uh, hello, uh, question to Jim Zirain. Uh, how do you feel about staying in Astana and especially the weather conditions uh, was quite tough in the beginning. What can you say about this? Uh, did you have your walking in the beginning when it was cold or no? How was it for you in Astana? Yeah, I, I enjoy my stay here. Actually, <coughs> I, I, because I like to walk. Uh, also, there's a river uh, near the hotel. Also, uh, uh, there's a park, so I spend some time. I spend many rest days just to uh, sit sit down on the ground of the park, and sometimes I bring uh, uh, I, yeah just to spend some time here. And uh, so mm -hmm. uh, you know, one day it was a heavy snow, and uh, uh, well, it's. Uh, yeah, the snow is quite big and it's quite so I take a lot of photos here. I really enjoy my stay here. Thank you. Uh, next question. Yes, please. Вопрос Яну не помнящим. Ян, понятно, что сейчас, наверное, сложно это все описывать, рассказывать, но в целом, если говорить именно о сегодняшнем дне, именно о тайбрейке, что стало переломным, решающим моментом для вас сегодня? The question is to Ян не помнящий. I understand it is very difficult to describe everything, to explain, but uh, talking about today's game, talking about tiebreak, what was the decisive, uh, the key moment in the game? Ну, странный довольно. Ну, во-первых, надо было как бы да, во второй партии распоряжаться преимуществом чуть более аккуратно. А, была отличная позиция. А в четвертой партии она была очень сложная. Я думаю, что черная была инициатива, но, конечно, в конце а, до того, как я зимой ход 4 понятно, что белые ни в один момент не рисковали, но так, так бывает. А, Времени уже было мало у обоих игроков, и ну, после С4 как-то тяжело оказалось перестроиться, но, может быть, позиция объективно не очень хорошая. Вот. Ну, мне в какой-то момент казалось, что там, на связке а, довольно близки белые были к победе, но, может быть, действительно ход в ход все, все держится. Вот. Но, конечно, да, представить, что эту позицию можно проиграть, я, я не мог, но, как оказалось, можно. Well, actually, uh, mm. the key moment, uh, I think, uh, in the second game, uh, I had more chance to win, but uh, I didn't realize it. But then in the fourth game, uh, the Blacks, they had some... I had to play more accurately, but after the move for C4, then the situation changed, and the time was very little, and it was very difficult to, to change myself, to change the game. And uh, I made a pin, and uh, white were close to, to win. And I, it was hard to imagine that I could l lose, but things happen, and it happened how it happened. Thank you. Uh, next question. Participate in there, please. First of all, congratulations to both of you for reaching here. Uh, question to Ding. Uh, Ding, in the fourth game, in the Rapid, uh, you went for the win uh, when uh, Nepo was uh, like holding the position. How did you get the strength to play Rook G6 and uh, go for the win and uh, make this game the last game of a very long tournament? Well, it's... Uh one of the two ways to play or win. The other one was to play rook f7 after king d5, but I guess obviously rook is better and the king is more safe on h7. So I decided to play for win. It was because uh, at when I played bishop b4, I realized that I, I could play for win because he, if we take on c5, I can play bishop e1 and did not exchange the bishop. Uh, yeah. Yeah, if you got the chance, I think you need to save it. Uh, save it. Absolutely. We saw you going and uh, being with your team, hugging them. Uh, could you please tell us that who are you going to dedicate this event to? Who, uh, 
dedicated. Dedicated, yes. Oh, well, I have said before. <laughs> yeah, and many uh, my friends, my my mother, and also my uh, grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations once again. Thank you very much. Next question, please. А у меня вопрос вот к Диню или Жене. Перед тайбрейком эксперты, букмекеры ставили на Яна Непомнящего, якобы, что Ян Непомнящий имеет больше опыта в быстрых шахматах и, скорее всего, он выиграет. А сам Дин Лежень как считал? My question is to Дин Лежень. Actually, before the tiebreak, bookmakers they were uh, uh, they were uh, making a stake for Jan Nepomniši more because uh, he has more experience in fast chess. And uh, what about you, Dean? How did you think before tiebreak yourself? Well, we both have m many experience. <laughs> we are very <laughs> we have established the grandmasters. We have played. The a lot of tie breaks in recent years. <coughs> so it doesn't mean anything. So as I said, having a white piece is not always an advantage. Yes, you at some point you will be too optimistic about your chances and it will sometimes go um, <coughs> backward. No, na samam dieli мы оба, я и я, мы оба э, гроссмейстеры, и у нас очень большой опыт у обоих, и мы много играли э, в разных соревнованиях, в том числе и быстрые шахматы. И вы знаете, как бы, ну, мне как бы без разницы, что думали букмекеры, но на самом деле э, я считаю, что как бы шансы были и у меня. И знаете, что вот я играл первую партию белыми, и играть белыми это может быть и преимущество, и недостаток. И можно посчитать, что как бы свои шансы слишком оптимистичны, так как я играл белыми, но это не всегда так, потому что всегда у обоих сторон есть шанс. Thank you. Next question, please. А, вопрос Яну не помнящему. Ян, а можете ли вы сейчас назвать людей, которые вам помогали а, при подготовке к матчу и непосредственно здесь? The question is to Ян не помнящий. Ян, could you please tell the names of the people who helped you in your preparation? Maybe here also in Astana. Um, yeah, довольно большая команда была, ну в целом вот а по шахматной части здесь со мной был а, Никита Витягов, а, также а, Ильдар Харюлин и Максим Матлаков а, входили в бригаду, и я консультировался, ну, тоже занимался, ну, готовился с а, Владимиром Борисовичем Крамником. Well, uh, I have a big team who helped me in my preparation, and among them there is uh, Nikita, and there is uh, Ildar, Maxim, and I also make consultation with uh, Vladimir Kramnik. So these are some of the people in my team. Thank you. Next question, Maria. Uh, Maria, chess.com. Uh, congratulations to both players, and thank you for this wonderful month of uh, tremendous chess. Congratulations to the new world champion, Ding. I have a question for you. Uh, in a recent interview with Sina, um, Sina Sports in China News, I hope the translation is accurate, you said the meaning of life should be in those special, those sparkling moments, not in the daily life of those ordinary days, but in living for those unique moments. I hope it's accurate, and can you say if this moment is unique and special moment? Yeah, it was an interview. Uh, I guess I remember it was take place in 2019. Yeah, you know, I because I started to learn chess from four years old, and I spent 26 years uh, playing, analyzing. So. Try to improve my chess ability with many different ways, with different chaining methods, with I think many new ways to chaining, 
maybe it's not so well known among the elite players. So I think I did nearly everything. Yes, I, sometimes I thought I would education to chess. Uh, because sometimes uh, the time without the, the tournaments, they are I'm not so happy. I sometimes I struggle to find the, uh, another hobbies to make me happy. So also I was influenced, uh, inspired by many sayings uh, to to achieve to uh, like climb the mountains or to. Um, to strive to the best, or to learn from the best, to uh, I think this was uh, the match. It reflects the deepest of my soul. Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for the answer. Do we have more questions? Yes, please. У меня вопрос к двум игрокам. В целом про игровые организационные условия, бытовые, как в целом организация матча. My question is to both players. So, in general, how do you assess the game situation, organizational and uh, domestic situation? How is that organize everything? How can you assess it? This is the question to or both, both players. players. Yes. Um, I think we will go first with you. I'm sorry. How's the organizing things here for you? How do you feel? Oh, it's quite good. Yes, I follow the, um, the, the same routine every day, so I feel very comfortable here. Thank you. Yeah. Ну, Дин говорит, что на самом деле мне нравится организация на хорошем уровне. И ну, я каждый день следую одной и той же рутине. То есть у меня определенный график, и я доволен этим. Okay. Yeah. Нормально. Next question. Леончо. Леончо from Advice. First of all, Thanks a lot, uh, Jan, for being here now and answering our questions so well. My question today is for Liden. Why are you now the world champion? I mean, what are the key points, the key reasons for you to explain why you are the champion right now? Well, if we if I try to find the reason inside of chess, I think it might be some changing ways. Uh, yeah, maybe that's what makes me play a little bit different than the other grandmasters. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I guess. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, next question, please. Just uh, from Brisbane Times. Congratulations to both players. Uh, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone when I say that was an absolute spectacle uh, and you should both be absolutely wrapped. This is a question to Ding. Given that you've been through such adversity to get here, you know, you, the games you played in China to qualify for the candidates, coming second to the candidates and getting the call up, now that the, well, I wouldn't say the dust has necessarily settled, but uh, the fact that you're now the, world ch the chess world champion, something you've worked so hard for, that, like you just said, for the past 26 years, what, what's something special that uh, you're looking forward to doing with your boy, Richard Report, who was clearly in your corner from, uh, from day one? What's, uh, I think you need to repeat this specific question. What are you looking forward to doing now that you're world champion, given that you and Richard have been in the trenches for the past month? Do you know? I think we need second time. A bit slow, please. I don't really catch it. What are you looking forward to doing now that you've won? What are you looking forward to do 
now as world champion? No, no, I'm answering the question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm filming. Uh, what am I going to planning to do later? Exactly. Yes. With with, with the with the with the family. Later. Just in general, not only chess. Uh, well, I said yesterday I may uh, go to travel if I have some spare time. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask this question, as you, as you mentioned the earlier, uh, about winning the, winning the uh, prize. You said that you want to travel. What is your ideal holiday where you want to travel? Hmm. Well, I have a list. Uh, I want to go to uh, Turin to see a game of Juventus. Yeah, my favorite club. Also, mm, maybe to to Добрый вечер. Вопрос Яну. Во-первых, спасибо за турнир. Лионель Месси проиграл в финале чемпионата мира, но нашел в себе силы вернуться потом. И вот можем ли мы верить, надеяться, надеетесь ли вы, что сумеете так же повторить эту историю? My question is to Ян Дипомниши. First of all, thank you for the tournament. Thank you for your game. And uh, if we make the analogy, uh, Lionel Messi, uh, he lost his World Cup and then he found the strength to come back and made, a, made another World Cup. So, can you do something like this in future? Ну, как сказать сейчас, довольно... Все-таки этим матчем завершился довольно большой отрезок ну, там, работы, подготовки, жизни, да, так что сейчас, наверное, сложно прогнозировать, но, по крайней мере, наверное, еще шахматы немножко поиграю, так что попробуем. Well, actually, by this tournament, uh, a huge piece of my a live preparation work uh, has finished uh, but uh, I will play chess more I think and uh, we will see in the future All right, thank you Next question please Здравствуйте, поздравляю с окончанием чемпионата и поздравляю Дину с победой Вопрос Дину Чем запомнилась Астана и будете ли вы чаще сюда приезжать? First of all, uh, congratulations to both players and uh, congratulations to Dean with being a champion. And the question is to Dean Dijen. So, what was Astana, uh, how Astana got into your memory and will you come back to Astana in the future? What do you think? Yeah, it's my second time here. Yeah, there are good memories, I think. I'd like to get back here if there is a tournament there. Да, мне нравится в Астане. Я уже второй раз здесь. И у меня только хорошие впечатления от города. И я надеюсь вернуться сюда вновь, если будет какое-то соревнование. Поэтому с удовольствием бы вернулся. И второй вопрос Дину. В каком возрасте вы мечтали, хотели, ну, мечтали стать чемпионом мира? And the second question again to Dean Lejeune. 
in what age did you dream to become a champion? No, actually, I haven't dreamed of becoming the world champion. I just want to. Uh, at one point, I just want to become the uh, player plays best, and not to become the world. It's not so important to become world champion. На самом деле, я не мечтал стать чемпионом. Я просто старался лучше всех играть, как бы и для меня не так было важно стать именно чемпионом. Right. Uh, just a second. Um, I wanted to ask thing uh, as you are the first ever Chinese uh, chess player who won the title. I asked this question earlier in the first day, and now everything is more clear. So, how does it feel? The first Chinese world champion. Yeah. Yeah, I feel good. I think it will uh, inspire a lot of Chinese youth, young players to play chess uh, because the the tournament, I guess, will followed by many spectators around China. So I hope it will. Um, Uh, yeah. influence a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, right now I'll ask right away who are the first people that you want to thank for for this victory of yours? Family, your coaches, your team, your fans? Maybe yourself? Yeah, yeah. I, I forgot to thank myself. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Вопрос Яну. Чувствовали ли давление, то, что многие эксперты давали вам больше предпочтений в этом чемпионате мира? И оказало ли это влияние какое-то? The question is to Jan Nepomnyshi. Jan, did you feel the pressure because many experts uh, they gave preference to you and did it influence you somehow? Uh, ну, мнение экспертов а, а, вряд ли, так сказать, вряд ли на что-то влияли, да, то есть понятно, что а, сколько людей, столько и мнений, но все же, мне кажется, сопернику было чуть проще играть, поскольку он, а, ну, а в известной степени играл прирол. Вот, так получилось. Но думаю, что... А, давление было ну, примерно сопоставимо на участников. Uh, well, the opinion of experts uh, maybe didn't uh, influence too much, uh, but I think uh, to my opponent uh, it was a little bit easier to play uh, because he played a kind of zero, like without uh, less risk. And but anyway, the pressure to both players was more or less uh, measurable. Thank you. Do we have more questions in, in press? If, if there, there is anyone who wants to ask the question, now it's time to come forward and ask the question, please. Вопрос я на непомнящему. Примерно год назад вы подписали антивоенное письмо, и где сказали, что дорожите отношениями с коллегами из Украины. Как спустя год вот сейчас складываются это, эти отношения, и не было ли давления со стороны, ну, условно говоря, на российских властей или еще кого-то по поводу этой позиции? Uh, the question is to Jan Nepomnyshi. About a year ago, you signed the anti-war letter uh, about the war in Ukraine. And what is the situation now after a year? Is there any pressure from your Russian colleagues or uh, authorities? Uh, ну, я бы не сказал, что какое-то есть давление. Uh, вот. А касательно общения с uh, украинскими шахматистами, ну, мне кажется, с теми, с кем общался раньше, я продолжил общаться, да, с теми, с кем не общался и до этого, ну, соответственно, не общаюсь. Uh, I don't think there's much pressure, but uh, about the communication with the Ukrainian colleagues, I still communicate with those uh, who I had communicated before, and I don't communicate with those who I hadn't communicated before. Uh, so, 
it's so it's like before situation more or less. All right, thank you. Uh, do we have more questions from press? Uh, I suppose no, so now uh, I'll give some time to a uh, Twitter segment. Jesse? Hi, Jesse February here. It was a huge pleasure and honor to watch you play in this championship, and a big congratulations to Ding. I only have one question, and that's to both of you. Looking back on the match, including your preparation, what would you have done differently? Do you have any regrets? Um, we will go first with uh, Jan, with you. Uh, win more games and lose less. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, since the result is excellent, I don't have any regrets looking back. Right, thanks. Thank you. Um, well, there are no more questions. I think uh, it's time to conclude the press conference. Thank you so much to both of the players for the great joy that they give to chess funds for this one month. And um, yeah, thank you to Jan and thank you to Ding as well. This was moments ago, a moment that will etch itself in chess history. Ding Liren, overcome by emotion, the winning moment from the 2023 World Championship. And what a journey it's been for Ding Liren with his struggles to make it to the candidate. He finished second at the candidate. Magnus Carlsen decides not to defend his title. That gives Ding Liren to the opportunity to fight for his ultimate dream. And he found himself on this very board and then trailing the match for the most part. And finally, it was in game four, a rapid day, which saw the best in Ding. And now his name is forever amongst the greatest of the greats in the chess world. Ding Liren, alongside Magnus Carlsen, alongside Vishwanath Anand and Vladimir Kramnik. Fabi, is this the biggest moment for a chess player? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that... Uh, it showed with Ding's emotions after the final moves of the final game that, yeah, this is a, a dream for every chess player, purely for Ding, and well-deserved. I mean, that final game was, was really clutch. Really, really clutch final day and final game for Ding. Yeah, Ding Love played it. a great match, and, uh, you know, they asked him, was it a childhood dream of yours? You asked him in the pre-match interview, uh, he earned this victory. He, it was the unlikeliest of circumstances for Ding Li Ren, just the way he even played in the candidates and then making it to this championship match when Magnus said, I don't want to play anymore. And then to win this match when he was down, when he didn't lead until that very last game, he won the fourth and final rapid game. The first time, the only time, but the most important time that he led this World Championship match because he didn't just lead, he won it. What a day it is for Ding Liren as the world congratulates Ding as he makes his name amongst the greatest of all times. He's also being congratulated by the greatest players of all time, five-time former world champion Vishwanathan Anand there. And now, until the end of time, Ding's name will be written alongside Magnus, alongside Anand, alongside Vladimir Kramnik and Anand there saying that it's impossible to praise both players enough. Even today, they went at it with full energy and the fourth game was so draining. However, Ding survived so many setbacks and saves his best for the last. He also talks about the miraculous journey that Ding Liren has indeed had. And I think this really sums it up, what we saw today. And no matter what you say about these two players, it's just not enough. The amount of praise that we can give to Ding Liren, but also to Jan Nepomnishi. He was truly a gladiator in this fight, Robert. Yeah, I mean, he was. I think Jan Nepomnishi deserves a world of credit. The way he played in this match, he was not just taking peaceful games. Even in the game he lost at the end, he was playing a game where he could have liquidated at some point. He could have just forced the draw. And 
I know he'll be criticized for it because he ended up losing the game, but it was his fighting spirit that made this match so fun. As early as Game 2, we saw a decisive game. That hasn't happened in previous World Chess Championship matches in recent years. And then we saw them trade off four wins in a row with the white pieces. That's not just one person. It takes two to tango. It takes two to play chess. And these two played some excellent chess. Yana Pamashi, I mean, he's proven that he deserves to be on this world stage. He won the candidates twice in a row. And the chess he showed the world here in the 2023 world championship match uh, he was that close from being world champion just one thing going differently and it could have been his name etched in history yeah i think jan in the press conference he really points to those final uh games in the in the classical portion the game 12 where he was winning and leading the match and where he could have pretty much put it all away and game 14 i think he was arguably just as close to putting it away because if he had spent his time on that e5 move not played e5 but thought, or at least not played e5 quickly, but thought about that moment, I think he might have come to a different conclusion, might have played the move rook to b3, potentially, and that was really, really close to winning, and you know, Ding was in time trouble, um, the position was pretty much just losing for Ding, uh, so he, he pinpointed those two moments, I think once you let it get to rapid, when you don't close, uh, close the match out, when you have multiple chances, then it becomes like also psychologically difficult to uh, to be able to, you know, win the rapid portion. Of course, it was a very, very close rapid portion as well, and I wouldn't have been surprised at all to see to see Jan win. I mean, he definitely had his chances also in game two of the rapid today. I think he pointed that out that he had a very pleasant position. It was never like an enormous chance like he had in those classical games, but still, he um, those were the moments that he pointed to. And uh, the interesting thing is that as soon as Ding, he had less opportunities in this match, but he pretty much seized almost all of them. As soon as he had a chance in this final rapid game, he seized it. The only chance I can see that he really like majorly missed was that game eight, right? Where he had a few chances to win. But besides that, he it feels like Jan had more chances, but Ding took more chances. He had 14 big classical fights. And we were talking about fatigue and energy and stamina for the players, but it was clear that both Jan and Ding came with a clear mindset today to become world champion. There was no question of tiredness. We saw amazing precision, amazing courage by both these players. And just in those final moments, Ding had the upper hand and he capitalized on with that brave decision of Rook to G6. A truly special, one of the biggest moments of Ding's entire life. And at the press conference, he was asked about what that meant to him and the moment that he realized that he is world champion. Here's what he said. Well, quite relieved. Uh, the moment I uh, yeah, resigned the game, it was uh, a very emotional moment. I cannot uh, control my moods, uh, my, my feelings, and yes, I know myself, I will uh, cry, I will, uh, burst into tears, top tournament for me. Yeah, I would like to thanks to my friends. As it still is sinking in for the 17th World Chess Champion, Ding Liren, overtaken by emotions. And it was really interesting how the first word that he mentioned that came to his mind was relief. Really, one can understand that with the toll that the match takes, not just the games that are played, but months of preparation leading up to it. Just your whole life revolving around this goal, this single tunnel vision. And Fabi, is that how it is? Is it relief that surpasses joy in that moment? Yeah, I think the amount of tension that these guys had to deal with over the last three weeks is so intense that maybe relief even overtakes uh, the joy that you feel although i think that on the other side of it if you lose the match then um it's not even like re the relief of exhaustion but just the feeling of how many chances i had and all the regrets uh that that come back and uh you feel like i mean i'm sure that's what that's the reason why jan was like pointing to those moments in a press conference that he felt like i had uh i had those chances and i really really let them slip uh but for for ding i think First, it's relief, and then over the course of the next few days, it will start to be uh, the joy of realizing that he actually became world champion. But there's there's that adjustment period where you don't fully feel it yet, and then it comes to you a bit later that, oh, I actually won. 
doesn't Ding barely have any time to adjust because he's playing in a tournament in just a few days, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, no rest for the weary. I think Fabi, he'll join you for that event. Uh, but yeah, Ding, you know, he, as you said earlier, he made the most of his chances with the exception of game eight. And I, I would also add game seven because he did sacrifice an exchange and had a pleasant position there. And then he froze. So uh, there are many storylines from this world championship. And Jan, uh, you could hear from him in the press conference uh, I don't really know why he was sitting there forever. That I felt very badly for him. Uh, that was really uncomfortable to watch. If I'm being uh, completely transparent, uh, you know, it's not a pleasant experience to sit through that uh, when everyone is celebrating the guy on the other side. But I will say that Jan answered the questions. Uh, he dealt with it in a way that I think is admirable, and you can see how disappointed he was. Not just because the result didn't go his way, but because there are moves along the way that he wishes he could take back or play a little bit more slowly. Uh, but it was just that close. And it was a nail biter. It was an epic. And Ding Ren is the one who came out on top. Yeah, and I found this also getting over that game 12, where the match could have essentially been over, is something that is going to haunt him. And it has been a difficult day for Jan, but he's been an absolute fighter, undoubtedly, that this match would not have been what it is if it wasn't for Jan. He was the one who was leading throughout, and definitely a difficult moment. But right now, the congratulations are indeed pouring in. Or Ding Liren, Agat Matar there, Anish Kiri, with one thing to rule them all. Anish, truly, the Twitter king here. Yeah, yeah. Anish is on his game for sure. And yeah, all I can say is congratulations to Ding Liren. Um, he, he, you know, had a difficult journey, but at the last moment he had what it took. Massive congratulations to Ding Lee Ren. I mean, the way he played today, it was exemplary. Uh, he is a role model on and off the chessboard for so many of his new fans, but also those of you who have been around for a while uh, loving his chess. He famously beat Magnus Carlsen in the Sinkville Cup tie breaks way back when, and people were looking at him, whoa, he did that? That's really impressive. He's been around for a long time. He's been a little bit quiet. Uh, in part, it's his demeanor, in part because he hasn't been playing over the board that much. But he's an absolute beast, and he unleashed that beast today, and that is why he's the deserving world champion. Yeah, it's it was a really it was a match full of a lot of content as well. Um, despite all the mistakes, there were a lot of interesting ideas, a lot of exciting games, and from a purely chess point of view, not talking about the um, the joys and the um, disappointments that both players had throughout the match, and obviously at this point it's just joy for Ding. But from a pure chess point of view, there was a lot of really exciting stuff. I enjoyed following you guys when I wasn't doing the commentary, watching uh, you guys do the uh, do the commentary for every game, and every game was exciting. And also enjoyed uh, commentating on the games live and talking about them because they were super exciting games. Fabi, it was amazing to have you with us, uh, you know, just breaking down the thought process, the approach of these two absolute world-class players. And I'm sure for chat, I speak on behalf of chat and I speak on behalf of myself and Robert, that you made this so special. So a big thank you to you to make this possible for us to actually follow the action that we did see. Now, Ding Liren is the world champion. With great power, Robert, comes great responsibility putting that in because we know how much Fabi enjoys those uh, movie puns. But I have to ask you, Robert, how will Ding continue to add to this legacy as world champion? Well, I'm not an uncle yet, but I can answer your question. I think that for Ding Lee Ren, I mean, his legacy is just getting started. Uh, he's been a worthy champion, even if not world champion, for many years now. His rating crossed 2,800, one of the highest rated players in chess history. But now he is the world champion, and there is responsibility that comes with that. And he himself said he hopes that people in China, more people will watch the game, play the game, uh, because it isn't the most popular game in China, and that's okay. But I think it, you know, there's an opportunity there for him to promote Promote it to uh, everyone in his country. They will, you know, look to him as a hero, and yeah, he's earned this championship. So I think that for Ding Li Ren, right now, he's not going to focus on that so much. He's just going to celebrate. He's going to sort of just relax for a hot second before he goes and plays Fabiano in a tournament next week. But uh, yeah, he <laughs> is just, you know, he's just really a great person, and that comes off in every interview he does, and he is just a worthy champion. So you cannot say enough congratulations to Ding Li Ren. I don't know what his legacy is. I don't want to prognosticate, but I think that he deserves this moment just to enjoy it without worrying about what legacy he'll leave behind. 
Yeah, I don't think it's about his next tournament that's coming up. I don't think it is about what he will leave behind right now is his moment to just live in the moment. He is the world chess champion and has been a fantastic last few, th last three weeks that we've been on this. And I have to say, Robert, Fabi, I'm getting a bit emotional that it's all over. It's been such an amazing ride. And of course, a huge shout out to our chat from across the world who was on it with us. Robert, Fabi, this was amazing. And a big thank you to our production crew as well, without whom none of this would be possible. It's been amazing casting alongside both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, chat. And we leave you with the best moments from Things Victorious Tiebreaks today. Goodbye. We can't pick out a clear favorite, I think. We see that the players have been completely evenly matched in classical chess and rapid chess. I think they're also going to be completely evenly matched. But in blitz chess, who knows? It's going to be a, a bloodbath if it gets to that point. And at that point, anything can happen. We do have the first move on the board. You played rugby one, you saw Jan, he's looking Whoa. like, are you sure about that? He plays B6? Yeah, he spots it. He spots the queen sacrifice. A takes B6 is a brilliant move. That deserves not just two exclamation points, maybe 20. What a draw this has been. Oh my goodness. We saw fireworks on display. Look at this view. Yana Pomshi playing the Spanish. Rook C5 play. D3 immediately blitzed out. The second game of the rapid playoff ends peacefully. First move. Starts with knight f3. That is not a move we've seen by Ding in this world championship. Yan with a shake of head there. He's not happy defending this position. He found a way to repeat the moves. And bishop e1, king e2. Really calm game by both players. e4 on the board, as you said, e5. Oh, for queen e2, oh. you actually do. He probably didn't see that one. It's a brilliant move. And actually, that means it's the only move that allowed black to survive this game oh my oh. god oh <laughs> what is he playing for a win or is some territory for yana pomshi who's dipping to just about a minute and that was a mistake uh black can do anything here too. seconds away from ding becoming the world champion yana pomshi, yana pomshi he sits up in his chair but he knows this might be the last few moves of his world championship oh my god oh you see it he, he, he gets knows up. he knows it it's over ding Laren is the world just champion